I'd like to call this Anchorage Assembly meeting of March 22nd to order. Madam Clerk, please do the roll call. Mr. Honeman. Here. Mr. Steele. Here. Ms. Domboski. Present. Mr. Flynn. Present. Mr. Traney. Here. Mr. A. Jackson. Honored to be here. Mr. Evans. Here. Mr. Peterson. Present. Mr. Starr. Mr. Starr is absent. Ms. Johnston. Here. Mr. Hall. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Mr. Holloman, can you give us uh, I mean, the Pledge of Allegiance, please, sir? My privilege, sir. No amendments to previous meetings, so we go to mayor's report. Mr. Mayor. Nothing to report. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Summit Chair's report. There is no report on that except to the administration. Can you give us uh, a brief on where we're at with the 4th Avenue Theater relative to deteriorated properties? Just let us know where we're at so we make sure we're not missing any deadlines with the people that own it. You don't need to do it right now. Just if you give it to me in writing, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Robert Harris is, is unavailable, but the uh, reports are, are uh, currently under preparation. We are not being out of compliance with any deadlines. Okay, well, if you could just give us a report, I'd appreciate it, Mr. Mayor, in writing. There are a lot of people interested about it. Uh, committee reports, we'll start with you. Mr. Hall, sir. Thank you, Mr. Petrini. Uh one announcement, uh, Ethics and Election Committee meeting tomorrow, noon, City Hall. I'm not sure exactly of the location, but uh, if they check with the guard at the desk, I'm sure they can direct them. Uh, my other report is actually the, uh, the Marijuana Committee. Uh, I'm actually uh, going to move into hiatus with that committee, not that I have very long uh, left uh, to serve in that capacity. Uh, but what I do want to share with the body is we had a pretty in-depth meeting with uh, uh, Cynthia Franklin yesterday. Uh, she wanted to meet with us to discuss social clubs. Uh, there was concern on their part about us uh, moving in that direction. Uh, but some of the information that she shared with me was what uh, particularly uh, tells me that, it's, that it would be appropriate for uh, the assembly as a whole to kind of take a hiatus uh, for a bit. Uh, we've got our land use in place. We've got our licensing in place. We've got all of the major elements for marijuana in place. Uh, but when it comes to the social clubs or on-site consumption, uh, there's a number of things that are happening currently. Uh, number one, apparently there was a bill that moved yesterday that has to do with smoking, secondhand smoking, vaping, uh, that she felt may have a major impact on any type of on-site consumption, whether it be tobacco or marijuana. Uh, the, uh, there's finally beginning to be some action in Juneau in regards to marijuana. House Bill 337 has been introduced, uh, which is going to do a number of things. It'll uh, give more enforcement power to Department of Revenue. It's going to ask uh, for licensed growers to pay either a $5,000 cash or a surety bond to the tax division uh, to ensure tax payments to the state. Uh, that uh, sounds kind of, uh, you know, onerous. Do you realize that uh, alcohol license posts a $25,000 bond? Uh, it is also going to make retailers secondarily re uh, liable for unpaid taxes. Um, unlicensed growers would be fined $50 per ounce for every ounce that they have in their possession over uh, the grow limit for an individual. Uh, one of our major concerns, however, is House Bill uh, 75, uh, which within that is would limit uh, to 12 plants per household. Uh, that is not moving. It is also a bill that uh, gives authorization to the, uh, to the Marijuana Control Board to ask the FBI for background uh, checks for uh, anybody that happens to be a felon in the last 10 years. There has been no action on that. 
And because of that, the control board has not been able to do a background check outside of the state of Alaska, and they're not comfortable. So the reality is, is they at this point in time do not have what they consider to be a completed application in their possession. And the 90 day time frame does not start until the application is completed. Another uh, major element that's occurring out there is the fact that uh, Senate Bill 30 is locked up inside of the, uh, the House Judicial Committee, which is chaired by uh, Representative Ledeau. And uh, she says that she is not going to allow that bill to move. And what that does is that is the one that goes in and cleans up all of the state statutes in regards to marijuana. Uh, so there is a tremendous amount of work yet to be done at the state level, which has been a concern on our part from the very beginning that we would get our part of the job done and uh, the state wouldn't be up to speed and that's uh, kind of beginning to become true. Uh, we understand and we, we had this discussion yesterday, the initiative said that if the state doesn't issue a, a license within 90 days of the application, they can come to local uh, government to look uh, for local licensing. However, it is very clear in the state statute that until you have a background check for 10 years of any felony violations or convictions, uh, and we will not have the ability to do those background checks ourselves until the state legislature steps up and gives authorization for that to happen. So I think in order to keep ourselves from ending up in uh, some degree of conflict with the state on a number of these items, it's going to be best that we just uh, kind of slow down and let them get more of their job done. Uh, we are in a position where when they do, we can move quickly and rapidly on any of the topics that we've been uh, dealing with. But at this point in time, I would highly recommend to you and the rest of the body to just uh, step back and take a wait and see because indication is we're not going to see uh, any licensing moving out of Juneau anytime soon prior to the legislature taking action where they can do criminal background checks. Well, thank you, Mr. Hall. I think we've all seen a lot of businesses. They're starting to put signs up as if they're going to be opening. And until they've got both the state and the city license, they're not going to be opening. And so what we're getting is a lot of people concerned about a marijuana shop going in their neighborhood and they're not, there's no licensing yet. So I appreciate it, Mr. Hall. If there's anybody on here that wants to be a chairman of our little budding committee, let me know because he's not going to be here much longer. Ms. Johnston. Yes, I, I just want to take a personal privilege and do a shout out to a good friend, John Sturgeon. He um, was very successful in the Supreme Court. They, they overturned the decision from the ninth. Court of Appeals. This is a man who is very quiet and very humble. And he got into this fight only because he really felt he needed to do the right thing. And he's a true Alaskan because he did the right thing. And he did it in the beginning at his own expense and his own time. Um, he had many friends of the court, including the state of Alaska. But it was John Sturgeon who he, he was ready to walk away when the National Park Service made him move his hovercraft from the Yukon River Charlie. And he got thinking about it, and he realized it was wrong. And it's one person making a difference. And I think all of us should be extremely proud of this man and, and truly call him a true Alaskan. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Starr, welcome to the meeting, sir. Oh, sorry, I'm late. Uh, I have no all right. report. I just got the notes after we started. Sorry. No problem. No report. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No report this evening. Mr. Evans. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In answer to the question is whatever became of the ad hoc committee on chronic inebriates, uh, I'm pleased to announce that we've reformed that committee. It's 
now to be a standing committee on homelessness, a little bit of a broader ambit. And although we haven't locked down the date yet, it looks like our first meeting of that expanded committee will be on April 20th. Good, sir. Good. Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Budget and Finance Committee is going to meet this Thursday, March 24th, from 11.30 to 12.30 in the Mayor's Conference Room. And, of course, all of our meetings are open to the public, so please feel free to join us. And I'm going to talk a little bit about where I was last week um, before I got on the phone for the meeting. I was at the National League of Cities Conference. Um, it was the annual March Conference, Congressional City Conference. And on Saturday and Sunday, I attended my board meetings and my Finance and Investment Advisory Committee meetings, time consuming, but definitely worth my time. And on Monday, during the opening session, we, we heard from, um, I think everybody knows, Anna Navarro, uh, a, a Republican strategies and political analyst, analyst for CNN. And then at that afternoon, we heard from Maria Contreras Sweet. She's the administrator for the Small Business Administration. And one of the agency's goal is to help small businesses start up in a day. There's a, a national effort to get cities across America to take, to take a start up in a day pledge. And I was so excited. I'm sitting there and I'm listening to her speak and somebody sitting next to me gave me um, a, 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 her phone and said, look, Anchorage has already taken the pledge. And, um, and Anchorage has, and I was really, really excited about that. It's a pledge and it's a commitment. So for those entrepreneurs out there, um, you can find more information on this at sba.gov. We also had Gina McCarthy, the Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency, Julian Castro, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and Tom Vilsack, the Administrator for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, who gave an awesome presentation. Actually, all the speakers were just wonderful and, and worth of 2,000 plus members of um, National League of Cities that were there at that conference. I also had the opportunity to meet with Senators Sullivan and Murkowski along with two assembly members who joined me from um, Kodiak. The Fast Track Transportation Bill, it has a provision that will allow for funding for our port, and that's really, really good news. I encourage both the Senators to, to help us with that funding for our port, considering the financial situation of the state. Senator Sullivan, he promised to send a letter, and I'm going to follow up on it, to the mayor in copying the assembly outlining the necessary steps to um, get assistance, to assist us in, apply, in applying for some of this money uh, for, for our port. And lastly, but not least, the National League of Cities goal for 2016 is to ensure that cities across America receive a piece of a pie from our federal government. And that pie stands for public safety, infrastructure, and the economy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Flynn, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The AMAX Policy Committee meets Thursday. I will not be in town, so Mr. Peterson is graciously to fill in in my stead. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Um, I had asked, and we'll see if it actually makes it to the agenda on the information items uh, for an update on what's going on with the Pinnick Arm Crossing. I was aware of the letter uh, that perhaps some of you read about in the paper this morning where the Federal Department of Transportation once again denied uh, the TIFI alone that uh, the bureaucrats seem to think is our savior uh, based on overly uh, aggressive traffic assumptions and a financial plan that does not uh, meet the red face test. Um, and not to go too far afield, but this is exactly why I'm trying to divorce uh, municipal finance from state finance uh, as we move forward because it is clear that some of the state bureaucracy has not gotten the message that uh, we can't count on others to do our work for us to finance our operations and we need to be doing it for ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Stambowski, ma'am. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, the, um, I, I tried to introduce on the agenda today an AIM to clearly lay out the process or potential hope for a process for um, what we are calling responsive review regarding Title 21 issues. Um, the Assembly Community and Economic Development Committee met on March 9th and reviewed tw AO 2016-34, which is an ordinance designed to address specific issues that have been identified as needing clarification being problematic or creating unintended consequences during the initial implementation of AO, Title 21, the new Title 21. 
Um, the committee, um, there were two members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, multiple members of the public, as well as Assembly Council, uh, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Hall, Mr. Trainee, you were there. Um, so there was a robust discussion, and um, the committee uh, unanimously agreed that the items in this ordinance are appropriate for direct action by the Assembly. A summary, um, uh, further though, the PNZ chair did ask that after the assembly takes action that we just send them a memo of what changes we made. I thought that was a good recommendation. Um, I think it's also helpful, um, the, the, community, the committee further resolved that the assembly should adopt a process for responsive review relating to unintended problems, confusion, and needed clarification by utilization of the committee process and utilization of the Community and Economic Development Committee for that purpose. The intention is to have potential ordinances which address specific issues within Title 21 heard in the Community and Economic Development Committee. Then the committee can make a recommendation to the Assembly um, for either PNZ referral or direct action by the Assembly. Um, so that was kind of where we were going with that. Tomorrow our meeting is, um, we're going to be talking about a potential user variance. Um, many of us that have sat in the committee have talked about it before. I do have a draft, but it, it's not looking the way I, we envisioned it. So I wanted to talk in committee about where we might be able to go with that draft. Um, but that's another issue that we will be bringing forward relatively soon. Now on a personal note, Mr. Chair, if you'll allow me, um, I think it's important to address the tone and tenor of the partisan rhetoric that I have seen over the past couple of weeks. It's unlike anything I've seen in my five years of being involved with the city government, whether on boards and commissions or whether it's been as an elected official. There are some perpetrating inaccurate information that this ordinance was a 24-hour process that was drafted by industry. And I want to be very, very clear. I did rely on the former building official and director of public works to assist me in drafting this, as did the Department of Law assist me in drafting this ordinance. With that said, Mr. Chair, this ordinance was pro appropriately introduced. There was not a 24-hour process. It had a two-week notice. It was heard in committee, which was attended and par participated by the public. And I think it's helpful for us to step back, take a breath, and realize we're all on the same team here. We're all trying to serve the people of Anchorage. This is not Juno, you know. and I think it's in the best anchorage of all of our citizens that we take the partisan rhetoric and put it in the trash where it belongs. I think we all really want what's best for Anchorage. So with that said, Mr. Chair, the AIM clearly also says this particular ordinance, I think it would be helpful for other assembly members to have a work session on it just so we can show them the diagrams and the pictures and the issues that came up in committee. Um, I think it'll also give the administration an opportunity to have that same information. Um, I think it would be helpful for all involved. So Mr. Chair, um, when that comes up tonight, item 14-0, I believe it is. As we do the public hearing, we get to the end of the public hearing and then make your motion to continue yeah. and uh, make a motion to have a work session. Sure, and public so- Public Kirk set one up for Friday. That would be helpful. So my hope, my hope is to continue the public hearing. I've been telling people, and I went to the Federation of Community Councils and I spoke with them and some of the ladies from Robert Creek said, hey, can you give us two more weeks to evaluate this so we can make comments? And I thought that was fair. So um, I, um, I plan on making a motion to continue it to the, our next meeting, which I think is in three weeks. So that gives the 12th of April. Yeah, the 12th of April. Um, but it also gives the assembly an opportunity to have a work session and go through point by point this ordinance. I don't think it's controversial. I think it's some, some, some th issues that are ripe for discussion. And um, so with that said, Mr. Chair, I hope that um, we can kind of tone it down and move forward and work together. Um, so that's my report. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Steele, sir. I have no committee report, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Honeman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so with some indulgence, uh, first I wanted to uh, take just a few moments. I'm not asking for a moment of silence, but just keep the folks in Brussels, Belgium, in, in your thoughts. And, uh, it's not lost on me that this could happen anywhere, and that's pretty tragic and uh, pretty shocking for the world. 
Um, secondly is I think what's very important to remember uh, to the community, I hope that you're watching, paying attention and listening. We've got some good candidates, some good choices and some issues that are very important to our community. Coming up Tuesday, April 5th, so please don't forget to vote. Um, I believe voting is open now, early? Or vote open up the 21st of March, sir. So uh, vote early. I can't say vote often. That would be illegal. Not unless but, you're in Chicago. <laughs> exactly. But uh, uh, please uh, please remember to vote. It is important. Every single vote should count. I'm also looking very forward to the coming year um, and effort of trying to get vote by mail. I'd like to continue to participate in some effort. I know I've been very proud to I think that that will uh, turn a very high percentage of returns on a voting, and I, I would, I'll, I'm looking forward to seeing that coming to be. Um, briefly, I know I, ha I don't take the time often enough to thank uh, members of this body. We're all very hardworking, I know, but I, I want to take a few moments to, to thank uh, Mr. Evans and his shift and change in the ad hoc committee to homelessness. Uh, this is an effort in our community. It's very, very much growing and very much a real issue. Uh, these are somebody's family members, somebody's friends. It could be one of ours. Uh, and so uh, this is a very important topic. I hope we can make some monumental movement towards uh, addressing this and coming up with some very workable solutions. And Mr. Hall, as he leaves this body, as I do in the next couple of weeks, uh, I want to thank you for being ahead of the game and thinking. And I know you didn't do it by yourself, but this uh, push to work with our planning and zoning and, and working around the mar marijuana regulations, I know the Matsu. Uh, borough assembly is struggling and they're still now uh, uh, trying to figure out they keep postponing their zoning and land use and maybe it's for the better maybe we're the wrong way to approach but thank you for all your efforts on that uh, and Mr. Flynn as well for keeping us uh, uh, addressed with the uh, issues coming forth on our very important transportation system with that said public safety committee meeting was last Friday the 18th very busy agenda uh, and uh, we dealt with uh, I think this body will be pleased to know that we postponed or delayed uh, moving towards uh, metal recycling and secondhand precious metal uh, recycling or list and registry similar to pawn shops. Um, I'm hopeful that Ms. Tucker, and thank you for her and her staff, Ms. Rosella Young, for uh, acting very quickly on what Ms. Rosella was very uh, dogged on trying to remind me, hey, uh, you need, need to get you some examples and things of that nature. I uh, like to keep it as simple as possible, but uh, it occurs to me it won't likely pass before I'm off the body. But I'd like this this body to realize that uh, there are some very important um, uh, things to dealing with uh, thefts and and uh, the proper tracking. It's a tool I think the police department could use uh, in registry of these particular businesses. Uh, so that said, we'll have one more meeting of the Public Safety Committee while I'm chair. That's uh, Friday, April 15th. Uh, it's just ahead of the certification of the election. I look forward to serving on my last uh, uh, chair. I know that Mr. Evans is, uh, looks to be the I've asked Mr. Evans to take over as chairman of that committee. And, uh, very capable and able, and I, and I, uh, I know it's a very important meeting. So I, I think we're going to have barbecue on April 15th. So please come to have barbecue and celebrate our, or at least my last meeting. We, we try to do something so it's middle of the day meetings. Uh, with that said, I yield the floor and uh, look forward to tonight's meeting. Thank you, Mr. Tony. As you brought up vote by mail, we'll give the clerk a moment because we've had a development in that. Not quite vote by mail, but it's a precursor to it. Madam Clerk. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the clerk's office sent out a press release today, and I'm sure the assembly members were copied on that. And we are unveiling tomorrow morning at 9.30 a drop box for voters to drop off their absentee by mail ballots. And it is located in the back of Fairview Recreation Center. And the box is really cool. It's got municipal clerk's office decals on it. And we have a big shout out to a couple of people. Of course, Deputy Clerk Amanda Moser, whose vision this is. Um, our project manager, Dennis Wheeler, who made sure that it happened, and Alan Kajowski and his awesome crew who um, stored the box, helped us get the decals on and placed it. So tomorrow morning, 9.30, we're going to have an unveiling. And if you've got your by mail ballot envelope and would like to drop it off, it'll be open then, and we'll see you there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Now, as we look forward to the future, this type of a drop box, you'll see more of these happen around town as the clerk's office figures out 
where these drop boxes can go for vote by mail. We're looking forward to moving forward on this. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Next item in business is the addendum to the agenda. Mr. Chair. Ma'am. I just forgot to mention, um, we are not anticipating action on the cell tower debate tonight. No, we're not, so, because it's still tied up in B and Z. Yeah, so um, my hope, though, is that we can have an assembly work session on the cell tower ordinance either on April 1st or April 8th. When we get down to that item, let's discuss it. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Greg Jackson, I need a motion on the addendum to the Thank agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to incorporate the addendum Second. to the agenda. Moved and seconded. I'm going to now go through those items that need a little further discussion. Mr. Hall, sir. Nothing? Ms. Johnston, ma'am. Mr. Starr, sir. No, is somebody going to pull the points of light one, though? Okay, that's all. Mr. Trini, are you, are you asking for items to be pulled yes. at this point? I'm sorry. I thought you typically did that after you uh, read the addendum into the agenda. Yeah. Uh, There's no objection. Yes, sir. I want to pull 9B1 and uh, 9E3. Say again, Mr. Hall. Is it B Bravo? Yeah. Yes, there's no objection to uh, the addendum to the agenda being incorporated, so that's the reason we didn't have a vote on that, Madam Clerk. You want to replace that on the records. Mr. Hall, you pulled nine e you pulled nine B one and what? And nine echo three. Nine echo three. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Ms. Johnston, ma'am? No items, thank you. Mr. Starr, sir? No, sir. Mr. Peterson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to pull 9B2, B as in boy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Evans, sir? No items, sir. Ms. Gray Jackson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item 9, Delta 5. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nine Delta Five. Yeah. Mr. Flynn, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the addendum, item nine Alpha Three. Thank you, sir. Ms. Dombowski, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. On the addendum, item 9, Bravo 1, Alpha. No, he pulled 9B1. Yes, Mr. Steele. No items. Thank you. Mr. Honeman. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, for reading 9 Alpha 1 and to declare potential conflict uh, 9 Bravo 6 and 9 Bravo 7. Uh, as well, I'd like to pull the, on the um, reports uh, 9 Echo 2 from the regular agenda. Okay, I got B6 and B7. What was the other one? Nine Echo Two. The Kirk reminds me, administration. The Kirk reminds me that she thinks you wanted nine D fourteen. Yes, that's Eight why four. I'm in the queue, Mr. Chairman. Didn't see you. 9D14. Thank you.
the list. We'll get there. Okay. We're going to read it a different way now. We'll get there. 9A1, 9A3, 9B1, 9B2, 9D5, 9D14, 9E2, 9B6, 9E3, 9B7. 9 what? Barbara 1. I know, but since he pulled 9B1, we we're going to pick up the A2. So, that's all that's been pulled for maybe further heard, discussion. Mr. Chairman, maybe I have misheard. I thought Mr. Horland pulled 9 Bravo oh. 6 and 7. I did. 9 Bravo I 6 and 7. I said that 6 and 7. Oh, I must have misheard you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank Are we okay? Yeah, good. Okay, then we'll vote. I need a motion to approve the consent the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. As amended. It's moved and seconded. Now we'll bring up the bring up the vote on it, except for those items who we'll pull for no further discussion. We have a small technical issue. Please vote. That was approved in MSC by the body. Now we're going to go back to those items. We'll pull for a little further discussion. The first item was item 9A1. It's resolution AR 2016-69, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly. Recognizing local restaurants participating in displaying the USDA My Plate Food Guide icon. No, move pull Mr. Honeman. Move, move to vote. approve. Second. Ask unanimous. See no objection. That's approved. Mr. Honeman. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It be my honor to read this. This uh, similar resolution 2016-69, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing local restaurants' participation in displaying the USDA My Plate Food Guide icon. Whereas First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative was developed to encourage and promote healthier lifestyles through improved eating habits and to resolve the challenge of childhood obesity within our country. And whereas the Anchorage Assembly approved AO 2014-149 requiring the USDA food guide icon be displayed in all food service facilities located on property under the control or ownership of the municipality of Anchorage. And whereas the My Plate icon was introduced as a graphical representation of the 2015 through 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, and whereas posting the USDA My Plate Food Guide icon in restaurants helped to educate and encourage consumers to make healthy food choices and eat nutritious, well-balanced meals, and whereas support of local businesses to advocate nutrition and healthy living will have a lasting effect on individuals and families within the community. And whereas the Let's Move initiative has an emphasis on nutrition but also encourages physical activity and better labeling of food, proactive participation by Anchorage restaurants will assist in the moving the Let's Move objectives forward and aids in the overall success of the program. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Anchorage Assembly and Mayor Berkowitz recognize and thank the following businesses for their participation in displaying the USDA My Plate Food Guide icon. AK Alchemist, Alaska Bagel Restaurant, Catered Blessing Dessert First, Chair Five, Chepo's Mexican Restaurant, Double Musky Inn, Fire Tap in the Takatnu Commons, Ale House and Restaurant, 
Garcia's Cantina and Cafe, Gumbo House, Jackie's Place Restaurant, LED Ultra Lounge and Grill, La Cabana Mexican Restaurant, La Hacienda, Lily's fam Family Restaurant, Mama O's Seafood Restaurant, Pepper Mill, Sea Galley, Table 6, Taco King on Boniface, The Muse, Tinker's Rainforest Deli, and Tri Grill. Passed and approved by the Anchorage Assembly this 22nd day of March 2016. This is Ian from the Alaska Bagel Restaurant. Um, I just wanted to say thanks so much for having me here. I think this is a wonderful thing to do. Um, people need to eat healthy. It has a huge impact on their lives, I would say, and anything we can do to help that is a positive thing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Well, thank you for inviting us to the Gambo House. And say, everyone, thank you for keeping open the door for us. Appreciate it. Thanks. Ray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to <clears throat> take a personal moment to thank all the restaurants that have agreed to put the USDA My Plate food icon somewhere in the restaurant, not telling folks what to eat, but just reminding people in our community to eat healthy. And I want to take a moment to thank um, my student, Renee Proctor. He is a social work stu student doing his practicum with me for a whole year now. We have a couple more months to go, but he was. Um, uh, a little bit, uh, I don't want to use the word aggressive, but he did a really good job reaching out to restaurants, um, <laughs> asking them to put the icon uh, somewhere in their restaurant so people can see it and, and make some healthy choices. In addition to that, Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, I want to just briefly um, mention the fact that there was a press conference this morning, and um, the press conference was the result of a study done by the Roberts Woods Foundation. And the bottom line is it showed that, that our community um, is getting healthier. We have lots of work to do, and we're going to do that, but, but there's been a lot of improvements, improvements because of the efforts of folks from the state and the school district, and also our, um, our Let's Move uh, task force. It's proved to be very effective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. Next item in front of us is on the addendum to the agenda. It's item 983, pulled by Mr. Flynn. Resolution AR 2016 89 resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly thanking Jack Wright Real Estate with Alaska Salvation Army and friends of, and friends of the Alaska PLY for their support and partnership with the 19th Annual Alaska Points of Light Youth Leadership Institute. I recognize the 2016 Alaska Points of Lights graduates. Mr. Flynn, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to approve. Second. Ask unanimous. See no objection. That's approved. Mr. Flynn. Thank you. Mr. Bassett, would you please come forward? I believe uh, Mr. Hall is going to present and bring uh, your student representatives. Whereas the Center for Creative Leadership created the Points of Light Youth Leadership Curriculum in 1996 to encourage and train young Americans to get actively involved in their community, and whereas since the first Alaska PYLI Institute held in 1998, more than 900 Alaska students from around the state have graduated from the Alaska Points of Light Youth Leadership Institute, and whereas one of the goals of the Alaska PYLI is to train diverse middle level and high school students in creative community leadership to serve others and make a positive difference in their school community and, the better, and to better the world for all, and whereas the 19th annual Alaska Points of Light Youth Leadership Institute was sponsored by Jack White Real Estate with partners the Alaska Salvation Army, UAA Trio Multicultural Center and New, new Student Programs, Stellar Be the Change, Jewel Lake Tasty Freeze, Anchorage Elks Lodge and Area Schools, and conducted over spring break March, 18, sorry, March 14 through 18, 2016 at the Salvation Army Anchorage Corps Community Center and whereas the, an outstanding community panel, panel, including Rich Owens, owner of Tasty Freeze, Dr. Andre Thorne, director of the UAA Multicultural Center, Teresa Lyons, director of the UAA New Student Programs, and Alexis Fernandez, KTVA Channel 11 news reporter, participated in the program, as well as one UAA student leader mentor and six Alaska 
PYLI graduate assistants, including Daquan Brunson, Bunsen, a UAA senior student and leadership mentor, Samantha Marie Anaruk from East Anchorage High School, uh, Tawana Licato from Bartlett High School, Ernestine Endure from Bartlett High School, Pa Ying Tao from East Anchorage High School, April Yang from East Anchorage High School, and Nicole Yound from East Anchorage High School. Whereas 32 outstanding youth leaders in volunteer service participated in the 40-hour community leadership training that included five days of skill development and instruction in self and community assessment, team communication, diversity, goal setting, project planning, decision making, and service learning activities, including performing an individual Anchorage Give Back service project by June 1, 2016 of this year. And these participants were honored as Alaska's 2016 Points of Light Youth Leadership Institute graduates. Iman Allen from Eagle River High School, Isis Allen from uh, Eagle River High School, Ayana Anderson from West Anchorage High School, Isabel Georgiana Azbilqueta <laughs> Balsameli, also from West Anchorage High School. And by the way, I'm going to apologize if I mess up a couple of these names, but I'm doing my darndest. And, and, it's, and, and I have to say, this, this is one Better of my job favorite. Than I could do, Mr. Flynn. This is one of my favorite resolutions to read just because it does such a wonderful job of, of demonstrating the remarkable diversity of our community, so it's, it's fun. Uh, Lauren Kraft from West Anchorage High School, Lorenzo Del Rosario from Polaris K-12 School, uh, Joanne Encabado from West Anchorage High School, Sue Her from Bartlett High School, and Bika Cathay from uh, East Anchorage High School, Romello Lacato from Beggage Middle School, Chue Lee from East Anchorage Middle High School, uh, Mary Lee from East Anchorage High School, Terrence McKnight Jr. East Anchorage High School, Esmeralda Santos, Santos from West Anchorage High School, Maya Smith McClendon from East Anchorage High School, Chester Tapafua from Diamond High School, Emily Taului from West Anchorage High School, Angel Tahara, oh boy, <laughs> Tava, Ta, uh, Tava Pru, Prung, Prung Sinuku from East Anchorage High School, Jaya Tao from Bartlett High School, Padi Tao from East Anchorage High School, Vape, Vapo Thompson from Mears Middle School, Nicole Thornton from Diamond High School, Lu Shunshine Vu. Bue from East Anchorage High School, Kao Nu Shang from Bartlett High School, and Saeed Anas Tala bin Zubair from West Anchorage High School. And whereas the Anchorage Municipal Assembly joins in celebrating these distinguished students from Anchorage and all across Alaska who demonstrate an unwavering dedication to improving the quality of life for all residents and serve as harbingers of a bright future within the municipality of Anchorage, now therefore, the Anchorage Assembly congratulates the graduates of Alaska's 2016 Points of Light Youth Leadership Institute and applauds Jack White Real Estate, the Alaska Salvation Army, the UAA TRIO program, and all friends of Alaska PYLI for their support of the Anchorage Youth Leadership and Student Volunteerism. Passed and approved by the Anchorage Assembly this 22nd day of March 2016. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I want to thank Madam uh, Clerk uh, and the Assembly for this wonderful honor. Uh, we're very thankful for the Assembly to recognize these outstanding students. Uh, the 19th year since 1998, we now have over 950 graduates of the Alaska Points of Light Youth Leadership Institute. My name is Bo Bassett, I'm one of the adults involved. We recruit eighth graders to 12th graders across Anchorage of the pool of 15,642 students approximately. Uh, we are honoring the 25 that attended the Institute uh, and graduated. A number of them are here this evening. The five days of uh, leadership training was incredibly intensive. It's an adult training created by the Center for Creative Leadership. Team communication, community assessment, diversity, problem statement skills, 
creativity skills, decision making, project planning and organizing, goal setting, evaluation, and volunteer service. Very comprehensive, uh, resulting with each student being in a position to do an Anchorage give back project. We are so grateful for the students that attended. They gave their entire spring break. They could have been doing a number of other things. I think they were truly shocked at the quality of the training. I think they were shocked at the growth and development. And they, in their training, prioritized five community problems. They assessed all the problems in the community, and these are the top five community problems. Domestic violence was number one. The budget crisis was number two. Drug and alcohol abuse was number three. Smoking and secondhand smoke was number four. And sexual abuse was number five. Within the training, the groups looked at five specific problems, teen pregnancy, domestic violence, suicide rate, high, high school dropouts, and sexual assault, and looked at ways they might do service projects to, to address those. We also assessed the motivation of the 25 attendees. The five top motivators was achievement, family, and enjoyment were tied for second. Expertise was third, and a tie for fourth was love and responsibility. I think the attendees this year gave me a sense of extraordinary commitment to achievement, academics, and a really big heart. And I think they discovered in their class um, quite, a, quite a bond in the community and in their class. So without further ado, I would like to have some of those that could make it this evening introduce themselves and, and say thanks to you. Um, hi, my name is Ambika Kahafle. I'm a sophomore at East High School. And through Pylai, I learned a lot of things about leadership skills and then the problems that we have in our community, such as Mr. Bo said, domestic violence, and sexual assault, teen pregnancy, and other stuff. Pilot has helped me learn a lot of things about my community and leadership. Through Pilot, I learned a lot of stuff and I'll carry that through my life. And thank you for everything. And thank you to those who donated money for us and made possible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Nicole Young, and I'm a junior at East High School. I would like to thank Pylai for helping me become more confident because I've always seen myself as a follower, not a leader, but this program helped me to become a leader. And I would like to thank Mr. Bo for everything and uh, people who supported us and donated to support Pylai. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, my name is um, Pai Ying Tao. I'm a freshman at East High School. Uh, I came as a graduate this year um, to help Mr. Bo assist with the Palai incoming grads. I had to help him set up activities and help with the Palai students, and it was a great experience because I've never been a graduate before. And He helped me reveal my leadership skills inside me that I didn't know existed. It helped me gain a lot of confidence and courage to interact with others, express myself, and meet new people. Previous times, I saw a lot of community problems, and I didn't know how to fix it or how to help. But since Pilai has helped me gather these knowledge and resources for me, now I know how to help my community. And thanks to those who donated to Pilot to make it possible. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome, sir. Oh, hello, uh, I am Lorenzo Del Rosario. I am an eighth grader currently attending Polaris K-12. And I would like to say that Pilot is it's a great program. Um, you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about the community. You learn a lot about leadership. Uh, I had, a, I had a great experience at Pilai, a uh, very diverse set of students, and yeah. Uh, and I would like to thank those who donated to help the program. Thank you, sir. 
Welcome, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Terrence McBank, Jr. And Pylai really helped me become a better leader because um, I am more of a, a quiet person. And even talking now is really nerve-wracking for me. But uh, it's helped me gain confidence in a lot of areas and helped me identify uh, traits of a leader that I need to improve on. Because uh, one of the reasons I attended Pylai it's because I have two younger brothers and I wanted to lead them better inside our house. And I'd like to thank Mr. Bo for everything that he's taught us and anyone that supported the program. Thank you. Bo, we have some comments for you too, sir. Are you ready for them? Mr. Holman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, first of all, to, uh, to the last speaker, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name and what school you're from. Sorry, my name is Terrence McMay, and I attend East. I'm a freshman. Fantastic. Well, the East Anchorage is well represented tonight. You all look very sharp. Um, Bo, uh, I know that I believe I was at your very first, uh, out in Birchwood, I believe I was uh, invited to be a guest speaker at the very first PILA, uh, uh meeting and, and training. And I believe I, about 10 years later, I was, uh, I was back invited to speak before you when you were set up at your current operation, the Salvation Army. And uh, I've checked in on you, of course, kept an eye on the, on the young men and women that are, uh, are participating. Uh, what a phenomenal experience for everybody. And, and again, to give up your spring break, and when you could have slept in and, and maybe went to a movie or, or goofed around, you actually were doing something that um, will hopefully and someday um, it better our community. And through your leadership, as you know, leadership isn't a trait you're born with. It's something you learn, and, and uh, you were in that training. and so. Someday, you may be here and making important decisions for the rest of the community as well. I hope so. So uh, Mr. Evans has a homeless uh, committee coming up, and that's one of the things I see you have some of the issues in that, that kind of relate to that. Uh, but that's something you might uh, might be interested in. Keep an eye and an ear out. And thank you very much for, for participating and hopefully making Anchorage a better place with solutions. Thank you. Mr. Flynn, sir. Well, just thanks. Mr. Bassett for your continued support of this program and, and thanks to all of you students who took part, uh, including those who came back. Um, Mr. Holman said he, he, he may be up here. My expectation is one of you, maybe many of you, will be up here in the years ahead, so get to work. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for coming tonight. Ms. Dombowski, ma'am. Thank you. I couldn't resist the urge. I. Um, when I was young, I got involved in public speaking. And Terrence, I know your pain when you feel a little nervous, but I have to tell you, each and every one of you did a remarkable job. I remember as an adult coming the first time talking in front of the assembly, my knees were knocking and my voice went up about 10 octaves because I was very nervous. And um, I have to tell you, you guys have done a, a better job than I've seen a lot of adults do. And and you know, you are only limited by your own desire and fire in your belly. It's not, it not, doesn't mean that everything's gonna be easy, but you can do it. You just have to put one foot in front of the other. And getting up today and speaking in front of us and sharing with us some of, the, of um, what you've learned um, is really inspiring to me. And I wanna say thank you very much. You all did a very good job. No other comments. Bo, just wanna thank you personally. I've seen you over the years, and it's great when you bring these young people in here because they are our future. And thank you very much for this, the training you've given them. You I wish the state legislature would look at the issues you guys brought up because yep. they don't seem to be discussing them. Yep. So we meet this week planning the uh, 20th anniversary of Alaska Pili, and on the agenda is the discussion of each assembly member recruiting at least one young person for the training. <laughs> it's not set in stone, but... Thanks very much. In fact, <laughs> since Mr. Holman's leaving us, he can get a bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks, Bo. Yep, yep. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next item in front of us is item 9B1. That was pulled by Mr. Hall. And then 9B1A was pulled by Mr. Dabowski. So, Mr. Hall, we're going to go with you first. Yes, here. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I move the approve. uh, approval of the S version. Second. The S version was approved. Mr. Hall. Uh, was yes, moved. I believe the resolution is very self-explanatory. Uh, 
major concerns in regards to the state obtaining a sustainable budget. And uh, by that, uh, you know, we're not referring to a balanced budget by borrowing funds, but by a sustainable budget that will go on for years so that we as a municipality are able to construct a sustainable budget ourselves without uh, concerns about what may uh, be a cost shifting that comes to us during uh, the budget process because we typically will have our budget approved prior to theirs. So I urge approval. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Busky, you're on the line. Did you want to say anything, man? Um, I was just trying to get clarification. I didn't see the S version until I got here, so it's taken out the income tax line. Good thing. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments from some members? As unanimous consent on approval of the S version. Madam Kirk, that's approved by the body. Next item. The clerk advising me we're having a technical problem with the microphones, so please own the microphone. You need to speak into it, myself included. Apparently, we're not getting there. Whatever the little gremlins are that work with electronics, we're not quite there yet. We're now on item 9B. Two. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to approve. Second. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Ms. Dombowski for her help in co-sponsoring uh, uh, this resolution. And I also want to uh, thank Assembly Council Julia Tucker for her help in creating this resolution on, on a rather short notice. Um, the fire department station number three uh, in East Anchorage is due for completion early this summer. And I thought it would be a good idea to put a naming panel together. Uh, to put a name on this station in time for the ribbon cutting and uh, grand opening. And usually it's customary to name a new fire station as a way to honor a person whose civic leadership and contributions to the community and the fire department may be recognized. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our, our uh, ombudsman, uh, Daryl Hess, uh, who has graciously, graciously agreed to supervise this naming commission. And I, I think I saw Daryl here earlier. Uh, <clears throat> I, I selected uh, two Anchorage residents to serve on this panel, Carolyn Ramsey and John Lux, and they both gladly agreed to serve. Also, Mayor Berkowitz has designated Karen Cameron and Sheila Southgreg to serve on this panel. Uh, well, I'd like to thank all these citizens for agreeing to commit to their time to complete this task. Uh, one name that I would ask the panel to consider for the fire station is uh, Max Gruenberg. Uh, Representative Gruenberg was instrumental in helping to secure the funding uh, to build this new fire station number three, and he also served the citizens of Northeast Anchorage honorably for many years in the state legislature. Uh, now the naming panel's recommendation will come back to the assembly for a public hearing and final action. I invite my assembly colleagues to co-sponsor this resolution if they so choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Toneman. Yes, uh, and Mr. Peterson might have been reading my mind. I would actually like to be added as a co-sponsor on this uh, resolution as well as uh, it would echo uh, Mr. Peterson's uh, comments towards the high uh, degree of consideration for Representative uh, Grunberg. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Flynn, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I spent a fair amount of time working on the siting of this particular station, um, working with my community councils, and I'd be happy to be shown as a co-sponsor as well. Thank you. Madam Kirk, would you just add everybody on the assembly? If somebody doesn't want their name, they can ask to have it removed. But I think it reflects all of our concerns. He did a great job for this town. would like to recognize me. Just add everybody, if you would. Any objection to the approval of that item? No objection to that item is approved. Next item in front of us is on page two, item 9B6, resolution 2016-73, resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly, stating his protest regarding transfer ownership. Move to approve. Dispensary. I'll make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. I understand Mr. Honeman has a Honeman. declaration. Yes. I just need to make it uh, known for the record. I, I have known uh, at least one of the applicants, petitioners, for a number of years, uh, used to coach. Uh, I was I had the privilege of coaching uh, hockey at East High for a couple of years, and uh, 
Mr. Matika actually was a, a player. Also at 2012, um, although he's generally known for making good investments, I think um, he invested in one of my campaigns to run for mayor. Um, that wasn't successful, so probably not the best return on his investment. But uh, uh, as a uh, contribution, I felt that to the public uh, and to this body that I make that, that uh, disclosure and, and ask for consideration whether I should be allowed to participate. You're not being allowed not to participate. You're directed to participate, sir. Thank you. Any other comments on this item? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I hope Mr. Hone was a better hockey coach than candidate. <laughs> <laughs> two and two, Mr. Flynn, two and two. Uh, and Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I, uh, I believe, uh, and I think Mr. Matika and perhaps his partner in the, in the audience, but I believe there, there is a, a showing a protest on both these items uh, for, for awaiting a fire department uh, a review, and I believe that review has been made. But it was done in such a late hour that these items That'll still show. The clerk's office, and they can deal with that administratively. Right. So they should be uh, to let the, Mr. Matik and them know that this should, with the passage of this, and with the uh, administration or the clerk's office making contact with uh, Alcohol and Marijuana Control Board, like this should be ready, good, good to go for business. Ask unanimous consent. No objection. That's approved. Next item is pull us item nine B seven. Mr. Holman, you had a issue on that, but let's get a motion to approve. And a second first. So we've got something in front of us to discuss. When the board comes up, Mr. Chairman, I'll make the motion to approve. I presume that. Is there a I, second? I presume Mr. Honeman's declaration. It's the same same disclosure, Mr. Chairman, to my like my colleagues. You're directed to participate in this one too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Asking unanimous consent of the body. Jim Jackson, no objection, Madam Clerk. That item is approved by the body. Next time in front of us. Next time in front of this item on page four, a same memorandum AM 79-2016 regarding previously adopted assembly ordinance 2015-112S as, as amended. Ms. Gray Jackson, you pulled that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> First, I want to thank the clerk for providing this document um, in our agenda packet, but um, this afternoon we received um, some comments from our municipal attorney who highlighted what the um, proper, I'll use that word, proper procedure for this is. So with that said, I think the first thing that I need to do is move to postpone indefinitely 95. And if that's incorrect, Ms. Tucker, let me know. But um, move to postpone indefinitely 95. Second. Ms. Tucker, is there a second? Second, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Tucker? Um, I was thinking that uh, the motion... We need you speaking to your microphone, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm thinking that the motion would be... Uh, uh, to amend uh, something previously adopted. I, I'm not sure about uh, the uh, motion to postpone something. Uh, wh why you would postpone 9D5 uh, indefinitely. Mr. Oh, if Mr. I can, before you talk, Mr. Flynn, thank you, Mr. Flynn. Mr. Chairman, can I, can I respond to our attorney? Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Um, I withdraw my motion to postpone indefinitely for starters, okay? And I'm going to start this with the instructions that I got from our attorney. And then after I'm done, maybe she'll see why I thought that it was a good idea to postpone indefinitely 95. With that said, Mr. Chairman, um, AO 215-112-S as amended, the Executive Branch Reorg, it was passed and approved by the Assembly on November 24th, 2015, and now we have to correct that. So I move to amend AO 2015-112-S, which was previously passed and approved by the Assembly on November 24th, 2015, and must be corrected. The three corrections are spelled out in, the, in AM 79-2016. I need a second. Second. Move and second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We need to, to vote on the amendment that's spelled out in uh, item D5. Okay. No. Mr. Chairman, if it would help, I, I'll be happy to read what the um, amendments are. Amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Page 8, line 47, to add the following. 
5, 22E, executive exempt, subject to appointment by the mayor or the Anchorage Equal Rights Commission, subject to approval of the mayor. Page 9, line 2, to add the following. 6, number 6, 23E, executive exempt, subject to appointment by the mayor or the Anchorage Equal Rights Commission, subject to the approval of the mayor. Page 9, line 6, to add the following. 7, 24E, executive exempt, subject to appointment by the mayor. On the motion to amend something previously adopted by the assembly. Ms. Dombowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a procedural question. I've never seen us do this that I can recall. We've not done it frequently. So my whole point is if, if we're amending an ordinance that's already been passed many, many months ago, why aren't we just bringing forward a new ordinance? Because I think if we were, I mean, heck, if, the, if we could do this every time, I wouldn't have to have the marijuana ordinance that I have on the agenda later. I don't understand why we're doing this, this methodology. I've never seen this done before. Anybody? Yes, sir. To the chair, Ms. Dombowski, we certainly could address this through a new ordinance. This uh, form of motion is found in Robert's Rules of Order. It is akin but not identical to a motion to rescind, which is part of the which is part of Title II in our code. Um, the clerk's office advised that this would be better handled by a motion to uh, amend something that was previously adopted. The assembly is more comfortable with another form. That's the assembly's choice. But this is a legitimate motion under Robert's Rules of Order. And I did not doubt you, Mr. Falsey. I'm just looking at precedent because what I'm thinking of is Title 23, which we have later, um, a whole host of other ordinances. If we're just going to put something on the consent agenda now and just amend things that we've passed months ago, I don't know that that is a clear and transparent process, frankly. Um, so I just, I have a real problem with this one. I know it's allowed in Robert's rules. I totally trust you. Um, I'm just, I've, I've never seen the assembly operate this way. Well, it, it, takes, it takes eight to approve, so. Well, as I was going to say, I just, this, this is a new type of venture that I just have never seen, so I'm reluctant to do it. I can tell you going back, it doesn't happen that often, Mr. Dabowski. Well, Mr. Chairman, I believe you because you've been here for a while. I have been. <laughs> I believe you. Um, thank you. With that said, um, I, I'm more comfortable with the other process. I think it would be appropriate to bring forward a new AO and just go through the process. Is there anything pressing, urgent, why this has to be done this way now? I mean, maybe you can convince me if if there's a really uh, significant pressing reason. Mr. Chair. Through the administration, employee relations. Is there somebody for employee relations? Guess not. We're, we're not aware of any urgency, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Ms. Dombowski? Maybe, maybe I could help Ms. Dombowski. Love to hear Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn, you're on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Maybe I can um, split the baby here. Somebody and, said you uh, caused this. <laughs> I, I did not do this. This is not my fault. Not this time. Not the rumor I hear. Usually it is. Not this time. Um, how about, um, and I'll not make the motion until I get some, generate some discussion, but we just set this for public hearing on April 12th, so it at least it's publicly noticed and people, if they wish to testify on it, may. Um, since given it is a substantive change, um, and then we can vote on that. If we do it that way, they only take six votes. The process in Robert's rules is if you want to do it immediately, it takes eight votes without giving prior notice. But if we give notice today for a hearing we're going to have on the 12th, then it only takes six votes to do it. I, I, if, if that's not horribly is there any pressing issue that needs done terrible tonight? <laughs> to the administration, I would. Mr. Fault, is there any pressing issue tonight? That is a question probably better addressed to employee relations, but I'm not aware of any particularly pressing issue. You're right. So okay. with that, City manager indicates there's no real need to do with, it. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll move to uh, uh, set this item for public hearing on April 12th. Second. Move to the second. Is there any objection? Seeing none, this item will appear in front of us on April 12th. Mr. Chairman, I just want to make a comment on the policy Go call. Ahead, Mr. Star. Well, the ability to amend an AO or an ordinance with an AM or an AIM, I think, is where the dangerous part for me lies on that. So if, if there's anybody listening on the administrative side, 
You put a lot of credence in the ordinance process, um, particularly Mr. Mayor. You drafted an ordinance for submittal last meeting, which was, I think, the appropriate way to do it. So the uh, inference that Mr. Flynn put out there for a public hearing, I guess, is part of it. But the, the uh, ability to change a, a previously approved ordinance through a memorandum, I think, is where I think we have issues, uh, w or I do particularly, with, with the process. The ordinance carries quite a bit of weight uh, for us to change it with a lower level of government in an AM, I think, is where we probably should set a policy that we don't do it that way. I know, Mr. Starr, we Thank can you. rescind a previous action of the Assembly. For example, if we want to rescind something that happened years ago, Certainly, all we'd have to do is give notice at the meeting that we're going to move to rescind that action. Then it only takes six votes the next assembly to make that happen. Fine, and that's, so. that's an appropriate action to take if you're going to rescind. It also, you know, forces the question to occur at another meeting. But um, the, you know, the point is, is you're you're killing that item off completely. In this case here, we're modifying uh, something that had, that had a public hearing, and I think you know, Mr. Flynn's right to have another one. But again, that the cleaner way to do it. it. The strategy shouldn't be an AM. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Greg Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Just for clarification, if necessary, to the public, um, what I, my, my motion was a legitimate motion, and um, it was brought to my attention by our attorney uh, early this afternoon, and that's why I brought it forward. With that said, the changes that um, were, that need to be made are really just housekeeping changes. That's it. But even though they're just housekeeping changes, I have to say that I, I do agree that it, it would be cleaner to just have a, a brand new ordinance and folks would understand it a whole lot better also. And then we'll have a public hearing in, in two weeks on this document. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Flynn, any comments? I saw your name up here. Anything else, sir? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I guess I must not have been taken out of the queue when I finished. Mr. Dabowski, anything? Your name's on there, too. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. So Mr. Stark kind of hit it. I mean, I think uh, Mr. Flynn makes a good point, and I think he addressed, you know, a big part of my pro about my issue was, you know, why are we doing this as an AM? I just didn't quite get there. And Mr. Starr spoke eloquently to my second half of the issue is I don't understand, you know, why we're going through this particular mechanism. I think it would be cleaner if we did an AO. So, um I just don't understand why, why we can't just introduce this as an AO and move on. Well, now it'll be handled our next assembly meeting, so we'll be there. Yeah, it's, I guess it's the point, I, Mr. I think the point Ms. Domboski is making is this could simply be introduced as an ordinance tonight and heard on the 12th. It would be the same effect from a timeline standpoint yeah. and yet would be cleaner procedurally in the, in the manner that Mr. Starr speaks to. Yeah, I think we could essentially make everyone happy. If we could just... Um, we can never make anyone, everyone happy. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, I will work with Assembly Council. Hopefully we could get this introduced later tonight. Um, but I mo I'll move to postpone this indefinitely because I think, honestly, it should be an AO. Well, there's already a motion on the floor. Well, it's doesn't... been approved to move it to our next meeting. So you've, got, you've got the time to do it, Amy. Yeah, but, but, but. Just take a break. <laughs> During our break, next time in front of us is item. Okay, Kirk advised me we need to vote. Please vote on postponing this item or bringing this item up at our next meeting on the 12th. Please vote. There. Okay, that was approved. Next time in front of us. Is item 9D14, the same memorandum, AM 194-2016. Uh, Administration, we pulled that at your request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We request that the item be postponed indefinitely because of an error in the documentation. We will resubmit at the April 12th meeting. Move to postpone indefinitely. Second. Ask unanimous. See no objection. That's approved, Madam Clerk. Next item in front of us that I've got is on page six. It's nine E three, a semi in semi memorandum, AIM thirty two 2016 2014 2015 and report of the Municipal Board of Ethics. Mr. Hall, you pulled that, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move acceptance. Mr. Hall. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I pull this. I'd ask uh, Mr. Uh, David Nesbitt to please come up to the microphone. He chairs our uh, Board of Ethics for the municipality, and this is a group of individuals that put in a tremendous amount of time uh, dealing with ethic situations or issues with us. And I'd like to give him a chance to speak to us for a moment and, and introduce the members of his board that are here with him. And uh, just to express our sincere appreciation for what you and that board does. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. And Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor, uh, it's a pleasure to appear before you. We, uh, the Board of Ethics appears before the Ethics and Assembly uh, Committee regularly now for the last year or so. We've been meeting with them, but it's a, ple it's a pleasure to meet in front of the whole, the whole body. And, uh, and we've, uh, by code, we're required to provide to you an annual report. And that annual report, I think, has been provided to you. It's the last uh, two years, actually, 14 and 15. It's on very nice paper and it has wonderful graphics. And we've made it that way so it's even more readable for everybody. But really what I wanted to highlight here tonight were a couple of things. And, and thank you again for letting me brag a little bit about this committee because we do work uh, really hard to make sure that the ethics and the public trust is ensured. And so uh, uh, to make sure that the public trusts what our government is doing. And that's kind of what our goal is to do. And, and I'm encouraged by some of the discussion here tonight, actually. It's been, it's been very enjoyable, enjoyable to listen to. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an amendment to the ethics code uh, referring to gift disclosures. One of the reasons we wanted to do that was because we were spending, uh, as a board, considerable amount of time talking and discussing gift disclosures for teachers. Uh, the, the purpose of that amendment was both to clarify that code, but also to free us up to do other things as well, because we were spending quite a bit of time on that. I'm happy to report that that is that has been a successful amendment. Our numbers have gone down dramatically on the gift disclosures. Our time on those issues has gone down dramatically. And it's allowed us to spend quite a bit more time on the issues facing the assembly. The assembly has been working uh, with us, presenting issues to us. Uh, and the board is very happy to be working with the assembly and also spending more time with the public on its issues uh, on notice of potential violations and with uh, requests for advisory opinions. In there, I'd like to highlight on pages 8 through 11, there's a summary of the last couple of years of uh, notices of potential violation and the request for advisory opinions. Um, I highlight those for you because some of those are pertinent to things that happen here in the assembly with our, uh, the body here. Um, we have also revised the website, uh, the public website, to make sure that our opinions are posted uh, promptly and also so that ease of access to our public, so that they can access all of our decisions and opinions readily, and so that if they have any questions, we're trying to create a little body of work that the public can refer to uh, before they, uh, or when considering um, filing a notice of potential violation or requesting a, uh, an advisory opinion from the board or from somebody else with the clerk's office. Um, we are also, as part of that effort, we've really been working hard to be very timely with our decisions. It's very, very important, I think, so that if the assembly comes to us or the public comes to us, that we respond in like manner. And it's respect for the process and respect for the people who bring their issues to us that we, res that we respond as quickly, absolutely as quickly as possible. Sometimes that's meant meeting four times. We met four weeks in a row one time to make sure that we got things cleaned off our plate. Um, and we met 26 times in one year, even though we we're supposed to meet, you know, once a month, just to make sure that we are catching up with all of the things that are coming before our board. Um, also, um, we are currently working on a rewrite. Mr. Chair has, uh, has initiated that process. We are diligently working on that, I promise. And, uh, and we are trying, in, in similar fashion to what we did with the ethics uh, rewrite for gift disclosures, we're trying to simplify uh, the ethics code as a whole to make it more clear, more understandable to the public as a whole, as well as anybody who would consult that um, on any of the ethics issues that come up. Um, there's also in that uh, annual report a brief uh, summary of our opinion and our interpretation of the ethics code regarding the assembly as a whole and its role in the ethics opinions. 
and it's it can be confusing um, but I I would encourage the assembly to read that if it already hasn't and that has to do with whether um, a financial or personal interest is substantial is a matter for the assembly to determine that is your purview and the Board of Ethics has no interest in interfering with that at all in the event however that uh, an interest personal or financial should have been brought or whether it was brought but the detail was insufficient that is something that comes before the Board of Ethics and that's a distinction that's important to note because it is all of our interest to make sure that no one here or anywhere else gets in a jam because we want to help and make sure that doesn't happen in the future uh, and lastly um, the uh, there's a, a paragraph in the end of the of the annual report basically we are we are fully staffed with our what four or five five members we have an excellent excellent outstanding group of very very dedicated people with very unique and diverse opinions and perspectives on what we do and it is truly a joy um, this board really works hard and, and tries to do the right thing and uh, it's a very strong group and again I'd just like to emphasize at the very end too that we are here to help with the ethics but ethics also is trust and trust in our government and the trust in the way the process works and trust in what we do as a group uh, representing the citizens of this of this city and we're very very privileged and, and happy to help that's all I have thank you thank you sir we have a few questions if you don't mind Mr. Honeman has a question. Mr. Honeman, more, more of a comment. Fine. I want to. I want to thank you. I've sat in on um, as member of the Assembly's uh, Ethics Elections Committee, chaired by different people over the years. But Mr. Hall's done a very able job, um, and I want to thank you, of course, and all the members of the Board of Ethics too, uh, of, of your for your time and commitment to this. It certainly isn't for the pay. <laughs> um, and so, uh, saying that, uh, uh, it, it has been very hugely important that. We have the public's trust, and um, having the body available for the public to come to uh, in events of disclosures or even complaints is, is hugely important. So thank you for that. And uh, try not to be so serious. I keep waiting to see, like, national networking and band playing, and you look a lot like Jimmy Fallon. We've mentioned that before. So thank you, Mr. Mr. Nesbitt. On that note, Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. D did you say your name? Because we have people texting us, asking us if you're Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> I had to say that. I know. We should give you your autograph, please. <laughs> every, no. every committee meeting, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to take a moment. This is a really great report. It's really thorough. And I want to thank you and the rest of the commission for, for doing such a, a wonderful job. And I'm really glad that you now have time to um, revisit the code and, and make some very, very necessary changes. So, again, thank you and, and thanks to the rest of your commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, Starr. Yeah, thanks for your service. I, I, it's an important feature. Can you remind me of the disclosure um, after an advisory opinion has uh, been rendered? I see in this particular case there's actual cases named thereof, so I assume that those that are named in this report um, gave you permission to do that. Is that the yes. rule? Yes, uh, it confidentially has confidentiality must be waived before these types of things are released. In in all cases, yes. then even gen general questions of, of you know, Mr. Trainees, for example, in your quoted report talks about just an overall sense uh, on on one topic, which isn't specific to an individual assembly member or elected official, but as as importance. Uh, would that uh, advisory opinion become public without his approval? In the event that confidentiality has not been waived, if we do re release a report, it will be scrubbed of any kind of identifying information. I see. And so we actually go through the reports to make sure that if – it's pretty rare. Actually, most of the time, people who bring things before us, uh, they waive confidentiality. Sure. It's not really an issue. But until that happens, the process remains confidential. And anything that we do remains uh, in deliberative session. We try very hard to make sure that it, the process is followed carefully. And in the event it remains confidential, then we scrub the reports. Great. I, I, I say make them neutral. I don't mean to use the colloquial uh, scrub, but we just make sure that it's uh, that it is devoid of any identifying information to the best we can. Yeah. Right. I mean, obviously, certain things that come up, 
you can kind of figure it out. But we do the best we can to maintain that, Good. that confidentiality. It reads well. Thank you for doing yes. that. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Ms. Dabowski, ma'am. Thank you, Chair Nesbitt. I've been in front of you multiple times, and not because I've been in trouble. No. <laughs> but what I would like to say is, um, you know, I found, um, though it was intimidating the first time I came in front of the Board of Ethics, I found the relationship has, it, you, uh, the Board has been very open and willing to proactively work with Assembly members. And I found, for me, that's the reason I right away said I didn't want confidentiality because I thought others might learn from the situation that I'm in or uh, from a question that I'm asking, you know, potentially, you know, obviously being married to a city worker or maybe engaging in campaign activity. I thought, well, other assembly members or elected officials um, could learn from it. And I found the conversations at the Board of Ethics have always been interesting and very in-depth, incredibly. When you said the opinions are divor diverse, you are not kidding. They're very diverse, and every word is parsed, every discussion. So um, from my perspective, I've always had a very positive um, interaction, and I know the opinions that come out are very, very thoughtful. And um, I just appreciate all the hard work, because like you said, they're supposed to meet once a month, and 26 meetings in a year. Um, it's, it's pretty substantial, and they're not hour-long meetings. They're very in-depth and intense at times. So I just want to say thank you for your service and, and the quality of work that's coming out has been impressive. Thank you. And just as a follow-up note, too, we've really enjoyed our, our increased role working with the Assembly. We, in, in response to that, we've really enjoyed our interactions with the Assembly and, and trying to work as a team to get to a common goal. Thank you. We've got a few more comments. Mr. Flynn? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> in the small world category, my wife's cousin is Steve Higgins, who's Jimmy Fallon's sidekick. So I assure you, this is not Jimmy <laughs> Fallon. <laughs> small uh, world. Uh, David, thank you. It's been a long time. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll just volunteer here. If you would like somebody to be the assembly liaison to the rewrite of the ethics code that the so appointed board is Glenn. working on, I'd be happy to take that on. Take it on. That would be a pleasure, Patrick. Thank you. Good to see you. Mr. Steele. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I'm basically just piling on in terms of uh, uh, I've been to a number of your meetings, uh, and I've had, uh, I've had issues that I was concerned about that you've, uh, you've ruled on. And everybody on there, uh, all the members are uh, – are professional and uh, are really consider the issues. Um, you know, I kind of like banter, and you've got a few folks on that. It'll they'll say, "Well, wait a minute. If we look at it this way, or if it was this way." Uh, so the discussion is good, uh, good quality people, and the decisions are right on. So, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you for what you do. I've been to numerous meetings you've had, and you guys do a great job. So thank you very much for doing this. It's a pleasure. Take thank care, you. sir. We need a motion to approve that item. I thought to it was. Accept it. Second. Second. Ask unanimous. That item has been accepted. I did miss 9E2. I'm told that Mr. Holman pulled it. Information yeah. memorandum AIM 31 dash. 2016 code enforcement tow company compliance quarterly report Mo Mr. Move, Honeman. move to accept is there a second second move to second Mr. Honeman yes I, I wanted to uh, draw particular attention to my colleagues so first of all thank you to code enforcement and to our municipal clerk's office working jointly uh, this is to me uh, almost the entire time on this body as you know to Mr. Chair Mr. Vice Chair, the, uh, the, to my colleagues I don't know if you've noticed a rapid or a great decline in the number of call complaints for towing issues. This is a, a win. Uh, that's not to say it's perfect, so we may, um, and I challenge to my colleagues here uh, to pay attention and be alert that there may be some changes coming in the future, but uh, uh, this is a huge win. Um, we're getting compliance. We're getting uh, far, far uh, fewer, if any, complaints from people saying, I've got a six or seven or eight hundred dollar tow bill uh, when I went to the movie theater, or went to dinner with my spouse, uh, including people who visit from out of Alaska. That you know, their first experience is to get a, a several hundred dollar bill 
in the middle of the night when they go to stop off at a restaurant or a dinner uh, or, or such. So uh, I, I want to thank uh, Ms. Jones and, and Ms. Tucker for working through. This was a painstaking, deliberately long process, years in the making, and it's a win. And, and uh, uh, But don't be complacent, please. It, it probably will be right for some changes going forward. Thank you. Mr. Honeman, just that we worked on this and that we got it done. When you think about it, the clerk's office did a remarkable job. Code enforcement is doing a great job. When I take a look at follow-up on here, do you see we've got two people that were towing that didn't have a license? Yes. Now they do. At one point in time, we had people that were 90 days out of having a license, yet they were still towing. So I appreciate the effort the clerk's office put into this. Can't thank them enough. And code enforcement because they are making sure that this law is being followed. And you're right, Paul. The amount of calls we're getting now is nothing compared to what it was. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Tucker and her office. Thank you. Commissioner, anything else from the Assembly? Any objection to accept of this item? Seeing no objection, that item is accepted by the body. We're now down. That now finishes our consent agenda. Madam Clerk, we agree? Okay. So let's take our really scheduled dinner break. We should be back in about 20 minutes.
Everybody will take a seat, please. We'll get this meeting restarted. We've got six or seven members in chamber and the clerk. And the most important person here is the clerk. So the next item in front of us, item 13A, Ordinance AO 2015-142, Ordinance of the Executive Assembly, amending Executive Code Title 21, provisions regarding telecommunication facilities, including cell towers. Mr. Chairman. This item is not ready for public hearing yet because we're waiting for PNZ to get back to us. So, Mr. Flynn, would you make a motion on well, this item? Well, Mr. Chairman, I know we have to open the public hearing, but I think it'd just be fair to notify the folks who might be here to testify that we do intend to hold it over and do not intend to act on it tonight. So they might be best served to hold their comments Wait. until we... Uh, Planning and Zoning Commission's comments on this so that they can be incorporated and everyone can look at the final version. And if I open the public hearing this item, anybody wish to testify, please come forward. Anyone at all? Hearing and saying no one, public testimony is closed. What's wish the body? Mr. Flynn. Um, Mr. Chairman, I wasn't clear. Move, I'm not going to close it. Let's just move to continue. Yeah, do we want to continue to the 26th to the or the 12th? Or does it, do we Let's do the 26th because I don't have any faith right now that they'll get it to us on time. Okay. So I was told that they want to have more public hearing. Sure. So I'll make a motion, Mr. Chairman, to continue the public hearing to the meeting of April 26th. I'll second it. April 26th. Any objections from the body? Not seeing any, Madam Clerk. So ordered by this. I mean. Next time in front of us is item 14A. Is the new public hearing. Ordinance AO 2016-36, an ordinance amending Title 23 to address plumbing permits for the replacement of water heaters, fire protection for floors, and responsibility for payment of charges for fire protection service outside service protection service outside service areas. Public hearing this item now is now open. Anybody wish to testify? Please come forward. State Jim Kirk for the record. Spell your last name. You'll have three minutes. Welcome to the meeting, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gary Heil, H I L E, and uh, I live in West Anchorage. I'm here to speak uh, specifically in opposition to the current language exempting permits for water heater replacement. Uh, although I'm representing myself uh, as a concerned citizen, having over 40 years experience in the plumbing industry, I'm also a certified plumbing and mechanical inspector, having worked for the MOA for the last 23 years. Over those years, I've inspected thousands of water heater and gas appliance installations. And of those inspections, I've written numerous code violations for improper installation, including those installed by licensed um, contractors. Just because your license doesn't mean you always do it right. Gas appliances are extremely safe if, ins if installed properly, but can be extremely dangerous if they are not. I'd like to share a story of an inspection I performed on a water heater several years ago. Uh, I recall it's a dark winter's morning at a residence in Lake Otis in 80th area uh, of town. I rang the doorbell to be greeted by an elderly man, but I was also greeted by an unmistakable smell of mercaptan, which is the additive used to obtain the rotten egg smell and natural gas, since natural gas is odorless without the additive. I asked the homeowner if he could smell the gas, and he replied by saying no. I'm guessing his olfactory had adjusted to the smell. I immediately went to the mechanical room, which was shared with the laundry equipment. Within a few feet of entering the room, I could hear a hiss. I was quickly able to identify a leak in the appliance connector serving the water heater, and I swiftly closed the, the valve. Uh, I suggested the homeowner that we open the doors and windows, step outside for a bit to let the house air out. It was obvious the homeowner had not heard the leak, and I'm not certain how long it had been leaking, but presumably since the heater was replaced, which was the previous day. I've often wondered what would have happened had I not performed an inspection that day. This story may have ended differently with two less citizens in our community. I've heard many times in my life that if a law, requirement, rule, or action saved just one life, the cost, time, and labor associated would be worth it. I truly believe that I saved two lives that day and that the cost and time associated with the requirement for a permanent inspection was indeed well worth it. This is just one of many examples over the years that I believe may have saved lives due to the requirement for permits and inspections. There's a lot more to replacing a water heater than connecting the water, gas, and vent. When a water heater is placed, it's required to be installed per current code. There could have been six or seven code cycles since the replaced water was uh, heater was installed, resulting in new installation requirements that a homeowner would most likely not be aware of. There are several considerations that need to be taken into account 
when replacing a water heater, such as clearance to combustibles, combust uh, combustion air, seismic straps, proper termination of the relief valve, uh, drain pans, dielectric unions, expansion tanks, vacuum reliefs, etc. Additionally, mobile homes require water heaters specifically approved for the use. These heaters are built to different standards to give a higher level of safety. They are more expensive than a standard water heater, so it's not uncommon for a mobile home owner to install a less expensive heater, even though it's not approved for the use and could be cause of a fire. Another concern I have. Sir, your time is up, sir. Okay. May I just uh, close then? Go ahead, sir. Uh, lastly, the amendment will be a, uh, cause a conflict with the current plumbing code. Section 5031 of the code states that it shall be unlawful for a person to install, remove, or replace, or cause to be installed, removed, or replace a water heater without first obtaining a permit from the authority having the jurisdiction. And in closing, I urge you, as our city's decision makers, to not exempt permits inspection for water heater replacements and to look after the best interests of your constituents by helping to ensure their safety and those of their families and loved ones. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Gray Jackson, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you, Gary. Thank you for your testimony. I really appreciate hearing it. Um, do you realize that the ordinance that's before us um, exempts only electric water heaters? I am aware that that's going to be the proposed language, and you know, I guess it's the lesser of two evils. I, you know, that I could, I could live with that. I mean, the, the, you know, the, there there aren't a lot of electric water heaters out there anymore, to be honest. And uh, of those, um, you know, without having the gas, et cetera, that does take out a lot of the uh, potential problems. Okay, thank you. Thank yes, you. Mr. Thank you. Good. No other questions. Thank you, sir. Welcome, sir. Don McCann, MCCANN. I'm owner operator of McCann Plumbing and Heating. I'm also a mechanical administrator, and I've been in the trade for 45 years here in Anchorage. And I've seen so many installations that are not to code, and it's a health safety issue. Like I, I stated before, I, it, this was not presented to the to the uh, uh, building uh, code review board. And I was really uh, surprised at that because I'm a member of that. And when uh, Mr. Starr had made the statement that it was uh, to install a water heater was plug and play, I, in the last 45 years, I don't know of any plug and play water heater because I've installed uh, uh, many over the years, commercial and residential. But now I'm, I'm understanding that this, this is going to go just what we're talking about tonight is just electric water heaters? Just electric water heaters. This will, this will maintain the gas-fired water heaters. Have to be installed by a licensed individual with a permit. With a permit. That, that, that's where we're at at this time. So you're eliminating it. Oh, elect, so I understand this. An electric water heater will be exempt from a permit and or a, a licensed uh, person to install it? You don't have to be licensed to install electric, no. Okay. That's all I need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Starr? Hey, as a mechanical inspector, what's the what's the requirement to, I know the requirement, but what's the logic in inspecting a licensed uh, plumbing contractor or a license? Why is it necessary if they're certificated, licensed, skilled and trained, advertise themselves as licensed, bonded, insured? Uh, why go back and inspect their work? I'm a, a licensed a mechanical administrator. I yep. I'm, I'm, you'd have to ask Mr. Mr. Heil for the direct uh, answer to that. Well, as a mechanical inspector, you go back and you also oversee the inspection of, of uh, installed equipment by licensed plumbers and contractors thereof. That's that's what a mechanical. Your question was, sir. You're a mechanical inspector. You do that. You go back and check the work of licensed contractors. Correct? Yes. Right. And what's the reason for that? Yeah. It's to make sure that it was installed correctly. Mm -hmm. And at, for the, the cost that after January or uh, April 1st is going to go down to $75, that's the best insurance a person could have, a sec uh, 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 an unbiased opinion of something. that uh, When a person installs something, they may have missed something, possibly. Yeah, I can see the, the as I kind of consigned on with the mayor's change to uh, an individual that wasn't qualified, I concede that. but. Is the industry really that dangerous that we, we need to provide additional oversight to licensed contractors? In the last 45 years, the uh, dynamics of the units have changed so much that the installation of them is, is required, uh, has changed, and the, the uh, application for clearances and everything are there. 
that we have to look at. And, and a lot of times people will buy this stuff at the big box stores and they don't know, they don't have a clue on how it's installed. The individuals certainly, the, the licensed yeah. folks should know better though, is that yes, sir. what you say? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. No other questions. Welcome to the meeting, sir. Yeah, my name is Larry Lorenzo, the owner of Lorenzo Enterprises. Uh, plumbing company for 31 years in Anchorage. Uh, and I'm kind of unique in the fact that my company installs for all of the box stores in Anchorage, all three of the Home Depots, all three of the Lowe's, and Sears. So we install literally hundreds of water heaters a year. And I pull a permit on every one of them water heaters, and I'm very happy to do so. And Mr. Starr, I'd like to answer that question that I think you were trying to get a, maybe I could give you a better answer. When I first started 31 years ago, I hated the idea that I had to pull a permit. It seemed redundant. I was licensed. I was required to have six licenses in the municipality of Anchorage to put in a water. It seemed pretty stupid to me. If I was licensed, why would I have to have somebody come out and inspect water heaters? Well, I was young then, a little stupid. As I started installing all these water heaters and seeing how badly they were installed out there, and how much liability there was, I started to realize that, you know, I don't know everything and I can make a mistake when I install a water heater. And a mistake that I might make, like maybe forgetting to tighten up that gas line or hooking up that flue correctly, or maybe a water heater manufacturer changed something, or maybe there was a new code that came down that, that helped to, de to help that safety and thing. If I wasn't, uh, up on it, the one thing that kept me up on it was the fact that I had to pull a permit. And when I pulled that permit, a city inspector, like Gary, who has inspected many of my water heaters that I have installed, he has actually gone out in the past and had to call me up and say, Larry, you didn't realize or you didn't do this correctly, you got to go back out and fix it. Believe me, that's happened, even to a licensed plumber with all the licenses that I'm required to have. So I'm glad to hear that you guys are keeping the permits for the water heaters. I'm burdened with pulling those permits every day, hundreds of them, and I'm happy to do it because when that city inspector goes out and he looks at my water heater and he looks at that installation and then he stamps approved on that permit, that lessens my liability out there and that's why I'm happy to have it. So thank you for letting me speak. But I think it's, it's a good thing that you've done what you've done and we're gonna be pulling those permits on those water heaters. Does that help? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome to the meeting, sir. My name is Troy Bloxham, B-L-O-X-O-M. I'm a licensed home inspector in the state of Alaska. I am licensed to be able to inspect homes as they're constructed. So, you know, doing all the, the progress inspections through the mechanical, plumbing, electrical, all that stuff, as well as doing existing homes. Last year I did over 500 houses in the local area. And I have to say that at least 20 to 25% of the water heaters that I look at are, are improperly done. Whether it's, it's electrical uh, water heater or a gas fired, oil fired, um, a, a, a sidearm water heater that would be fueled by the boiler. There's, there are issues with every one of them. Um, the, the flue connectors uh, for a gas-fired one, they've changed the sizing requirement on many of them. Now, if it's over 50,000 BTUs, it needs to be five inch. At one point in time, four inch was legal. Does it make it safe? Well, I don't know. If they don't change it out, they don't know. And then there are no real instructions that say it has to be this. Um, I firmly believe that an electrical water heater should also have a permit because there's an electrical connection. And if you don't get that right, there's an arcing event and a chance of a fire. I'm certainly one to believe that we should all be able to do anything we want to to our own houses, but you ought to do it smart. And there are too many deaths from multiple issues, I, and not just this. I, I look at you know egress windows and everything in a house. It's it's uh, it's scary to me how many things that that can can go wrong, and it's only by pure ignorance that these things happen. It's unfortunate, and it should. Thank you. Thank you. No questions, sir. Welcome to the meeting, sir. My name is Patrick Nolan, and I'm, uh, I'm employed by Instar Natural Gas Company. However, I'm not a spokesperson for them. I'm just a citizen. I've been employed by Instar for 40 years. I've been out in the field for 35 years uh, installing gas meters and doing inspections. 
And Mr. Starr, you asked a question about um, having to have a permit and having a licensed plumber. It's the same thing with a physician and malpractice insurance or being a, or a, a lawyer and making a mistake and having malpractice insurance. So what it is, it's just redundancy for safety for our public. That's what the whole situation's about. Codes originated 90 years ago, 1926 in Los Angeles, where people got together and they started seeing how plumbing was put together and they came up with the ideas of having a plumbing code. Now, I was a little cough, cough, off guard when you started talking about electric water heaters. My expertise is gas water heaters. But when you're dealing with electric water heater, you have to keep one thing in mind. It's operated off of 240 volts. It's got a heat uh, uh, sensor in it, two of them, and when they break down, you can have a short, you can have a electrical failure, you can have electrocution. So the idea of eliminating having a licensed plumber or having a city inspector come by and inspect the work that a homeowner has done, is, is it's not gonna be prudent for us to do that. For myself, I've seen dead people from carbon monoxide, but once again, we're not talking about gas water heaters, we're talking about codes and having them in place. So what I did is I brought a piece of aluminum foil to show you guys that I did a, a investigation with the police department of a 14-year-old girl that died. This was placed inside the oven. The stove wasn't installed to code. They didn't use the fan, the fan didn't exhaust outside. So when you're inside a residential house, stepping over a 14-year-old girl laying on the floor because somebody didn't follow codes. That's something for everybody to think about. There's a reason why we have laws and regulations and codes. And one of the things is to eliminate one product out of an equation, it's safety. Safety first. You err on the side of safety. Thank you very much for your time. Good no questions. Thank you, sir. Anybody else wish to testify on this item, please come forward. Anyone at all? Harry and say none. Pup testimony is closed. What's the wish of the body? I'll need a motion on 2016-36. Move to approve. Second. Second. Moved and seconded to approve. Discussion <laughs> from assembly members. Mr. Starr. No, I'm happy to, to make modifications much like we can at any given time on the building codes. <clears throat> Some of the conversation um, was inferred that, you know, we're pulling it fast or we're moving it too progressively. Um, there was there was several work sessions as we when we first moved the overall item last meeting. Um, I also sat down with the administration um, several weeks out and chatted with them about um, the proposals uh, to to move it. I'm still uh, this is a compromise for me. I don't I don't beg to say that that I want to protect every homeowner from himself. I don't want to delve into where people feel they're skilled to do work where they need to save money. Um, that's strictly the responsibility of a homeowner to protect their family. When government gets involved, um, it sounds great that we're going to send somebody over there from the city and inspect, but the city does not assume any liability when they do that. So, you know, is that inspector good? Yeah, I hope we hired great people to do good work. I hope they stay up on technology. But in, in some a applications, to me, it's like doing your own brakes on your car. There's no laws that we have against that, against your ability to jack that thing up and follow the guidelines that you may see on YouTube or you may see from the parts supplier. Um, when I say plug and play, the concepts are that they're, they're, they're pretty easy install items if you know what you're doing, if you're relatively handy. And certainly those folks that install them for a living are very good at it. They see a tremendous amount of challenge um, with older construction modified to new construction all the above, but it's, it's strictly to, to allow that homeowner to say, hey, I'm skilled to do this. My dad was a plumber. I've got a plumber friend that's gonna come over and do it. Um, I don't think that, that they wouldn't pass inspection, but the, the number of folks that are probably doing it without a permit um, was the other motivation for me, is just, just let them have a buy. Let, let our building folks and building inspectors do something that's significantly more important uh, than oversighting um, that. So. Uh, that the fire service correction inside here does make sense. It, it interjects the um, the fire chief uh, into the conversation about when and, and how to charge. Um, I'm I'm fine with the, with the three areas of change. So um, that's why I signed on as a sponsor to to move that uh, along. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Mr. Honeman. Yes, and I want to make clear that we we are moving the S version, correct? Okay, that's 
Yes, I do. Okay. And then, uh, and I agree. Mr. Starr uh, hit the nail on the head. There are some certainly issues that I'd uh, uh, looked at the rewrite of 2023. Mr. Starr had made many amendments. And uh, listening to the administration of the past, I, I appreciate our last meeting's conversation, and I'm glad that we got the new ordinance that makes it clear. Thank you. Any other comments from assembly members? Mr. Steele. Yeah, I just want to uh, um, thank the, the guys that came out and testified. Uh, uh, it is cheap insurance, and uh, if you sleep a little bit better because you had a second set of eyes on something, um, that's good money spent as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Ms. Dombowski, okay. ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I was th contemplating moving an amendment, but I've already uh, pretty much read the tea leaves, and I know how it'll how it'll end up. So I'm not going to, but I am going to speak. Um, I, I'm not going to be supporting this ordinance, and specifically, I want to talk about fire protection and floors. You know, um, I supported Title 23 as it was passed at the last meeting. I think there was a lot of time and effort that went into it. With that said, the narrative has become that if all of a sudden we don't start. Um, drywalling unfinished basements all of a sudden firemen all over town are going to die i think when we start saying firemen are going to die and the building official is the one who's saying it i think it's irresponsible frankly we have um, had we've had building codes we've um, that people follow builders follow we have inspectors that are very competent that do their job and we have firemen who i have yet to have one example of a fireman who has died because he fell through a floor of an unfinished basement um, the fact of the matter is it, it doesn't exist in the municipality of Anchorage. I think this one particular um, section, I think, is going to um, drive up the cost of construction. I think there's no data. There's no examples to mandate this additional cost. It's not just a cost to the home, it, home builder. You have to remember, it's not the builder who's ultimately paying for it. It's the consumer. So we talk about housing shortages in Anchorage and the cost of construction and how it expensive it is. But we take rules and regulations like this and we arbitrarily add things to them. Uh, you know, you'll get a great talking point from a building official or a planner, but they've never picked up a hammer and actually built a house. And I challenge you that if you're going to make these rules and laws, go out, spend a week with somebody who does building and actually learn it from the inside. Because I'm not an, ex I'm not an expert, I can tell you that but I have helped build a couple of houses and a, ca and a cabin. And so I've learned enough to just be dangerous. And I can tell you this, this portion right here, I think is completely unnecessary. Um, but with that said, you know, I supported the previous version of AO 23. Obviously um, some, you know, are, are trying to find a mediated solution and I applaud them for that. Um, but at the same time, I, I supported what was passed. I can't support this. Thank you, ma'am. No other assembly comments, please vote. Yes will approve or no will not. That is approved 10 to 1. Next item in front of us is item 14B, resolution 2016-54, a resolution approving letter agreement, APDA 2016-54. Dash one LOA between the municipality of Anchorage, Alaska, and the Anchorage Police Department Employee Association (APDA) regarding certain wage calculations. From Public Relations Department, public hearing this item is now open. If anybody wishes to testify, please come forward. Shake your name, for the record, spell your last name. Anyone at all? Hearing and saying no one, public testimony is closed. Must wish the body. Moved to approve. Discussion, Mr. Starr. Well, I've been studying this, and if you look at the first, well, the second line, you're, you're amending an article to extend a pay enhancement to a new group. And to infer that there's not going to be a cost associated with that seems to be um, stretching things a little bit. And the reason I bring that up is letters of agreement, letters of, of compromise are for clarity only. They're not allowed to change the overall value of a pre-negotiated labor agreement. The only way you do that is you get to open up the, the item and you bring it forward. So I, I guess I'd like to know 
through the administration or the labor negotiators, why extending, and this, there's three classes we're doing this with, why extending the 5.5 pay enhancement doesn't have a burden of cost to the municipality. It's, it, we're extending a benefit that was negotiated after the contract was signed. Administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Starr, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Peters from the Employee Relations Department to come forward, and you can bring whoever you need to, Chris. Municipality of Anchorage employee? Or a uh, union? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, didn't, I don't know him. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. And uh, thank you, Mr. Trainee. Uh, Chris Peters, Employee Relations, and I was one of the ones involved with this letter of agreement. Um, the reason there is no initial cost right now, there's only two polygraphers working in the Anchorage Police Department. Both of those people were being paid as part of a grievance resolution from 2009. What this does is makes it equal and fair for everybody moving forward if the department ends up hiring somebody in the future. It only gives them 5.5% when they're acting in that position, very similar to other investigative positions that are doing additional duties beyond what their normal assignment is. So is this an, an effort to solve a grievance? No, the grievance was already in effect. What this is doing is putting it in place moving forward so we don't have future grievances. By extending the benefit to future employees? Only to that particular group, which is the polygraphers. Which the, will have a cost to the city? It potentially could if they hire any additional polygraphers in the future. Why wouldn't we open up the labor negotiations and negotiate that point? I don't have a direct answer to that. Again, you, the, the, the code specifies that a letter of agreement is for clarity purposes only. It, it doesn't allow you to negotiate through this mechanism for assembly approval. And that's, that's my point. So whether I win on that point or not, uh, is there, but but code specific to this purpose says that those are part of labor negotiations and not used for a letter of agreement. Okay. Mr. So, Chairman, uh, maybe Mr. Falsey could weigh in on this. Mr. Falsey, sir. Yeah, and I would say through the chair, Assemblyman Starr is right. There is a bit of a breakdown in our nomenclature here. Since 2008, there have been three types of instruments defined in the code, letters of agreement, which should not have any financial consequences and don't require any kind of public hearing administrative agreements, which can amend the terms of a CBA and which can have financial consequences and which are supposed to be dealt with by the assembly in the manner it deals with ordinances and do require a public hearing, and then the CBAs themselves. Mm -hmm. Arguably, this item should not have been labeled in letter of agreement, but it was treated as an administrative agreement under the code because it was noticed and it is receiving the public hearing. So. Uh, we have actually advised our folks to start using the nomenclature that is adopted by the assembly in 2008, but this uh, is a administrative agreement in all but the name letter of agreement as it appeared. It came to us already with the title letter of agreement. Yeah, Star? and I, I kind of fall, and thank you for that. I don't need to debate with you or thank whatever you. I just did there, but I, I wanted to put that out there because it's sort of a slippery slope as we move into items throughout this, and I hope it's not regular. I want to treat everybody fairly, and particularly if a negotiation item that ended up in a CBA isn't clear, I want to make sure we provide that clarity in what the assembly said when we approved the collective bargaining agreement. But I don't want to start using these mechanisms as an as a end run for legitimately opening up a labor contract when there's an item that's negotiated, whether it be for two people or five people or whatever, but um, because the, the sheer, I'll put it bluntly, the sheer power of some negotiation teams is much better than others. I remember, Mr. Honeman remembers where we had to kind of defend the folks that mowed our grass uh, up here. We, we, we looked at their portion wording and collective bargaining agreements um, and, and spent a lot of time making sure that, that the appropriate language was signed off in the CBA. So uh, it's a little bit of a pontification up here, but, and you've already conceded you, you won't do it again, but I don't want other items with, with CBA implications to be opened up under any manner. I mean, that's, that's why we go to labor negotiations and that why we honor, that's why we honor the contract after we sign it. So we gotta wait for three years. It comes back in three years and oh, oh well. But I, I, I adamant about it, the letter of agreement, as you put it in here, is, is not the appropriate mechanism. 
Um, have we done a public hearing? Yeah. I don't think people understood it. I think it seemed like it was just a formality and a clarity in definition, and that's not what's happening. We're spending money. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Honeman. Case you're in front of us. Well, that, I think most of it's been answered. Uh, I just wanted to make clear that we're talking about two individuals, and the money's already being paid, as I understand it, out of the budget. So there isn't an increase uh, anticipated in the budget. It's already being, they're already being paid as a result of a past settled agreements. Uh, so this would be as if, in fact, uh, there was any plans to increase the numbers and then there might be an increase in the budget. So at that point, I think that would be the discussion to the assembly, how much money would be ne needed to that. I understand your, your point, Mr. Starr, and I'm trying to go through right now. So I was looking three three point seven zero one thirty, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to get to the nuance of what, I know we had some, conversation about this and what we were trying to get at the point is um, that there not be side letters that don't that settle an issue before they come to the assembly that they can have that discussion all they want but before it gets approved and money is spent that it comes before the body and I think they need that spirit but I'm not sure if, if what I'm reading here is specific Mr. Falsey I, I don't know if that's under 3.70 uh, Mr. Falls, you're, let, you're next on my list, so do you want to answer his question? Yeah, 3.70130 on labor, on agreements, particularly the, uh, I, I guess you'd say, sections B through D. Um, I, I think that the, that your agreement meets the spirit. Am I wrong? Is it is it in? Am I missing something here? I, I don't know. Mr. Starman had a point, and I, and I don't want to mitigate that at all. Through the chair, I, I think we're having a discussion about form rather than about the substance. As I'm tracking the question, it refers to the municipal code provision 37130. That is where the three-part distinction is set up between the labor agreements, administrative agreements, and the administrative letters. The uh, those letters agreement that have no financial consequences are approved in one manner. Those which may have financial consequences are approved in another manner. The ordinance or the resolution before the body now is being handled by the body in the manner in which a agreement which can have financial consequences is handled. So whether it was correctly called a letter of agreement or an administrative agreement, it's sort of six of one, half a dozen of the other, because the more extraordinary process is the process that's being used now. Mr. Toneman, anything else? That's it. Thank you. Um, let's see, Mr. Falls, you your comments before I move to the next assembly member? Thank you, sir. Ms. Dombowski, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Falsey, for absolute clarity. I hear what you're saying about the spirit of the code. I'm not concerned about the spirit, but the actual code. So can you tell me, the, a letter of agreement that we have before us, um, it's not being called an administrative agreement. It's a letter of agreement, and that's the actual, not just the ordinance, the actual letter of agreement. So are you telling me as a municipal attorney, it is your advice to the assembly that this letter of agreement, though it has financial consequences or could, can be acted on in compliance with code. The chair, yes. Anything else, ma'am? Okay. Mr. Starr, anything else, sir? Well, you know, I can bring up history if we needed to here, but it, it isn't necessary. There are several aspects that come into this that you need to be cognizant of. First, it's a precedent-setting event, and it is spelled out. Mr. Honeman, I spent a lot of time on 70.130. Uh, we, we all have in, in past, and it does on subsection E, prohibits the use of administrative letters to vary the explicit terms of a labor agreement, in this case, expanding a benefit to several other groups, not just the polygraphers, but uh, task investigators are also included in that. I don't know how many folks are there, but what it also does is it allows the administration to meet with labor uh, and start to work on these issues without notifying us and telling us that there is a problem. So in essence, it's a mechanism, if, if in fact we're not going to use the letter of agreement term, then it's a mechanism that allows the administration to open up collective bargaining in a manner that wouldn't be necessarily appropriate or in compliance with the code language that talks about that. And I'm not trying to talk like a lawyer because Mr. Falsey does a good job with that, but the principle and the policy setting for that is you're going to have a formality to opening up a collective bargaining agreement for whatever term. If it's dog handlers or if it's uh, some of the other folks that, that, that feel that they didn't get quite represented in there, I think it's a formal saying, hey, we're going to sit down, we're going to reopen this selective item. And it may be simple, it may be polygraphers in the, in the future, uh, task force investigators, 
are included in this in this capacity. But I think we want to make sure that we set some formality to it, and that's what we what we dragged through the mud when we did 70.130 was so that you didn't end up with side letter agreements uh, in, in that whole report. There was 130 of them that occurred through basic conversations between labor and the administration. I'm happy that we're included in this conversation, but we weren't included in the conversation that resulted in opening this to begin with. And that's where I find uh, the, the danger for it. And, and you may say, well, it's much hay about nothing, but add some more substantial items. Or how many task force investigators are we talking about, Mr. Honum? Is there 18 of them now? Two polygraphers under a grievance with future hiring. How many task force investigators are we talking about? and what's the financial ramifications of 5.5% on their already regular pay. So, you know, I, I'm certainly we could bring it back as something other than that, but I still have the same point of merit, saying that the collective bargaining agreement should have been renegotiated and brought forth in, in a manner thereof. And, uh, and that includes notifying the assembly that you've opened it, 30 days notice on either side, all the stuff that goes into normal. I want to get that part of it right, because CBAs are expensive in this community. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Mr. Flynn, then Ms. Johnston. Mr. Flynn, sir. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, obviously you can't change the title of an ordin of a resolution or an ordinance. No. Uh, but um, given Mr. Falsey's comments, I, I, I'd be open to making the motion to change the vernacular within the context of the, the, context of, of the um, resolution and the attached um, letter of agreement to spell out as an administrative agreement if that would satisfy some of the concerns of my colleagues but I'm not going to make the motion if it doesn't solve the over, overall concern and I'll leave it at that for, for thought. Thank you. Ms. Johnston, ma'am. Well, actually, I'd be interested in what motion you'd be willing to do. I, I was about to say that I, I, I'm afraid both Mr. Starr and I are are going from memories where this was a, a huge issue, and I would be inclined to be voting with Mr. Starr just from past history versus maybe how we could go forward. So I'm interested in your amendment. Well, then I'll just Mr. Flynn. I'll just spell it out. Um, wherever letter of agreement appears in other than the title. In, other than the title in this resolution, in the attached memorandum, and the attached letter of agreement be replaced by the term administrative agreement so that we're consistent with uh, 7130. I'll, sec I'll second that. Administration, Mr. Falsky. Is uh, there a the problem with what they're recommending? Through the chair, I'm looking at that in real time. I don't know that that would necessarily pose a problem. An alternative solution might be to add an additional whereas clause that says, though the agreement presented to the assembly was titled letter of agreement, it was treated as an administrative agreement under the code. Um, that would avoid any confusion about referencing the document, which is itself titled a letter of agreement. Well, is, I mean, if, if, we, if, if, if we approve the amendment, it's going to require employee relations and APDA to come back and sign a different document that says administrative agreement at the top of it, because um, this one will no longer be valid, but we will have treated it in the manner uh, that the code requires. So I, I don't, I don't, I cannot foresee an issue with that going, being effectively executed. Um, but I didn't want to make assumptions that may have been out of place. Mr. Halsey? I'm not sure I'm completely comfortable with that approach because that would leave you with a section one which reads that the administrative agreement attached as Exhibit A is approved, but that agreement would not yet exist and so couldn't be as attached to Exhibit A. That, there might just have to be some wordsmithing saying that the Assembly prospectively approves the letter of agreement when it is amended to read administrative agreement, which is, I suppose, a possibility. How about if we just delay action this item for an hour or two? And that way we can come back and get, after we take a look, a hard look at it. Mr. Chairman, if I could get a the Def Star. If also in the meantime, a definition um, in code. I don't know that there's administrative agreement that's spelled out in code. Administrative letter certainly is. So if there would be a way to print out the administrative letter definition that you're that you're doing, and then I think there's limitations on what the administrative letter can be used for. 
but uh, I don't know that there's such a thing called an administrative agreement in code. It, it, it is, Mr. Starr. Is there? Yeah. Mr. Halsey, a couple of hours. Can you take team. the time and come back to us with language that works for you guys and works for us? Certainly happy to do that. I get a motion to. Uh, uh, let's move to postpone until later in the meeting. Later in the evening. Is there a second? Second. Ask unanimous. See no objection. This item will come back and back up in front of us. Next time in front of us is item 14C, Ordinance 2016-20, an ordinance of the Anchorage, uh, sorry, an ordinance determining and approving total amount of the annual operating budget of the Anchorage School District for its fiscal year 2016-2017, and determining and appropriating the portion of the assembly approved budget amount to be made available from local resources, local sources. Public hearing this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify? Mr. Chairman, Before prior to starting, starting, could you provide and some? I've got to, I've got to step out and let the vice chair. No, I understand that. Could you provide some clarity on that, or maybe the administration? My understanding is we were supposed to have two public hearings uh, on this. Is it, is it only one on the city on the school district budget? And then there's a 30-day rule. Okay. And if 30 days after it's submitted, it, it is not acted on by the assembly, then it becomes automatically. So it's, it's only one public hearing requirement for the yeah. school district budget. She looked up for us. Thank you. Ms. Gray Jackson, I've got to turn the chair over to you. <laughs> Mr. Training. Madam Chair, I have to start a potential conflict of interest on this I have a wife who is a school uh, teacher. As I have to do every year, I declare I've got a potential for conflict. It's up to the chair to determine and the body to determine whether I've got a, got a conflict or not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as in the past years, the chair rules that you do not have a conflict, and we would appreciate your vote on the school district budget. Okay. Can I ask a clarifying question? Because this may come about. Ms. Dembowski's had the same thing. And, and this isn't to really put that to, to case, but in future budgets, it may be required that we that we make changes that reduce personnel. Mr. Traney, if your wife was included in the category of people that were being terminated or cut in the budget, would you be able to judge uh, that, that in a fair and impartial way? I'd make her happier if she was. <laughs> No, I don't appreciate the the severity because I, I don't want anybody to lose their job naturally. But in, in that scenario, I would ask Ms. Dembowski if it was a fireman's contract. But would you have would you have a problem judging that uh, that cut impartially, Mr. Trainee? No, I would not have a problem at all. If, like I said, even if it was your wife, even if it was my wife, we've had that discussion. She'd be happy to retire. <laughs> Uh, okay, the argument is now, right now, is why she hasn't retired yet. Yeah. Well, the severity of the conversation is is that we have allowed you uh, to be um, included in the conversation because you do bring a certain sense of wisdom to them. But typically, they, they've not been uh, too too cumbersome. But the future budgets may, in fact, have uh, a, a bigger serious That's an impact. That's point, but we haven't got to that point yet. But okay. Thank you. We've had the discussion. Fourteen C Ordinance Hill twenty sixteen dash twenty ordinance determining and approving the total amount of the annual operating budget of the Anchorage School District for its fiscal year twenty sixteen twenty seventeen and determining and appropriating the portion of the assembly approved budget amount to be made available from local sources. Public hearing on this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify, please come forward. Jason M. Curdy for the record and spell your last name and we'd like to know what part of town you live in. It's a requirement to let us know. You've got three minutes. Wow. Thank you, Chairman Trainee, Assembly Members, Ed Graff, Anchorage School District Superintendent, GRAFF, and I live in the south area of Anchorage. Um, just want to say thank you to the Assembly. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the 2016-17 budget um, at a joint Assembly meeting last Friday. I know that through that conversation there were a, a series of questions that were presented to uh, the school district, and we provided follow-up 
to those questions or responses through the clerk this afternoon. Um, one of which I know um, is still probably an ongoing question. I'd like to address that before open it up to others. But it had to do with uh, a graph that we had in our budget presentation. Um, specifically, it isn't part of your packet. It's on page 20, I believe, of Appendix um, 1, the general fund staffing. In that little chart, it shows the number of uh, reductions or changes that we've had in our full-time equivalent since the 2012-13 school year. And starting at the top um, in the aqua color, it's a 22 and 29 tenths of a percent um, or hundreds of a percent decre decrease. Um, and so if you look at the bottom of that graph, you'll see that it has the full-time equivalent positions um, in rough order, 250, 500, 750, and so on. So I'll just, through simple math, I'll give you what those percentages are. So in the aqua, it's about a reduction of 78 FTE. In the orange color, it's a reduction of 10 FTE. In the goldenrod, it's 62 FTE. In the tan color, it's 120 FTE. And then in the direct classroom instruction, it's a reduction of 9 FTE. And again, those are rough estimates, um, but that information is also found in page 20 appendices, uh, appendix 1, and you can see that through the, the shaded colors um, for the general fund staffing. Um, so within this also, I would like to thank the assembly. Um, we're one of six municipal organizations that are, are the assembly here at Anchorage is one of six that supports funding of uh, public education or the school district to the cap. And we've had a great deal of support from our community and the assembly in the past and appreciate your consideration and approval of this budget as well. And I'm here with school board president, Mr. Perez Vadia, as well as um, chief financial officer, Mark Foster here to answer any questions you might have at any point. Thank you, Mr. Starr has a question. Mr. Starr? Okay, Ms. Johnson, do you have a question, ma'am? Thank you for giving me that information. Um, with those FPEs that you said you have cut, are they all actual filled positions at this point? Through the chair, uh, Ms. Johnson, they are not all actual filled positions. Uh, again, that goes back to 1213. And so many of those, I'm assuming you're referencing the chart that I just talked right. about. Those are past positions as well over the last several years. Um, so some of those in many cases were uh, vacant already and we captured the vacancies, but in others we um, eliminated the positions and in that process of retirement and um, resignations, you know, some people were able to transition out without uh, having to affect their, their employee group. Okay, thank you. Mr. Holman has a question. Mr. Holman? Yes, and, and this may be a question for Mr. Foster. You may need to get some help from him. But uh, can you, when, when it comes down to, and I remember, um, and I'm not sure if it's changed since our, our briefing on um, the joint meeting, 48 teaching positions, is that, is that correct? For, 49. 49. Um, can you, I, I guess, is in a simplest possible term, um, what would it take to keep those 49 positions and maybe perhaps some of the other additional support staff? Um, what would it take? I mean, is in the municipality and the taxpayers um, fund any more? And if, if the municipal taxpayers decided, yeah, we want those 48 positions to stay, what would the consequences be from school funding coming from the state? And you just kind of explain it best. Through, through the chair, Mr. Honeman, what we have, um, what we operate under is the BSA. So uh, an increase to our base student allocation would allow us to um, essentially not have to reduce in our, our teaching positions. Now, could that come from the municipality and its that, taxpayers? or That comes through the state. Okay. And then obviously the appropriations with the BSA through uh, the municipality, which as I mentioned earlier, the municipal uh, assembly has been very supportive of uh, allowing us to, to tax to the upper limit. Well, well if, if you don't mind so the public can know, what would that dollar amount BSA have to be increased to be able to keep these our current BSA, through the chair, our, our current BSA increase, um, or what's in statute, is $50, and that equates to $5 million for the Anchorage School District. So using that same math, if you have about 49 FTE, 49 teaching positions, um, 100,000 for each one, 
a $50 increase would equate to another $5 million. And, and, I, and I guess it goes back to the other question. Can the municipal taxpayers decide to, to do it on their own and, and pay the extra $5 million and what would the consequences be? Mr. Hildeman, the answer is no. There's a state law that says we can't. I, I'm we're trying at, to get out of the We're to the, the cap or where we can go as a city. I think you're going to hear from the public that that's what I'm trying to get at, Mr. Chairman, if you indulge me. Thank you. Can I help with that point, Mr. Chairman, before Mr. Go ahead, sir. State law is based on federal law, which calls on equity between school districts in the educational system and therefore prohibits um, school districts from, say, overfunding um, in a manner that would create inequities between disparities. Uh, and that's the, the basis of the state law, which, which limits the amount of contribution the municipality can make to the school district. So in essence, the, to the public, the state would have to increase BSA for all schools in the state equally so that we might benefit as a, our local community to keep from being losing these teaching staff. Through the chair, Mr. Honeman, with the current statute that exists, that is uh, the only way that we would be able to increase our um, our budget uh, and revenue is through the BSA. There was a change several years ago that impacted um, the municipality and actually reduced the opportunity for, for funding for our, our school district. Um, and it, it's similar to, I believe, the, the rationale that Mr. Flynn gave with the disparity or the equalization for those rural education um, groups that did not have a local taxing authority. Thank you. So, Mr. Holman, thank you. Ms. Dombowski, ma'am. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Graff, um, I have just a couple of questions just for, uh, just for clarity. The 49 teaching positions we're talking about, are those teaching positions, are those actual teaching bodies from classrooms, or where are those positions coming from? I know they're dispersed, but um, can you give me clarity? I, I don't want to, I want to talk about actual teachers, and I want to know if these 49 are coming straight out of the classroom. Are they second grade teachers? Where, where are they coming from? Through the chair, Ms. Dembowski, the way we've set up our um, reduction in this case, it would be specific to a, a classroom teacher. It would not be um, a teacher assistant. It would not be a, a support position. It would actually be a classroom. And so at the elementary level, it would be a grade level position. And the associated um, support staff of a specialist position that would come with that. Okay, so how many pink slips are you giving out? At this time, we have not determined the number of pink slips that will need to be given out. Um, when we look at our attrition over the last several years, uh, 49 positions, it seems like a reasonable number that we should be able to address through attrition. However, that is something that we have to, you know, wait and see as those numbers come in. So potentially with attrition, there may not be any teachers laid off. In terms of a, a layoff and an actual pink slip notice to a person, that is, that is possible. Um, and then my other question, and um, I didn't ask any questions at the work session because I was on the phone, so I just listened. But this one thing that I caught on, um, you were talking about an $11 million gap. Um, so I guess the disconnect that I have as I'm looking at your budget, there's only $6.282 million in, in um, cuts or reduction, but you were talking about an $11 million gap. So can you fill the gap for me and help me understand why if you're $11 million Shy, you're only cutting six. Sure, I'm going to ask Mr. Foster to come up and speak to that. But what I what I will tell you also is that we um, have gone through a process every year of taking a look at our projection and our enrollment, and so adjustments through that um, play a part in that discussion as well. And then I'll turn it over to Mr. Foster, and he can walk through. I'm sure the, te the teacher in you wants to say, Amy, that's a good question. <laughs> Ms. Dombowski, that's a great question. <laughs> Thanks. In summary, we developed the pro forma budget in October and November, and during those public conversations, we basically look at a revenue projection and an expense projection and identify the budget gap, in this case, approximately $11 million. After that process, we then update all of our projections on the expense and the revenue side again based on the information we have 
from actual information through the first semester of expenditures. And in the course of doing that, we make adjustments in those expense categories. In average teacher salary, in the number of teachers that are turning over and retiring and being replaced by newer, less expensive teachers because they're coming in lower in the salary scale, and changes in medical costs, which are volatile, and changes in heating costs, which have been down year over year as the temperature is rising, and that's a significant factor for us on the order of a million dollars. The combination of all of those reduced that gap essentially to the six million dollars that you're referencing. So the updated projections reduced the gap down to approximately six. So we started with 11 in the public conversation, and then when we came forward, we got to about six. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Ms. Domboski asked the same question about how many pink slips we're going to have to send out, so thanks. Any other questions from assembly members? Superintendent, thank you very much. Thank you. More questions. Welcome, sir. Good evening, la ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Bronson, B-R-O-N-S-O-N. I'm with the local National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. You can take my word for it. <clears throat> we would like to offer you a few things to think about before you approve the Assembly Ordinance 20. The ordinance will give the school district some $246 million from Anchorage property owners and bring the school district budget up to $770 million. Now, we're not opposed to the $200 we have no objections to the $246 million. We're not asking that it be increased or decreased. We're assuming that request on the part of the school district. And as background, please understand that NAACP amounts to big supporters of public schools, and we're proud of our school district's successes. We admire how it's protected classrooms over the last few years of budget trimming. However, we are a bit alarmed that the school district's budget is now stepping back from the challenge of raising student proficiency. First, please consider that tests show no overall improvements in reading and math for a long time. And recent tests now show that more than 60% of the students in the district don't meet the state's English language and math standards. Also consider that the state of Alaska ranks near the bottom among the 50 states in reading and math, and that Anchorage is close to the middle of the pack statewide. Consider that the school district is now miles away from meeting its goal of 90% proficiency by the year 2020. Talking to principals, administrators, and school board members, we've learned that the district has no overall plan for raising up the 30,000 kids here who are lagging behind English and math standards. Consider that the district's proposed budget will eliminate dozens of classroom teachers, raising the, the ratio of students to teachers, regardless of pink slips, and they will eliminate all the preschools. However, we think that the school district needs even more teachers and better trained teachers in order to raise our kids up. Now, with that in mind, we ask you not to approve a school budget that will continue low student performance. Instead, please send the school district's request back for revisions. Consider making the school board and the administrators more accountable for providing a bigger bang in student proficiency for the buck. Thank you. Ms. Johnson has a question, sir. Ms. Johnson? So, for eight or nine years, I've been trying to push shared services between the school district and the municipality. And so that would mean facilities, IT, um, HR, because I feel that the school district should be in the job of education. Would you support something like that, where, which might mean that, that there'd be some, we would get more efficient so there wouldn't be as many employees for plowing parking lots, um, janitorial, would, would, would you do that trade-off? We would be in support of efficiency, no doubt about that. 
What we're asking is that we send the budget temporarily as it might be back to the school board and the school administrators to make just those hard decisions to find additional trade-offs to preserve the teaching staff, just like you suggested. So even if it meant contracting out some of the services, you, in other words, your, your priority is teachers and education. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I read all of your documents that you sent to the assembly and I also listened to you when you did a presentation at the Budget Advisory Commission and I understand um, how you feel and, and, and I agree with you. My question is, during the public hearing process at the school district, did you have an opportunity to talk to them and, and what was the feedback? Yes, we did. We've been talking to the school district since uh, November and we've asked the school board and the administrators what plan they had to meet their own goals of 90% proficiency in the next four years. And we've talked to many principals in the meantime. And we've attended the community uh, feedback forums looking at the budget. We made recommendations, ma'am, to very similar to the rest of the public that ranked teaching and classroom protection highest on the list back in November and December as the public looked at the budget and we ranked, for example, bus transportation <clears throat> at the low end of the priority spectrum, if I recall correctly. And I think you'll find that report actually in the school district's paperwork to you, the results of that community feedback. So that's one reason we're a little disappointed when we read the budget and we see that the school district didn't really take the public's ranking very closely into, in, into account when we see that a million dollars will be shifted out of the general fund from which we pay teachers into the bus transportation fund. We're seeing a trade-off in this case that the school board is recommending of trading uh, bu buses for teachers. That's one example. So long, uh, to make a long story short, yes, we've been talking to the school district for the last four months. Thank you. If I can continue, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Um, we're we train a rock in a hard place, I'll just put it like that. Even if we had the ability and the body agreed to, to do what you're asking, <clears throat> the, the code says that once the school district gives the assembly the budget, you probably know this already, but I'm going to say it again anyway, um, we have 30 days to approve it. And if we don't approve it, that the budget that they presented is automatically approved. And I don't know what the exact dates are, but I know that um, if we don't approve the budget tonight, that we're going to run out of time unless there's a special meeting. And even if there's a special meeting, I'm not really sure what it is that we can do. And I, I just wanted to share my thoughts with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Other questions from some members? There don't appear to be any. Oh, sorry, Mr. Steele, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> How would you uh, how would you get the kids to school if you cut the buses? We're, we're asking the school district to take the budget back and, and look at it again. Within a seven hundred and seventy million dollar budget, it has some discretion to make some hard choices, and it has the, the backing of its staff to do that. What do you think about preschool as a measure to uh, help in the uh, accomplishment of the student goals? Let me, let me pass on, if that's all right with Reverend Green. Let me pass on what we learned. We've talked to 10 school principals in the last couple of months, and we've asked them, what would you do differently to raise up the proficiency of the kids that come to your classrooms unprepared? They come abused. Many of their families have never picked up a book in their lives. Many of them don't even speak English. And what many of these principals tell us is that the kids that enter kindergarten in their schools from a preschool program are so far ahead of others, are very, very well prepared. Unfortunately, the number of uh, students that are, have been in the preschools is pretty limited. But of those that have come into kindergarten, the principals invariably say these kids are much more prepared. Uh, the, the school district cut a number of preschool programs that they had in their normal elementary schools. And, uh, and it was kind of, they, they kind of had to do it because preschool is not a mandated requirement where uh, elementary school or, uh, or high school is. And so it's just a question of where do you put the money. Uh, also, they just changed, they, 
the state and the federal change the uh, uh, the mechanism by which you measure accomplishment and so it was a brand new measure this last time and you got to make sure when you look at the figures that you're looking at the Anchorage school district not the state of Alaska because there are differences and uh, it it uh, I, I don't question your motives at all. Um, and I think that the school district has your motives at heart. But um, there are limitations. There are state limitations. There are federal limitations in terms of how much they can spend. Um, and, uh, and then uh, on top of that, uh, we put limitations on them too. So uh, I, I think they want to do exactly what you want them to do. But it's a question of what can they do. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Are there no other questions from the body? Thank you. Welcome, Reverend. How are you? Greetings. <laughs> Just for the body's edification, there is no regularly scheduled assembly meeting between now and one of the third days past. So, if we don't approve this tonight, then we have to have a special meeting to deal with the issue. Welcome, Reverend. Thank you. My name is Pastor William Green. Eagle Room Missionary Baptist Church for the last almost 31 years. And I'm here tonight because I am concerned about our children. All right. Everybody want to cut money, but what about little Johnny when 60% of them are below standing? What's the vision for bringing those kids up to standing? Now, my, it is my belief that we can't afford to lose 49 teachers. We got our 60 uh, percent minus in academic, all right? I think that the community need to be involved, the parents, we all need to come together and figure out what's going to happen to little, 20, little Johnny 20 years from the day. We talking about the jailhouse field now. Well, if little Johnny and his sister not educated, what do you think it'll be like 20 years from this day? I can tell you, it'll be overcrowded, and the cost will be tremendous. And I don't think precaution is worth a pound of kill. And I don't see, and I don't agree with cutting 49 teachers when we are 60 percent below standard. And I'm here to rouse the conscience of Anchorage and the community. What the NWACP is doing, this is a statewide task. All right? They're doing away with K-1. Next thing they'll be doing away with little Johnny. And we need to think about our children. All right? I've been out of jail, uh, in the jail ministry for over 30 years and I baptized 1,500 inmates. A lot of those inmates today are missionaries, pastors throughout the state. And God took nobody and made somebody out of those young people. And I'm simply saying we need, I'm here to arouse the conscience of Anchorage and the state of Alaska. I'm concerned about our children. And I would hope that in making your decision, little Johnny be at the top of the line. All right? I, I've been there. I'm not talking hearsay. I'm talking actually facts. And I appeal to this August board to let us think about little Johnny. You can't put a dollar on educating our children. They are our most precious gift, and we need to look at that. God bless and God keep you. Any question? Thank you, Reverend. Any questions for some members? Take care, sir. Thank you. Welcome to the meeting, sir. Hello. Um, David Neese, N-E-E-S. I live in uh, Mr. Hall and Mr. Steele's section of town. Um, you have to remember the process on this is that the ASD is a department of the city. It's no different than the uh, maintenance. It's no different than water and light. 
um, you have control over their budget only. Uh, mayor Berkowitz uh, could do what uh, a previous mayor did and say, I don't like that amount, and scratch out an amount. He can't line item it, but he can scratch out an amount. Um, unlikely to happen. There was 4% increase in funding in this budget from 2014 to 2016 from the state, 4%. The local contribution is up 6%. So the local people are already contributing more in a faster way than the city is by 50%. Um, this is creating an imbalance, and there's this amazing figure of $18 million that appears and disappears in the budget and is mentioned once in transition in the paperwork where they shoved it out of one budget cycle and into another. They actually made a profit last year because they got more from the state than they thought they were going to get. Um, so you have to look at this budget, and it's a department that you have no control over, period. You don't get to choose whether or not they're going to fire the firemen or the th snowplow operators. Nobody would fire a teacher. It's done for political purposes. And as long as that continues that way, you will have no control over the school district. 4% of the last six months at the board training, it was pointed out that's exactly how much time they spent on student achievement. They expect the kids to attend 90% of the time. They expect them to perform at the 90th percentile but the board itself is performing at the fourth percentile on achievement. You need to do them a favor and take away the other tasks that they're doing. School maintenance, bonding, major maintenance, facilities, custodial, food. They need to get focused on teachers in the classroom and doing that part of the budget. So right now you're overfunding them with local contributions, which is your local taxpayers, which is who you represent. So you might want to take a look at the way your relationship with the assembly and the independent school district that you work with. You guys are not pulling in a harness together at all. So that's just my comments. Any questions? Comments from assembly members. Thank you, Mr. Neal. Thank you. Anybody else wish to testify, please come forward. Welcome, sir. Hi. My name's Ed Larivee, L-A-R-R-I-V-E-E. -E. I live in the Tudor Lake Otis area, and I don't see how you can vote on this right now until after the elections, because from what I understand with this leaflet that's been sent to us, a uh, 49.3 million bond to improve local schools. And, you know, the governor, on the other hand, keeps on saying everybody's going to have to tighten their belt. They're going to have to sacrifice. And with that one comment of that one guy, 60%, uh, he said, uh, is falling below uh, the average uh, for reading and math. Well, we're throwing money at it, and we're not getting anywhere. We need to have more volunteers. I understand that, that there's a school off of Lake Otis that's turning away volunteers. We need to have more volunteers to, to, you know, to assist the teachers. Maybe bigger classrooms, more volunteers. I'm a taxpayer, I'm being taxed to death. They're, they're taking a lot of the funding that should be going towards bridges, roads, maintenance in, on, on bike trails, all sorts of stuff. And it's time they have to tighten their belt. They just have to sacrifice. And again, I don't see how you can vote on this thing tonight when this election hasn't taken place yet. You gotta see the full picture. And uh, I think that they need to have more budget cuts. As Amy pointed out, there's a gap. And that's just from me. I'm a taxpayer. Questions from some members? Thanks for being here. There are no questions, sir. Thank you. Anybody else wish to testify, please come forward. Anyone at all? 
Hearing saying no, and public testimony is called to the wish of the body. Move to approve. I need a second. Move to second, Ms. Johnston. Well, Reverend Green, I agree with you. And um, I won't be here for first quarter budget revisions when we ultimately approve the school district budget. And so this is kind of a preliminary jump at it. I, but I, for years, have felt that ASD should be taking care of the education of the children. And we should be, and the facilities and the management of the facilities should somehow be run more efficiently and effectively. And if that means shared services, contracting out, I don't really care. But for your kids and for my grandkids, I feel education is important. I feel the principals, the vice principals, the people that are running the buildings are the ones that should be in charge. And I think they have the best ideas of how to make this work. And so I will be a no vote. And I have no problem coming back for a special meeting. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Honeman, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was at the, uh, and I, I believe Ms. Johnson was there as well. We had the joint meeting and we had the presentation on the budget and the changes. And Mr. Graff, uh, thank you for trying to put the numbers. I didn't copy them down as quick. We were given percentage of decrease in staff and they broke it down by working group to include um, central support services, building leadership administration, and the ancillary services, uh, custodians, maintenance, security staff, noon duties, uh, of which uh, incre is decreasing uh, at, at the, one of the highest, well, actually, the, the central support service is increasing and the decrease in the lowest, well, highest, at the highest level. But 9% cuts. Um, I don't know uh, the, the best balance between, you know, the, we, I asked this question and I looked at it from two perspectives. And one is, um, you know, <laughs> in the military's perspective, how many people are in support of one fighter jet going out and, and flying off to a sortie, a mission, or whatnot? There's one pilot, and sometimes there may be a rear uh, doing some navigational or machinery or some wizardry that they have now. But how many actually people are behind the scenes getting that plane ready to go and then fixing it as it comes back? Um, I suppose it's far, far more than what we're getting or what we see. I asked this, this question specifically of the school board and, and the, the administration. What is the right ratio to get us the, and that is the best, result, best results? There's no doubt that uh, we shouldn't and I think it would be uh, irresponsible to let custodians go and, or ask parents that, you know, would you be willing to come clean the school uh, at the end of each school day or on the weekend and mop the floors and clean the bathrooms? I, I, I think that we're uh, we may at some point down the road get to that point, but I'm not sure that that would be the most responsible thing to do until we, we get to that point, uh, if ever. Uh, if we let something go and neglect it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be costly to, to keep it up and fix it It'll down the stream. So um, it is a matter of prioritizing. I know the school board didn't take this matter lightly. It took it very seriously to discuss and uh, mince through this. Um, oftentimes, you know, you hear... Uh, some of the first things on the chopping block when you're cutting budgets is sports and athletic activities. Uh, other times, I, I think I heard Mr. Nee say, you know, this is all political show that, you know, we're going to cut teachers when that's the last place you should be cutting. Um, you know, I, I, I think it pains. We're talking in percentages, 0.35% de decrease of all the teachers number versus 22% reduction in central support services. Now, mind you, 0.35% of a larger number is a high number to look at in comparison. So, uh, you know, this is a real uh, struggle each and every year because we have three different levels of budgets that we deal with, and they're all on different calendar years. The federal government, October 1st. The state, July 1. We, for God's sake, for all intents and purposes, the first of the year, uh, we come in for our later adjustments in the first quarter. It's, it's pretty much cruel that we're putting our administrators and our school board to such machinations of jumping around trying to figure out where the money's coming from. And worse yet, we're bound by, uh, in some cases, the state's legislative intent and actual wording in a base student allegation. For instance, 
uh, about four years ago, I believe, if memory serves request, the, uh, correct, the Senate, the Alaska Senate, and of course the legislature, uh, passed legislation that said if, if the municipalities give more than what uh, is allowed under their wording of the legislation, they remove that same funding back from the state. If I'm not incorrect, I, I, I believe that was what was passed, and if memory serves, SB 182. So without going on too much further, uh, we have a serious responsibility before us, and that is either pass the budget that's presented by the school district and the school board, which, you know, they have done their due diligence by public hearings, uh, and I know it's pained them a lot to try to come in here telling us they're going to cut, uh, which may or may not, Ms. Dimboski, eliminate one person, a live body. But uh, it, it is going to, as Mr. Green, uh, Reverend Green said, and uh, Mr. Bronson, you know, it, 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 any cut, whether it's through an attrition vacant position where they can't hire a teacher to put in the classroom, is going to be the net effect of one less teacher, or in this case, 49 in the classrooms. So uh, it's not going to be 49 in one school building, I can guarantee you that, and, and it's not going to be even split into two. Uh, but every loss of a teacher or a support staff for success of our kids is, is essentially taking chink away, kind of nibbling away at the success that we're looking for going forward. It's not, it's cruel. It's cruel to our district, our board, our teaching staff. God knows the morale and the motivation behind it has to be more than monetary, uh, especially when you get a lot of people running around saying, you know, uh, it, it costs too much. I did a couple of figures here real quick, and as uh, some people have said once before, Figures don't lie, but liars can sometimes figure. But I'm looking at the numbers here. 48,000 students in the budget that's being proposed, an all-in cost is 16,041 per student at 48,000. Uh, I, I can't get the most recent number, but in the Department of Corrections, the last number I found for someone in jail, and we're not even talking about educating and re re reforming people. It's about 50,000 a person. So it's, it's expensive if we don't do it right. And it's very expensive if we let things go into neglect. Um, I, I, I don't think, Ms. Johnson, you mentioned contracting out and, and, and all these other things. I, I don't think you can find contractors. Maybe you can. The only thing I can see you doing in net savings is if you don't have a school district employee, which is a government employee with benefits or retirement, which has changed completely than what it used to be, uh, then at least all you're doing is paying a salary to a contractor. Uh, my mother worked in government contracting for many years. Uh, there was a circular going around, A176, they tried, they did several studies, and after five years, the contracts cost way more than what the government employees did uh, pound for pound. The only difference being they did, the taxpayers weren't on the hook for a retirement down the road 30 years. So I, I don't know the answer, the perfect answer, but uh, I have to stand by our school district, our school board, who've taken their tasks seriously. I take mine seriously, and I, I intend to support this budget. Mr. Evans, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, obviously, the, the school district budget is, is big, not only in dollars, but actually in just size of paper. It's complex. Uh, it's, a, it's a massive bureaucracy, 48,000 students, hundreds of buildings. It's, it's, a, it's not an easy task to put together a budget. And there are a number of things that I or any member on this body can pick at in that budget that we don't like. Um, you know, I, I was shocked to learn that there were, at one point before this uh, budget, you know, three assistant principals in Chugiak, which seems excessive to me. Um, and that uh, we have to spend a million dollars more for the food program because we opted to provide food to all kids in certain schools, even though they didn't meet the income requirements. Mm -hmm. And we have to spend a million dollars more for that. Um, those kind of things I could, you know, pick a, pick a fight with. But to me, that's uh, reorganizing the deck chairs on the Titanic. That's not the big issue. Last year was the first year I got to vote on the school district budget. And in that meeting, I said that what I was looking for was a revolution in public education. And last year's crowd laughed a little more when I said that. Because um, it, it seems a little funny because, yeah, who, you know, we're calling for a revolution. But I was dead serious. I mean, I think, you know, that we have, as it's been mentioned, depending on what studies you believe, how we're doing as compared to the rest of the, the country, 
it's anywhere from substandard to average, I think is, is the, the best I can say with that. And that's in a country that is falling behind the rest of the world in education standards. Um, so we have so much more we have to be able to do to educate our kids to the level they need to be educated. And this budget, whether, you know, we can send it, you know, Reverend Green, I certainly admire his passion for the kids. Uh, we could send this back to you and you can fill those 49 teachers positions and that's not going to make any difference, not substantial, uh, in how well we educate our kids. Because it's the system that is the problem. I, and I think, you know, Mr. Graff does a fine job. I have no problems with the administration. I have no problems with the school board. They work really hard. It's a job I wouldn't want. I have no problems with the teachers. All the teachers I know in the, in the Anchorage School District, and all three of my kids went through there, and I have friends that are teachers there, are excellent people, excellent teachers that I think do a really good job. The problem is we have this tremendous institutional bureaucracy that institutionalizes mediocrity. Uh, and we're stuck in it. And we can f spend another $50 million on this budget, and you're not going to move that needle an inch on the ultimate outcome. Um, but I think if you had the will, and it's hard because it's a revolution, revolutions are messy, revolutions are dangerous, they're risky, um, but you have to completely fundamentally change the way we look at education. And a lot of that has to do with autonomy, moving autonomy down from all the way from the federal government, all the way from the state government, from our school district right into individual schools and classrooms, where you have schools that have the ability to kind of set their own rules in their curriculum to some degree. And I know there's a lot of restrictions on how you can do that, but you have to try to get there so they start competing with themselves uh, from one classroom to another and from one school to another. Uh, you have to add rigor to the curriculum. It, school has to be harder. Uh, you know, the, the world is a lot more complicated and there's a lot more for kids to know these days in order to keep up with the rest of the world. And they have to, it has to be more disciplined. Those three things, I think, autonomy, rigor, and, and discipline, would go a long way to reshaping education. And there's a million other things, but I am not a professional educator and I am not competent by any means to give you advice on that. Uh, but I do believe I cannot vote in favor of the school district budget once again because we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars and again, what I think is just institutionalized mediocrity. I'm willing to get in the trenches with you, shoulder to shoulder, and fight to revolutionize education in this town, which won't be easy. Um, but until there's someone to get in that battle with, I just have to sit up here and make my symbolic vote of no, even though we all know it's going to pass. So that's my speech for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Mr. Flynn. I always hate to follow Mr. Evans. Uh, so um, because I haven't told an historical story all night, and I know Ms. Johnston misses those, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to offer a relatively brief one. Long before my tenure on this body, I served as a member of the Municipal Salaries and Emoluments Commission. When I arrived on it, it was dysfunctional. They hadn't done their job. And, I don't know, three or four years at that point. And um, it, I didn't really know what I was getting into when I agreed to do it. But uh, immediately I was beset upon by the school board who said, hey, you know what, we should be paid as much as assembly members are because we have a bigger budget and more employees. And um, the assembly members uh, who I spoke with said, well, that's really interesting, but remember, we're in charge of their budget. And that stuck with me. So when I was going door to door, my first time out running for the assembly, I happened to have the pleasure of encountering Frank Reed, who, uh, for those of you who don't sleep with your copy of the charter under their pillow like I do, was the chair of the Charter Commission. And I asked him the question, you know, why is it that the assembly approves the school district budget? Why are they not an independent taxing authority and therefore responsible directly to taxpayers uh, as opposed to via the assembly for their budget? And Mr. Reed explained, and I've taken this to heart, that the assembly is the sole taxing authority for this pallet of Anchorage. And that was the intent of the charter 
commission members. He says, but, he said, your job is to choose how much to appropriate. It's the school board's decision as to how they spend those dollars. If they want gold-plated toilet seats in every school in the Anchor School District, they can do it, but that means they have to do less with something else. So getting to the larger issue of whether we approve this budget or not, and rather than the details within it, and I think Mr. Evans eloquently pointed out, there's things that all of us can quibble about. Um, our support of our school district me makes a difference when we have a discussion with state appropriators. And really, the size and sh the shape of this budget is not as important as the size of it. And I'm inclined to support our contribution to maximize state support for the school district. And that's why I'm going to vote for it. However, Mr. Evans, in terms of revolution, my suggestion has been, and I'll make it one more time on the record, it's been heard before, I think every elementary school in this district should be either a charter school or a magnet school on some level or another so that, as you pointed out, they are competing for students all over the district. Uh, I love the, the model that my sons enjoy where everybody in the neighborhood is automatically in, but it's a magnet program and it draws people from uh, kids from throughout the district and has wonderful levels of parental involvement, and I think that's the model that works best. That's the revolution I'd like to see. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Steele, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, boy, where do I start? Um, when, when I was on the school board, and when I was on the school board, I, uh, when I first got on, I didn't know much of anything, and uh, um, I got educated quickly. But the, um, the, the school district, and I've always used this term, the school district is a beggar for money. They don't tax anybody. Um, they beg for what they think they need, and they're given what somebody else thinks they need. And everybody's got their finger in it. Uh, the, uh, the state uh, has, has uh, the responsibility for education. I mean, that's a, uh, that's a charter issue. And uh, uh, so, so it's their responsibility to educate Alaska's kids. Um, but uh, most of our funding, uh, you know, comes from the federal government. We're, we're good bakers. And uh, <clears throat> about when times get tough, um, both of them cut it back. If you've been watching what the state's doing to, uh, to the budget this year, you can see that they're changing. Um, the taxpayers, um, the, the state tells the taxpayers of Anchorage how much they can add to the coffers. And, uh, and uh, that's a it's a formula, it's a federal formula, but uh, they, they tell you how much you can add. So we can only add a certain amount. Um, but there are things we can do, and I think Jennifer's got some ideas in terms of uh, facilities. We could take the facilities back, but you know their budget's going to be cut by that amount. It's going to be transferred to the city. So they don't make anything in the process. Um, the, uh, the federal government uh, and the state government tell them how they're going to test, how they're going to measure the kids' success, and that changes every year, it seems. Uh, and so, and then uh, other people say, well, shoot, there, we have this many kids, and they have that many kids down in, uh, uh, down in California, and uh, their kids do better on the test. Well, maybe they've been taking that particular test for three years. We've only been taking it for one year. So our kids don't, don't know the test, how to take the test and make mistakes. The teachers don't know how to teach for the test. And then somebody gets an idea and there's a new test the next year. Uh, and then you compare them with everybody everywhere else. Um, it is a tough racket. And I applaud you guys for, for doing it. Uh, 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 Mr. Flynn's correct. Uh, there are some great schools in the Anchorage School District. Um, I happen to send my kids to the same school he's bragging about. But uh, it doesn't do any better. 
uh, than some, some of the charter schools. Um, these people know how to educate. They know how to give the kids the knowledge and uh, what knowledge to give them. Uh, and know how to test for it and see how they're doing, correct midstream, so on and so forth. But they don't have the option to do it that way. And every one of the teachers would probably do it a little bit differently based upon their personality, their skills. Uh, education is tough. It's a tough racket. Our school system uh, does a darn good job. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we had a great uh, language uh, immersion program for kids coming in that uh, uh, spoke another language at home uh, to get them started. It was a two-year program. You're able to uh, uh, have small classrooms and teachers dedicated to it. I think Catholic Social Services ran it. But um, so they had that the two years, and then they worked them into the school uh, so that they, they were ready. They had the language. They, they knew what school was all about. They knew what was expected of them. And most of them did exceptionally well. And then the state says, oh, no, we're going to make that a one-year program. You can only keep them in there for one year, uh, and then you've got to put them in a the regular classroom. And it's not as good now, although they do fairly well. They're motivated, and they usually have their families uh, behind them. Uh, there are too many variables to be able to directly compare anything. But these folks know how to educate, and if we gave them what they needed, they would educate. The preschool programs that they cut this last year were doing fantastic. They were four hours a day, I think, uh, at a number of schools doing great. And the kids came out of there, that, boy, they were ready to go. They were gangbusters. Uh, teachers know how to teach. Administrators know how to administrate. Uh, the money gets in the way every time, and the, the way the decision makers divvy up that process is uh, is tough. Uh, this body, you come before this body, and we want to muck around in it. Uh, you uh, go down and talk to the state, and they say, "Oh no, we can't give you any more money. This is all the state that the government, you know, the legislature will give you." Uh, they had too big a bill down here in this other building down the street. Uh, Anyway, uh, these folks know how to teach. They know what they need. If we want to be creative and take away the facilities, I'm sure they'll be upset about that. We could do that. Take away the facilities. You done, sir? Put it in our budget. And uh, anyway, uh, it's not fair. It's not right. Uh, the measurements are generally wrong. They're generalizations. Uh, but these guys are doing a pretty good job. The schools are 100% better in terms of safety than they were when my kids were in school. Uh, so you're doing something right. Well, the, there's no other comments. On the interest of uh, moving on, we've got a lot of things on the agenda that yet. Please vote. Yes, we'll approve, and no, we'll not. We still have some people need to vote. One more person. And so does the computer. That passes seven to four. Moving on, we now have in front of us item 14D, Ordinance 2016-29, Ordinance authorizing the disposal of electrical easement located on a portion of Tract A, Northwood subdivision between Acreage Water and Waste Water Utility and Matanuska Collector Association. Public hearing on this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify? Please come forward. Mr. Chair, can I have a point of personal privilege? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just need to verify. I think this is the parcel on Norton Court. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, before we have public testimony, Mr. Chair, I'd like to um, make a disclosure. I don't think I'm going to have a conflict, but I do live on Norton Court. And so this parcel is, um, this is the old wellhouse pump, pump site, right? So I look at it from my front window. Um, I look at a very large cell tower now, right there. But um, I just want to make that disclosure so people know I live on this street. The parcel is not directly adjacent to my property, but it's at the end of the cul-de-sac. I don't have any interest or anything, but I do want to make the disclosure for you in the body just in case there's questions. Do you think you can be objective in rendering a decision on this? Yes. Okay, it's really the chair. You know, the conflict, a lot of us have these things that crop up from time to time. Thank you. 
Public hearing this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify? Please come forward. Anyone at all? Hearing say no and public testimony is closed well as wish the body. Move to approve. Second. Discussion from assembly members. Ms. Dombowski, anything? Uh, no, sir. That was from previous. Okay. I, I urge approval. Please vote. That item was approved by the body. Next time in front of us. Mr. Chairman. Sir. Um, before going on, uh, I believe we have an S version of the previous referenced resolution 2016-54 that's been handed out by the school attorney dealing with the APDEA agreement. You talk about it in 14B? Correct. Okay, Mr. Flynn, that's back in front of us. Well, I, 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 if people haven't a chance to glance at it, I'm willing to wait. Has everybody looked at it yet? But I, I, I'm, I'm seeing heads shaking in agreement they've looked at it. Okay, I'm comfortable then moving forward on. Second. I'll, I'll move the S version then. Second. Move and seconded. And, and, if, and if my amendment was, Mr. Flynn. if my motion for an amendment was still open, <laughs> we delayed this, uh, I'll, I'd like to withdraw that. So Madam Kirk, where are we at? Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I'd, I'd like to thank Mr. Ms. Flynn. I'd like to thank Mr. Attorney for, for making the alterations that we discussed in debate. Um, I think Mr. Starr's point is not well taken and uh, hopefully we've got a smoother process moving forward. Thank you. Mr. Starr, have you looked at this yet, sir? I have, and I mean, I think the point's been made as best that I can. I don't want to revisit old days where there's been conversations between pre-negotiated CBAs, labor unions, and the administration um, in, in ways that, that aren't necessarily compliant with code or aren't clearly spelled out for the mechanism to occur via the CBA. So what does the collective bargaining agreement language say to basically reopen, renegotiate, amend, change, or not? So in any case of law, you would want to go to what the contract that everybody signed, we approved, what does it say to do? Through the chair, the collective bargaining agreement that would be modified by this administrative agreement has a section five in article two entitled meet and confer which reads as follows. The parties agree that they will meet and confer in good faith at reasonable times and places concerning this agreement and its interpretation or any other matter of mutual concern to employee representatives and the municipality. The parties further agree that either party may request in a writing delivered to the other that the parties confer within 14 days after the date of the delivery of the request, which request shall specify the matter to be discussed. In inexcusable refusal to meet and confer in response to such a request shall be a violation of the agreement. There shall be no obligation on the part of either party to reopen, modify, amend, or otherwise alter the terminology or interpretation of this agreement, or to make any other agreement as a result of such conferences, nor shall the requirement for such conferences alter the rights or obligations of the parties under this agreement. So does the request for meet and confer open up the collective bargaining in quotes? I'm not sure how I take open up, but I do believe that the request for meet and confer allows the party to make the kinds of modifications that are anticipated by both letters of agreement as they are defined in the code and the administrative agreements that are defined in the code. I, and I believe further, and I'm not the lawyer up here, but I also believe when you both mutually agree within that 14-day window, you're supposed to send a letter to the assembly saying we've reopened or re reconfirmed conversation in the collective bargaining agreement. My read of AMC 370 is that is correct when you are renegotiating the whole collective bargaining agreement so that you will issue a new document with a new term, etc. cetera. Um, but that is distinct in the code. Labor agreements are a distinct beast from administrative agreements and the administrative agreements do not trigger that assembly notification. Right, we've gotten past the, the vernacular that you headed all this or used the heading of letter of agreement, which is, I believe, used in a different way throughout uh, my nine years up here. You're moving it now based on your S version to try to treat it as an administrative agreement, which is also somewhat clearer, helpful, perhaps. And I, I'm not going to be the stickler that says it doesn't comply with the requirements, but it doesn't, yeah. partly because the agreement that you signed with labor was the end of January 21st. 
So as you say, they're supposed to look and be submitted to the assembly in the form of a, of a ordinance, a manner of which it is ordinance, of course, in a public hearing setting, and then also submitted within 30 days. So and this ordinance was submitted for introduction on February 28th, which was within 30 days. 30 days of signing? That is, is my that understanding. Right? Yeah. yeah. It was signed on the 21st of January. So it was submitted on the agenda. Perhaps we need to take a look at that. I'm not sure. I think it says to submit and review by the assembly within 30 days of ex execution by the duly appointed representatives. So if it was signed on January 21st, it should have come to us no later than February 21st. That, that's so, correct. And it was submitted to the clerk well in advance of that. Um, it, February 28th. But that's the date of the first reading. Okay. The, the February 28th. That so, was, I believe that was the assembly meeting. Is that correct? Okay. That, that was the assembly meeting. Sorry, but we, the 23rd is the assembly meeting. Uh, the 23rd, excuse me. Yep. So we submitted it. It's just, it's the, you know, probably 10 days before the actual assembly meeting to the clerk's office. And that's when we, that, that's the official transmittal for yep. a document like Good. that. Well, I'm, I'm appreciative of you being cognizant, Mr. Abbott. You and I have had, I'll call it a dust up over this very issue, which was something I want to stay way away from. Uh, I'm not displeased with the motivation to, to take uh, labor's concerns to heart and modify labor agreements and all that, but we also consternate and work hard when we sit down and do those CBAs every three years or every five years whenever they come up to us, and we try to do a good job. There are times when I would like to send a directive to the administration, and if I get the votes up here one day, I will and we ask you guys to open and meet and confer and do that. And I hope the spirit is the same when we have fiscal challenges or we need to make modifications. I also want to make sure, and this is me just doing what government's supposed to do, is do it right. I want to have the administrative agreement understood by both parties. I want to use the appropriate letter of agreement to make the summation that there is no fiscal modification. Um, your first words were, well, we haven't figured it out because we don't know how many people are going to be affected. That's far different than saying there is no fiscal change. There will be perhaps a change to our budget requirements uh, in, in, in the future. So, and, and if we need to you know, tighten up what the uh, internal audit looks at and how they see uh, fiscal change to that, uh, it may just be two employees, but we have a lot of CBAs out there and they all need to be treated the same. So uh, I appreciate it that it's, this, that it's the police in this case. We've got to you know, have good labor relations, but I also want to make sure we follow um, the rules. So, and to the chair, that that point is very well taken, and I will tell you that I advised uh, the labor folks weeks ago to be mindful of this nomenclature and to adopt the correct terminology yeah. going forward. Well, it, it, it's a hard it's a hard job when we get out of whack on this, and so through the chair and the others, thanks. I just tell you this has been a this has been a bad time in my career having to fix issues where we didn't do what we were supposed to, including the complete rewrite of 70.130, which I raised my hand and did. <laughs> so I know it well. Let's just do it right. And Labor, thanks for engaging, however that would be. You can certainly come to us, and we can initiate a request for meet and confer. Uh, I think it should be mutual. Uh, that's me pontificating more, but, you know. Um, Mr. Starr, this takes you back to a different time on this. Well, it takes me back to a bad place, quite frankly. Uh, rush CBAs through this body that were occurred, finding 140 agreements between labor and management that, that should have we been talked about on our side of the fence. And then we have to maintain fiscal control over some of these, these solutions. There is no inference on my case tonight that there is anything inappropriate. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that we clearly have specified in code the mechanisms to follow, the clear posting of the notice, follow it like an ordinance, and then just, just get us all in the loop. That's all. Well, thank you, Mr. Starr. Mr. Honeman, on this item? I, I think we've probably discussed it enough. I, I just, okay. I, I, I get what Mr. Starr is saying, but I, I don't think this was, I, I, from my perspective, Mr. Starr, I, I, respectfully, I, I know we were given notice that this was coming before us, and I know that the agreement was there for us to look at, and I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I know it kind of gives us all a little bit of the eebie-jeebies, but um, anyway, well, points well made. Thank you. Okay, let's vote on this item. We have in front of us approval item 2016-54-S. Please vote. <laughs> item is approved. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Thank you, Mr. Balzi. We're doing that. 
We now have in front of us item 14E, AR 2016 61, resolution of uh, appropriating $120 million from short term borrowing program STP for the ConocoPhillips Alaska Inc. interest in property within the Beluga River unit to Municipal Light and Power MLP Department, MLP Beluga Gas River Field Fund, five, uh, 532 Finance Department, Public Finance Investment. Hearing on this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify, please come forward. CHM crew for the record, spell your last name and tell us what part of town you live in. Anyone at all? Here again, saying no one pub testimonies closed. What's the wish of the body? Move to approve. Mr. Starr, sir, you're on the list. Chair, Mr. Falsey, what happens if the RCA doesn't like the terms as written in the contract that we've negotiated and tells us to go back to the table? What, what happens? Under the terms of the purchase and sale agreement, if the RCA imposes onerous conditions on either us or on the seller, then the, we can go back to the drawing board. We're not bound to the terms of, we're not, we're not obligated to close. And with regard to this item in particular, we have, uh, this would grant the authority to make the payment, but not the obligation to make the payment. So if, if we approve this tonight, we're not going to start any sort of uh, interest charges or a line of credit costing or anything like that with Wells Fargo? My understanding is that we would not actually ask for the money for Wells Fargo until shortly before we would be tending to pay it to ConocoPhillips. I would defer. I'm getting a head shake. Yes. That, that's correct, yes. So the, and, and I, I've been the supporter of this and I am tonight. The logic in coming to us for the appropriation before some of the questions have been answered uh, is is just to show that we're behind it or we have the money or why are we asking to be appropriated when we haven't got the green light yet? Um, the agreement requires us to close quickly after we receive the RCA approval, which is the last hurdle. And there is not a sufficient window of time after getting that final RCA approval to then come back to the assembly for additional action. So this puts us in the posture to be able to carry through on our obligations under the purchase and sale agreement. And last question, Mr. Chairman, if I can. We haven't been asked yet that I know of for an additional appropriation for legal support to negotiate our case at the RCA level. Are you going to do that on your own or are we going to hire uh, somebody more skilled? Not, not to say you're not skilled, but are we going to hire a group Mr. that Starman, knows? Mr. Starman, different skills. <laughs> well, maybe. Costing search. You'll have to look high and low, Mr. Star. Uh, we, we are handling our regulatory work both uh, through the existing contract we have with K&L Gates and with MLMP's routine regulatory mm -hmm. council who has particular RCA expertise. I'm not aware of any need to seek additional authority for our current RCA council. That's correct. The, this uh, item is being handled inside the existing MLNP budgeted authority. Some of if the I approval. Need them, I would. Some of the approval of the contract terms helps to get electric. Are they kicking into some of our legal concerns at the? They RCA have level? their own council, and we are pursuing this matter before the commission jointly. So we have separate council that are working together. And there is a division of labor that comes with that. So after this appropriation tonight at the assembly level, if we agree to the 120 million, the item will not come back in front of us then? Um, Unless? I, I, uh, it depends. Um, we're, uh, I, the only uh, contingency I can think of is if the RCA did not let us use this financing mechanism, and at that point we'd need to bring you a different option. But we believe this will be acceptable to the commission, and if that's the case, then yes, that's correct. Okay. And I'll support this appropriation, but I'd also like to be advised, Mr. Mayor or Mr. Abbott, if, if there's a need to write significant checks out of, say, operating capital that the municipality has to match. So the $120 million is appropriated for short-term borrowing, but I would want to be alerted if there's anything else that you'd have to start to write checks for, um, and that would be... You know, and, and I know it's under thirty thousand. We don't have to have that, but it, it, collectively, it starts to add up. No, we'd be glad to show you at the end of the project a full accounting of all the incremental expense associated with this, uh, the consideration of, and the ultimately, hopefully, the acquisition of right. this interest in BRU. Yeah, or if it gets away from you and you need 
you need additional appropriation because there's other resources. Certainly, I'm, you'd, have, you'd come to us anyhow. But absolutely, good, good effort. I appreciate it. It'll save the city a significant amount of money long term. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Mr. Flynn. Yeah, I think it was Chairman. And I asked this question in writing and got an answer, but I'm not sure everyone had a chance to read it. Um, so, Mr. Abbott, could you speak, or Mr. Johnson, either one, uh, as to the uh, gas replacement fund? I think that's the wrong vernacular uh, that MLP has built up with, from the previous purchase and how that might affect this financial transaction. Yes, and I think Mr. Johnson is going to be able to give you uh, the information you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Flynn. We have asked as part of the RCA's approval to, for us to acquire the field to also approve the use of the DRLGS, Deferred Regulatory Gas Liability, as well as the future gas purchases account and the underlift. And that total is about 100 and what? It is uh, about $105 million, okay. give or take. So presuming they approve that, we're uh, only going to need to finance about $15 million? Assuming that they approve it, we wouldn't have to finance anything. Nothing. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Evans, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't want to waste everybody's time. I just found it fascinating that uh, borrowing $120 million takes up two pages of our packet, where approving a liquor license takes up 60. So I'm just, <laughs> just not sure if we've focused on the right thing here. <laughs> Certain things are more complicated, Mr. Evans. Okay. Any other comments from assembly members? If not, please vote. <coughs> that item is approved by the body. <laughs> My thanks to the administration for bringing this forward. It saves our taxpayer, our ratepayers, a lot of money by us having the source of supply. And that's both for MLP and you guys electric. Thanks for your leadership on this. Next time in front of us, we got to go up to 14F on it. 14F Resolution Air 2016-62, a resolution of this Pali Vanquish, Alaska appropriate amount not to exceed $287,329 from State of Alaska Department of Transportation Wait Public reading. Facilities. Thank you. Public hearing this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify, please come forward. And state your name, clear for the record, and spell your last name. Anyone at all? Hearing and say no, put testimonies closed. What's the wish of the body? Move to approve. Discussion from assembly members. If not, please vote. Who are we missing? Sue? <coughs> Jennifer, thank you, ma'am. That is approved by the body. Next item in front of us is item 14G, AR 2016-63, a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage appropriating $900,000 from the earnings within the MOA Trust Fund 730 for expert financial management and support services provided in calendar year 2016. Public hearing this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify, please come forward and uh, state your uh, name, spell your last name, and tell us what part of you live in. Anyone at all? Hearing and saying no, and public testimony is closed. What's the wish of the body? Move to approve. We'll move to second. Discussion from assembly members. Please vote. That's approved unanimously. Next item in front is item 14H. A resolution of the Public Bankers of Alaska appropriating, appropriating 340 $340,000 contribution from the 2016 Maintenance Wait and Operation reading. Department. Thank you for waving your reading. Public hearing this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify? Please come forward. Mr. Chairman, I'm Diane Holmes, and I believe that the title of this um, AR is written the way it is because that is the way it appeared before the voters in 2009. I'm assuming that's correct. 
but it is misleading because there has been legislation since then, and I wonder if it's appropriate at some time and some place in this to state that the Alaska Museum, Anchorage Museum, is really not eligible to receive funds. They are responsible for all of their own maintenance, large and small. So I put that before you. At some point, I think it should, it's, it should be changed. Thank you, Diane. So no questions from the seven members. Anybody else wish to testify on this item, please come forward. Anyone at all? Hearing say no, public testimony is closed. What's the wish of the body? Move approval. Is there a second? We're saying here, we're waiting for a second. Ms. Johnson did. Okay, discussion from assembly members. Please vote. Mr. Steele, you need to vote, sir. Thank you. That is unanimous. Next item in front of item 14I, AR 2016-65, a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage, Alaska, approving a master tax exempt lease purchase agreement, loan, and appropriating amount not to exceed $21 million. Sorry. Let me get there again. $21,838,957. To the Information Technology Fund, Wave reading. 607. Okay. Public hearing this item is now open. If you wish to testify, please come forward. Anyone at all? You're back. I'm back. <laughs> I know I shouldn't have said hi to you a couple days. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, my name is Lance Ahern, L A N C E A H E R N. Um, it's great to be here. I miss you all. You all look great. I also really appreciate um, all of your work on this. I really appreciate you know the position that everybody's in. I have the utmost respect for the administration. I'm not trying to come down on anybody. The employees have been working on this for years. There's a huge investment in this. Um, but the reality is, from the limited information that I've seen that's in front of me, and I've continued to talk to people on the project team for the last two years, my expectation is you've got a $21 million request in front of you to cover through next July 1st. From my experience, you that would not get you halfway to where you need to be. You're going to be doing this for a couple more years. It's going to be more than another $40 million. That's the reality that I see from the people I talk to. Three things I would ask of you. One is to, as soon as possible, get the um, detailed project plan and post it online where people can actually see it. And as the weekly updates happen, that should be updated online as well. Second, I would ask that the Gardner report that was paid for by the municipality last May be posted online and made available. I've requested that a number of times and I've not been able to get my hands on it, but I think it's very valuable uh, to the project as a whole. Third, I would say that um, there's a, going to be a lot of pressure because of the money and the schedule and the needs of the consultants to move this project along. Your employees are going to get a lot of pressure to sign things fast and they're not going to really have the time that they need to evaluate this stuff. You need to make sure that they get a strong message that they need to take the time that it takes to make sure they get this right. I was really impressed by something Bill Starr said just a couple minutes ago, so I'm going to repeat it. It was pretty cool. He said, the sheer power of some negotiating teams is better than others. So the reality is, you know, basically the Muni is in that position. You bought, brought a knife to a gunfight. That's real. You're totally outmanned on this project. You're totally dependent on the vendor. That isn't going to change anytime soon. Um, I just have a lot of concern about where this is going to go in the end. I know the position that you're in in terms of every department's operating budgets, public safety, police, fire, health services, are all taking big hits right now. It will be for years to come for the debt serving for, servicing for this project. You need to know that it's going to get much worse before it gets better. And it's just my recommendation that this is just a bad idea at this point. So I'm open to any questions if you might have any. Question from assembly members. Okay, thank you. Let's see, Mr. Holman has a question, Lance. Sure. More, more of a comment. Um, you know, I, this is one of those things where I know you, you're probably aware of the uh, integration or attempt to integrate or update absent from its old antiquated mainframe into a new age where things can be more interfacing um, around the state, really which could connect and communicate from other areas. 
um, after nearly, I don't know, 25, close to $30 million, they scrapped that. And oh, yeah. in, in essence, that money went to the, to the wastebasket. At one point, this body um, had discussed that as an option. I think the administration reviewed it with a pretty uh, keen eye on doing just that, maybe starting over with a newer, maybe even a cheaper, less than uh, acceptable product. So um, to the extent that it's possible, I, I would ask that the administration uh, at least listen to the transparency request that Mr. Ahern makes. I know you speak from experience that there were a lot of um, shell games, I should say, a lot of information that wasn't being uh, shared uh, from higher levels above you. Uh, and, I, and I feel that you were, and maybe some other staff uh, working here at the time, um, were, if you will, muzzled with, uh, with n not being able to be forthright and candid with us. And so um, I'm not going to put anybody in a hard spot, but uh, I hope we never get to that point again. And I guess my challenge to the administration is uh, it, it looks as if we've, as a body, made the decision to go forward. Uh, you know, the $9 million and will be done in a year, uh, both $9 million wasn't realistic and being done in a year wasn't either. Uh, I didn't know it because much like a lot of other specialty areas, I certainly had no clue. Uh, and so I hope we never get to that point. But thank you for bringing up the information. And, and, and I think Mr. The Mayor actually uh, has taken some personal ownership on going down and negotiating pretty toughly with uh, was something that he was handed right. and certainly was less than a, a gold brick. And something else might be described. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Evans, do you have a question for Mr. Ahern? I do. Good, sir. Um, Thanks, Lance. I appreciate uh, your rosy optimism for the, uh, the future of this, and, and I wish I could say I, I don't, don't share your uh, concerns. Uh, but I thought at the end of your comments you indicated that approving this is a bad idea. Um, if that's so, what is the alternative? Because <laughs> I've been looking for that from anybody. I mean, if there's anybody on the body that's, you know, voting no on this, what is the alternative where, you know, as I see it, we're in the middle of a stream, right. and there is no cheap way to go either direction. But I'm open to suggestions. There are no good alternatives. I mean, you know that for a long time I was saying maybe that there was the ability to put together a scaled-down project a, a year ago. I think we've gone so far along. You, there's no C choice. It's A or B. It's a do it or don't do it. But, you know, I think making it as transparent as possible, as quickly as possible, and holding people accountable for comments that are made about how long it's going to take to finish this and how much it's going to cost, it's in your best interest to, to get that documented and, and keep it updated. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahern. No other questions. Anybody else wish to testify on this item, please come forward. Anyone at all? Hearing you say no in public testimony. Okay. Welcome to the meeting. My name is Miranda Walso, W-A-L-S-O, and I live in Chugaki Grover. So this is a project that nobody has any good stories to tell. It's been bad from the beginning. It's been argued over in court. It's been argued over in the press. And it's been argued over before this body and numerous auditors, and nobody's really come up with a better idea. Keeping this project going is a bad idea. ERP systems are the most complex technology project you can do. We all have learned that. There are only a few options when you look at this level. The problem is not with the technology. These are complex problems. They're implemented by professionals. That's why we don't do it. The problem is that the municipality is not ready for it. We don't have the business processes. We don't have the organization. We don't have the accountability for it. Um, this needs to stop. You know, if SAP is the best way to do it, when we started this, it was so many versions ago that the coding's all different. We, we have to redo it. The, the consultants is different, and, and people are angry about it. You know, this is one of the few issues that you go talk down the street, hey, do you know what SAP is? And somebody say, yeah, it's a computer program. We, we didn't know that before, and it's not a good thing. Whether it's PeopleSoft or Dynamic or, you know, Excel and a lot of pencils, it doesn't matter. What matters is we need to have confidence going forward in how it's done. The other issue I have is using the um, lease purchase agreement. This is a huge project. It started out at $9 million. It's almost $90 million. Who knows if it'll work? We're not going to save money on it, that's for sure. But utilizing the borrowing authority to do it rather than going through a capital project, rather than having that sort of accountability, is a problem. 
it doesn't improve the, the project, it doesn't increase the, the confidence of the staff or the voters. And I would urge you to vote no. Not because SAP is not great. It is a fantastic program. We just don't know how to use it. And if we can't, if we can't figure out how to implement it, we're not going to figure out how to get the benefits from it. Thank you. No questions. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the seminar on this item? Please come forward. Anyone at all? Hearing say no, and public testimony is closed. Was the wish of the body? Moved to approve. 2016-65. But moved, Mr. Honeman, second by Ms. Gray Jackson. Comments from assembly members? Please vote. I was approved. The vote was 10 to 1. We now have in front of us item 14J, AO 2016-33, an ordinance amending Anchorage Book Code, Title 28, to establish voting by mail as a method of choice for municipal elections after June 1, 2016, and providing direction for the preparation of necessary changes for implementation. Public hearing this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify, please come forward. Anyone at all? Hearing and seeing no one public testimony is closed, so what's the wish of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded discussion from assembly members. Mr. Starr, you're first, sir. I'm surprised nobody testified. I think they don't know. I don't think they know what we're what we're doing. Um, and not I'm not in a deceitful manner, but I think that the tried and true tradition of sliding back the curtain and plugging the number and teaching your kids how to do that and showing up and seeing your neighbors and all that that tradition um, won't exist after June of 2016. That's probably not a bad thing considering how our voter turnout's going down and down and down. It's an electronic world for the new generation coming up. Um, I don't know if mail's going to do it. Uh, my kids don't read their mail. <laughs> it sits in a drawer until they come and get it. Hopefully they treat the balloting a little bit more. I will identify a few things that will probably have to uh, be corrected. Um, I'll, be, I'll be around uh, for a while after June 16th, but November will likely show that the candidates running for office will be stymied in the availability for information. And all of us up here ran a campaign in some sort or another. Um, the ability to get the addresses that concur with voter uh, absentee ballots uh, was shut down and changed. We weren't able to get those uh, as readily on who was applying for a ballot in the mail. So does that mean now we're not going to have the data pool available for where those ballots are being mailed to? Um, post office boxes, I have one. I also have a home address. Uh, so I wonder how we're going to handle that. Are we going to see two ballots go out um, where your kids like to get their mail? Um, maybe at my house in a totally different precinct. One of the challenges that I have in my district, um, both Amy and I have uh, service area uh, conversations that are, are different than downtown Anchorage. Um, we all know the number of different ballots. Uh, Amanda Mosier knows the number of different ballots uh, intimately. So what the mechanism is going to be when the mail shows up and we don't have the correct ballot? Because my son lives in South Anchorage but takes his mail in Eagle River. Um, I'm not one to say that I want to identify the problems without solutions. This is a, a pledge to say um, we'll, we'll get it right. But one who's been on the body when we lived through a pretty poor election uh, in the past, that's uh, clear and loud that the public expects uh, ultimate trust in how we handle that. So um, I'm here for another year or so as we kick this off in what, November probably is our first one. What are we going to see for the very first one? April, April. 15th. Yeah. Next year. Unless there's a special. Yeah, great. Okay, well, good luck. Let's make it happen. Amanda, any comments, ma'am? You are the election guru. Can I ask a quick question? Okay. I know we may have closed the public time. May I ask a quick question? Go ahead, ma'am. Um, um, Would you speak to the microphone? Yes, uh -huh. I'm here actually on another issue, but I'm Carol Ashlock and at uh, 5402 West Diamond. Um, my question is this, what is the plan for, and I was a systems manager for a number of years, um, so very oriented toward this sort of thing, but my question is what is the plan for following the efficacy 
of what's really happening with this. Is there, in a nutshell, is there a plan in place for what's happening to see that the information is accurate and follow through on that is accurate? Because that's always the big fear or concern from the public. That's all I want to ask. Thank you. Amanda? Did you want me to respond to if you would, please. Mr. Starr's question or? Both, if you can do both. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start with uh, Mr. Starr's questions through the chair. Thank you very much for your concerns. The first thing that I heard you bring up was um, the availability of the addresses for campaigns that wanted to send out information. Currently, we send out information that is not marked confidential and that I anticipate moving forward would still be available to people who request it, but voters who have requested confidential information to remain confidential is information that we currently do not share. Um, but with the vote by mail model, the anticipation would be that every registered voter within the municipality of Anchorage would receive a ballot. So you would be able to um, have all the addresses that are available to the public to send communication to those voters. Um, the second concern that I heard you address was to make sure that the appropriate ballots were sent to the appropriate voters. And this is something that um, I think in the exploration of vote by mail, it's been going on for about two years. And one thing I was never sure that we could go completely vote by mail because of the complications with our election system here in Anchorage. And just for your information, this year we have 48 different ballot styles because of um, the various splits throughout the municipality of Anchorage, the service areas, the limited road service areas, park service area, fire service area, police service area. Um, in addition to some of the street light service areas in Eagle River, we've been working very hard with the folks at AWU GIS to identify um, the two different pieces of information that we need. So we take the voter registration information from the state of Alaska and we run it against the municipality of Anchorage's um, mill rates, which is how we identify voters based on the different taxes, which impacts which ballots we should be voting on. And through the work we've done over the last two years, we've gotten to high 90% accuracy of identifying voters and which ballot they should get, which is one of the reasons that we're actually confident to move forward with this. I think if we hadn't been doing this work, uh, we wouldn't know how we would be able to assign ballots to those voters. Um, and then I think I heard you talk about the concern with somebody with a P.O. box or um, a house address. Um, in the state voter registration database, information is stored by a residence address, so voters can't live in a P.O. box, so they have to have a physical location within the municipality of Anchorage, and that is which ballot they're um, given is by where they actually live, but if you live in South Anchorage and have a P.O. box in Eagle River, you would be issued a ballot for that location that you live in, South Anchorage, even if you collect your mail across town somewhere else. So does that answer? Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Could you add, that lady had a question. Could you answer that at all? If it would be possible to get the question repeated, I didn't catch the full. She's, she's uh, wanting to know, if I might, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Amanda, she was wanting to know the, how we're going to oversee the efficacy of the Excuse me, to determine the validity of the data. <coughs> Excuse me. The database that we use, the name, the voter registration, and such. Okay. Um, so we, <coughs> here within the municipality of Anchorage, we currently are using the state of Alaska voter registration database, and we um, are, are using the information that they have stored in there, and I'm not really sure additional information I guess I'm not specifically sure. How are we going to, if you could maybe briefly explain how we're going to validate that that person's valid. Oh, effect. okay. Now I understand the question. Thank you. So one thing that we have seen with vote by mail jurisdictions across the country, and specifically there's three states that are currently vote by mail, Colorado, Washington, and Oregon. Uh, of each voter, each registered voter is mailed a ballot, and then the voter signs that ballot envelope and that ballot envelope is returned and they 
confirm the signature on the ballot envelope versus a signature on file to confirm that that is the registered voter who has uh, returned that ballot and to confirm that that voter has only submitted one ballot so far. Mr. Chairman, they can also, from what I understand from Amanda, they can, do, they can scan four or five signatures at a time on the screen and people have been trained on how to identify what's reality and what's somebody else writing like. Paul Honeman in there. And our object with this is to increase the voter turnout. If we're half as successful as King County was, it's a remarkable change in the voter response. Because right now we're down to about 19% if we're lucky. And it's got to get better than that. So thank you, Amanda. Mr. Evans, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It, uh, you know, sometimes it's kind of romantic or quixotic to be the lone voice against something, but most of the time, if you find that everybody else is in favor of it and you're the only one saying no, it probably just means you're wrong, uh, which might very well be the case with this, but I'm not a big fan of the vote by mail um, for a couple different reasons. Uh, one is, when I go to court um, as a lawyer, I have to wear a tie. Now, it, it doesn't make me a better lawyer when I go into court wearing a tie. I could do the same job in jeans and a t-shirt, probably could even do it better because I'd be more comfortable. Um, but there is, the court requires it because it has to, you have to create a certain solemnity and a certain respect for the proceedings uh, that's important to the process. And I think to some degree, our process of voting has the same effect. To, well, Mr. Traney talks about increasing the voter turnout, and that's a good thing. I was in favor of moving the elections to November because we have more people voting in November. That would give us a higher turnout on our, our, our elections. Um, but that was pe those were people who were making the effort to go to the polls. Um, what we're doing by increasing the voter turnout via mail is we're gathering in all the people who couldn't bother to go to the polls. Now, some of them may have some legitimate reason why they could not go to the polls. There are shut-ins or people that have particular problems, but those are a small group when we're talking about increasing the turnout by 10, 20 percent. You're just talking about getting people who, okay, I'll fill out a mail ballot. I wouldn't bother going to the polls to do this. Uh, and I'm not sure that is uh, making a better democracy. Uh, what I would like to see is more people voting who are concerned about voting, uh, who are interested in the issues, and who go to the polls. Um, and I think it's a mistake, and we cheapen the process. When you start giving things away, making it as easy as possible to do something, it takes away the value of that. And there's nothing hardly more valuable in our society than voting. Uh, and I don't want to add obstacles to people to vote. I think, you know, you have to make voting accessible. But making it so easy that it's like filling out your, your form for the Chugach uh, board of directors that you get in the mail uh, takes something away from democracy. I think it has to be a little bit of effort involved. And I, I really, um, you know, the more I think about this, the more opposed I get to it. But uh, like I said, you know, I'm kind of the only one swimming upstream here, and uh, I'm probably wrong about that, but I did want to vent, so thank you. Mr. Honeman, an issue in front of us. Well, this is one of those uh, issues, and again with Mr. Hall uh, and yourself, Mr. Chairman, that we've been at um, several meetings within the community, stakeholders, both uh, non-governmental uh, employees, organizations, as well as uh, well, obviously the clerk staff who spent an inordinate amount of time of research and going around the country. Um, on a personal level, my brother who lives in the Snohomish County, Washington, who's just a year younger than me, um, he does work in the IT section and he's a very smart guy, he's much smarter than me, I'll, I'll, I'll admit to that. Um, uh, not a lawyer, uh, sometimes wears a tie to work too, Mr. Evans. But um, uh, frankly, he said, uh, and I, I could probably pull it up on my texting, but basically he said he would never want to go back to a traditional ballot place again. He finds it very, uh, and he's a voter that votes each and every voting election, uh, whether by mail or when prior, prior when it was by ballot. So he, he is um, a professional worker who works long and hard days. I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room that work probably as many or more hours than my brother and I do. Uh, this is one of those things where we can already vote by mail to some degree in absentee form. Uh, we can submit ballots uh, to uh, to be counted in the various ways anyway, and this is uh, one of those things that I think that uh, bears trying. You know, what's the worst case scenario? 
um, two, three, five years down the road, we look at the data and what's truly coming out, and we'll know whether we hit it right or not. And uh, all the efforts uh, that we're, we're putting towards it, uh, I, I don't believe I would be shocked if we find that it was a waste of effort, energy, time, or, or some funds that we've um, both expended in May getting this thing converted. Uh, and the one thing I will speak to, and I've had some very personal experience to some elections that went askew and afoul, uh, voting in the polling booths, and that's, uh, I don't ever want to, as Mr. Starr said earlier, I never want to go back there to that place again either. I don't know how uh, the question was asked, the efficacy, and how are we going to control all these ballots and such when there's larger numbers coming in electronically, purportedly, compared to what we've been getting physically. Uh, but I, I happen to think uh, that, that we've got technology as it's improving, and we've got a project manager in place. We've got very committed professional staff working on it uh, and a lot of eyes upon it. So, you know, will it need to be adjusted? Perhaps. But uh, I think we're on to something exciting and good, and our community deserves to have its voice heard in a larger numbers than what we've been seeing. So I, I intend to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holman. Ms. Dombowski, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Evans will be glad to know, my friend, you are not alone. Um, I have been um, very, uh, I think one of the first meetings I had um, as an assembly member, I walked into the clerk's office and I said, we need to explore this. I mean, I, I like Ms. Johnson's idea of my Alaska. Logging right in, voting. I'm sure I could help my husband too. But nonetheless, um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, the commentary that I've heard um, up into this point over the last couple of months has consistently been we're exploring this you know we're looking at it but if we see impediments that aren't going to be successful you know we're going to back off um, frankly I found that to be um, I found that to be hollow words I, I think every bit of action I've seen is um, no matter what they're going to shove this through and um, unfortunately I, I I'm at the point at this point where I've, I've raised concerns about fraud and Ms. Ashlock, to go back to your question about efficacy and how do we protect, and I think you were talking about the votes, the actual data coming in, the ballots. You know what, quite frankly, they have no guarantees. That it, that we don't have any guarantees yet. They're gonna try and they're gonna do their best and we have incredible election workers and staff, but the fact of the matter is, this is the great experiment of Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, Mr. Honeman, um, what, what's the worst case scenario? I'll tell you, it's what they've experienced all over the lower 48, which is high amounts of voter fraud. I'm, so to me, there is nothing more fundamental than we do. We have no greater fundamental responsibility than to ensure a fair and fraud-free electorate and election, frankly. And so I think this clerk's office is gonna work very hard at that. But at this point, you haven't, earn my confidence. I still say this is a great experiment. Um, it's not one that has been proven to me yet. We've, we've ironed out all the kinks. Um, and again, I know we keep hearing that as we go through this process, if there's some red flags shown up, that we'll stop and we'll step back and take a, take a, break, a break and say maybe this won't work out. But every action I've seen, every uh, meeting I've been to, it seems to me that no matter how, how we raise concerns about voter fraud or any of these things, it's saying, yep, we thought about that, but we're still moving forward. And so we'll see. Um, I'm not gonna support it because as I said, at this point you haven't earned my confidence. I think you're moving so fast because you wanna hit that target. And I don't, I don't think hitting a target of a specific arbitrary date is maybe in the best interest. I liked Mr. Evans' idea at the last work session where if you're gonna have a specific election where you're gonna do this, you do it on a single issue, or you do it somewhere, um, you know, where you can kind of test the system, but you're going to an all citywide election in 2017, and uh, may the force be with you. We'll see how it turns out, but I won't be supporting this. Thank you. Mr. Flynn, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I was a little hurt by some of Mr. Evans' comments. I recognize that my graduate degree is only a two-year one, not a three-year like yours. Um, but I'd like to think I'm a relatively educated voter. And uh, I don't think I've voted in person on election day in 15, 20 years. In fact, I voted Monday <laughs> at City Hall uh, as I was doing other business. Um, and 
when I get my CEA ballot, because I happen to be a CEA member as well as an MLNP ratepayer, I vote online. <laughs> I think this is going to work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hall, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to uh, point out to Ms. Dembowski on page 2, first line D, effective June 1, 2016, all municipal elections shall be conducted by mail unless otherwise provided by the assembly in call of election. You still have the opportunity, should anything occur, to have the election in 2017 at the polls the way they've always occurred. There will be a drop dead date that will be proposed to you very soon that says if by this date we're not ready, then, then the call of the election, the assembly will uh, call that it be at polls as it has been presented. Uh, you know, the one thing that all of us on the body uh, really has to do, and sometimes we fall short in this category, is trust of each other because each of us individually take up particular tasks that all of us can't be involved in. I can assure each and every one of you for three years, three years, we worked at testing this, checking it, researching it, bringing individuals up that we've quizzed about how it works. Uh, we found out that fraud is in single digit in uh, elections to the point there are now because of the signature verification. I am very comfortable as the individual that has chaired this for the three years, put in the time and effort to look at it. And the reason that we finally come with a date like this was we found that until we do this, it's like most everything else we do, we just keep moving it and moving it and moving it because there's always a reason not to do it. But let me assure everyone that will be sitting on this body, there is a back door if anything at all presents itself that this will not work and work correctly and this body can do a at the poll election in 2017. I urge support of this. I think that uh, this is the future and I understand where Mr. Evans is coming from but everybody needs to understand municipal elections are difficult elections. Uh, it's not like going and voting for a president or a senator. There's initiatives, there's bonds, uh, there's any number of things on a ballot and to be able to have the time to sit down and read it in detail rather than walking in on your lunch hour and trying to do it in three minutes in a voting booth, um, I, I think it will be a real service in that we actually uh, would have a lot of people voting that I think will be educated voters because of the information available. I urge support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. There's no one left in the queue. Ms. Dembowski talked about this being an experiment. American democracy is a big experiment, always has been since it was first created. And what we try and do is enfranchise more people. This is just one way to get more people enfranchised into the voting system. And we'll see how it goes. When I take a look at the, what Amanda's given us down in Washington State, what's happened to Oregon, what's happened to Utah, this is the wave of the future. And sometimes you just need to understand which way it's going and do what you can to make it work here. Because right now our voting is pathetic in this town. Mr. Steele. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask Amanda what, uh, what the people down south said in, uh, in Washington or in California with regards to um, voter fraud or uh, how they did it. Did they ease into it or did they just do it? Thank you, through the chair. Um, so first, to respond to the concern about fraud, and this is, this is something that comes up a lot as we talk about vote by mail. There's various stop gaps in place to prevent fraud. Um, but I like to talk about Oregon. Oregon has been vote by mail since 2000. So for 16 years, uh, the residents of the state of Oregon have been engaged in their election process by voting by mail. And the Multnomah County Elections Administrator will talk about fraud and after millions of ballots have been cast through Multnomah County, they've found less than 10, less than what you can count on two hands, instances of fraud in Multnomah County for their elections ballots cast by mail. Anything else? Uh, what, do, what do they do in terms of damaged ballots or uh, 
uh, as they come back, do you send them another one or what happens? Through the chair, um, there's various ways if a voter has issues with their ballot or if they receive it back damaged, the elections administrators contact that voter and allow them the opportunity to um, vote a new ballot and spoil the original one that had, was damaged. So there's uh, various different ways and means to address any concerns that come up. And it's great not being one of the first jurisdictions to go through this. We can really look at the long history of vote by mail in Oregon. Washington has been slowly going vote by mail, um, but fo went fully vote by mail in 2012, and we can kind of explore what those other jurisdictions have done along the way. Unlike Evanston Flynn, I have faith. Thank you, Mr. Steele. Uh, just for the body, we do have Mr. Wheeler here who has got the contract for this. So if you have any questions on Mr. Wheeler, there's more than happy to answer them for you. Any other questions from assembly members? If not, we're going to vote on this item. Please vote. <laughs> the item is approved. <laughs> Mr. Sir? Um, before we get to the next item, item 14K, I wish yes. to disclose a potential conflict of interest. Uh, the two principals in this uh, application are uh, fellow owners of two businesses with which I'm associated. I do not have a financial interest in this specific venture. You do not have a financial interest in this venture? That is correct, sir. Mr. Rooney, Chair, then you do not have a conflict you're direct to participate, sir. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. We're now in front of us here, 2016-70. A resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly approving alcoholic beverages conditional use for beverage dispensary license number 4180 for Top Hand Industries, LLC, doing business at Saks Cafe in the rate. B2B Central Business Immediate District. Public hearing on this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify, please come forward. Jason Jay McCurry, for the record, this is by your last name. Welcome, sir. Mr. Chairman, my name is Tom McGrath. Uh, I live in the downtown area. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the assembly, I have eaten at Saks Cafe for, I don't know, 30, 35 years. Great restaurant. I think they'll do a fabulous job. But I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, LED Ultra Lounge and Grill was before you. At least one of the assembly members said, we can't let another ounce of alcohol be served in the downtown area until we get a handle on the bar break situation. And it doesn't matter who it is. So an assemblyman said that, and actually that license was held up for a number of months while you talked about it, discussed it. Since then, you've approved Willowa, you've approved Pangea, you've approved Tequila 61, and you've approved Alaska Alchemist. So that's four more liquor licenses that are going to be serving. Now, has the bar break situation been resolved? Well, I just asked the uh, assistant chief tonight, and on Friday and Saturday nights, they actually put four people, extra people on overtime to handle the bar break situation downtown, and summer hasn't even got here yet. So has it been solved? Uh, also, ICER has done a, done a study about alcohol and drug abuse in Alaska. Uh, the actual cost of drug abuse and alcohol in the state of Alaska is about $1.2 billion a year. Uh, alcohol taxes bring in $40 million a year, so we're a little bit underwater. So. Not that I'm against SACs, but at some point in the future, we have to really be serious about looking at alcohol abuse in the state of Alaska and come up with a plan rather than pick on one license and not a lot another license. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? No, there don't appear to be any questions. Thank you, Mr. Grath. Anybody else wish to testify on this item, please come forward.
Hi, my name is Lael Fairbairn. I am the managing member of Saks Cafe, along with Snow City Cafe, Spinard Roadhouse, and South Restaurant and Coffee House. I really appreciate Mr. McGrath's comments and um, can understand his concern. Uh, Saks is uh, applying for a liquor license to go along with our dinner menu and um, lunch menu. We'll be closing at 11. We're not really um, going to contribute any sort of problem to uh, bar break. I know that's a real concern for downtown operators. I look forward to working with other downtown operators to um, do what we can to encourage all of the, uh, the establishments downtown to help out with this problem. But I don't think SACS is really the issue at hand, and I'd appreciate your vote. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Holderman has a question. So, um, thank you. Thank you for coming and testifying and uh, being available for questions. So, uh, what begs to me is you, you've had beer and wine license before? Correct. And so this is a, basically an application to, for a full liquor license? Correct. All right. And you say you're going to close at 11? Yeah, about then. Okay. The like, like Spinard Roadhouse, we close at 11. So. Will, will there be a, and I probably should look a little closer at your layout, it, it, will there be a separate bar where people can go and just buy drinks without having to purchase food? Or No. We, well, we have a, a seating area with a bar, but it serves um, food. Most people will not be coming to just drink. They will, it'll be accompanying their meal. Okay. I'm, um, you know, what, what Mr. Grat McGrath said is, you know, and of course, this rings true back in, the 60s and well, actually in the 70s when the uh, pipeline was growing and going and raging uh, downtown seemed like every you walk out of one bar and turn left and go down or right and you're into another uh, I don't think I don't see us that way now and I don't see your business that way either so um, I, I think you've been a fairly good responsible operator um, I, to mr. M mr. McGrath's point uh, you know at some point in time concentrations particularly the full liquor licenses and and clubs and things like that. You know, we, we did have an extensive public hearing and, and raised a lot of concerns and issues about operations. Um, j just so you know, uh, down the road, if something were to start developing as problems, uh, don't be too surprised if somebody calls you before the assembly to answer it, to those sort of things. Particularly, not necessarily at renewal, but that's when it often comes up, you know, when there's any violations of the ABC board. Certainly, I understand that. Um, I think the main issue is the operator. Um, and if you have a long history of um, having good relationships um, with the police and um, your guests, then it's not really a problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. There are no other questions. Thank you. Anybody else wish to testify on this item, please come forward. Anyone at all? Hearing say no one. Public testimony is closed to one switch to the body. Move to approve. Second. Discussion from assembly members. Okay. Please vote. We need one more. Who's the one more? Okay. That is approved. Ten to one. Next item in front is item 14L, AO 2016-23, an ordinance of the municipality of Bankers, Alaska, amending the zoning map and approving the rezoning of Lot 4, Block 8, Northern Light Subdivision, Platt, P54, from RO Residential Office District, and Lots 5 and 6, Block 8, Northern Light Subdivision. Wait reading. Thank you. Public hearing this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify, please come forward. Welcome, Thank you, uh, members of the assembly. My name is Jim Sawhill, S-A-W-H-I-L-L. -L. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm with Lounsbury and Associates, and here tonight representing CY Investments. Um, the rezone is an application to rezone three lots from RO and R4 um, to ROSL. The special limitations are that the southern half will only be re uh, developed residentially, and a six-foot-high fence on the southern boundary. Um, the project as proposed is a mixed-use office retail development. Um, the architecture is residential in nature. We have provided some graphics in the packet that showed the, uh, the proposed building and development. Um, we uh, 
I um, think this will fit in nicely to the neighborhood. Um, it is an area that is redeveloping, and so there's going to be some uh, consternation among the existing residents with the redevelopment. Um, but we think with the, with the proposed project and architecture, um, we've mitigated some of those, those issues. Um, we would request your uh, support for the ordinance and be happy to answer any questions. Questions for assembly members? There don't appear to be any questions, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Steele, yeah. you jumped in. Um, it doesn't look like you're going to have uh, uh, in, or access to the neighborhood. Are you going to have access both directions? Um, we'll have access to Dawson Street. Okay. And we'll also have access through the alley in the back. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else wish to testify on this item? I, I had forward. a question for this gentleman. I'm sorry, Mr. Starr. Go ahead. The residential drawing that you have in here, is that the one that has the parking underneath the residential? Um, no, that's the office building that has the parking underneath. And so the compliance requirements for six proposed residential units, you're allowing how many delegated parking spots for those six units? Um, on your the, drawing, it shows you're swear, sharing it with Dwell Realty on one side. And right. If, if you look on page 60 of the packet, it yep. shows the site plan. And there's the, the parking that's required for the residential. Uh, there's a buddy in the residential. And then there's also parking that's underneath the, uh, the commercial. So we have sufficient parking to meet code for both uses without any parking reductions. And there's on-street parking available around the corner then? Is that how um, There's on-street parking available in the front. I, okay. we, yeah, we will be widening the road in front of the uh, development with this. Good. Thanks for the clarity. Yeah, thank Anything you. Anything else, Mr. Starr? Thank you, Mr. Starr. Thank you, sir. Anybody else wish to testify on this item, please come forward. Welcome, sir. Hello. Thank you for uh, hearing me out. Uh, my name is Tony Villasenor, and I'm one of the neighbors and this is being affected by this. Um, Tony, you know we're not dealing with that rezoning up on the hillside. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure which one you're talking about. Uh, this one here. Okay. Go ahead, Tony. Correct. Sorry to bother you. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm opposed to having these three, six units and that office building being um, right in that section, that little lot. Uh, my thoughts behind that is there's a kind of site condo situation where the lots is too small for uh, for the building and the units. Uh, we there's a, there's a drainage issues through the alleyway. Um, there's no. Um, Plowing service in the winter time. Um, they come through maybe twice a year. Uh, it's just going to be a rutted area with all that additional traffic. Uh, yes, there's at the end of the road. There's uh, signs that says no through traffic, but with the additional uh, units, say six times two, with two people living in those little tiny units, uh, and then plus the cus the customers dwell and their employees. I mean, it's just going to be one uh, mess of a area for such a small lot and. Um, uh, building so uh, there'd be a lot more people here w testifying before this but uh, they're my neighbors they're older um, they're all um, conjunction with me and, and uh, agree with this I wish they were here but they're not so um, I'd like to take your thank you for uh, listening me listening to my uh, my concerns so thanks thank you sir yep Anybody else wish to testify on this item? Anyone at all? Hearing say no, I'm public testimony. Scott Swartz, wish the body. Moved to approve. Moved and seconded. Discussion from assembly members. Please vote. That was approved. For the body. Next item in front of us is item 14M. AO 2016-30 in ordinance amending municipal code title 21, new code sections 
21.09.040C. Wave reading. Thank you. This is um, district subject to compliance with commercial design standards and make general manufacturing permitted use in the G1, GI-1, Tulane Road Industrial, and GI-2, Upper Crow Creek Industrial District. Public hearing on the site is now open. Anybody wish to testify, please come forward. Good evening, my name is Rory Marenko, M-A-R-E-N-C-O. Um, I'm rep representing Girdwood Brewing Company as a f future business owner affected by this text amendment. Um, the original chapter 2109 excluded general manufacturing and therefore general man or beverage manufacturing um, and brewing from Girdwood, which in my mind was an oversight considering the potential socioeconomic benefits that can be attributed to craft breweries. A craft brewery is not a bar or a tavern. Alaska statutes strictly limit the hours of operation and the serving quantities on premise per day. This fosters the notion that craft beer is about quality over quantity. Um, the brewery would be centered around a community taproom concept where neighbors could gather to discuss local issues, which reinforces this commitment. As the first craft brewery in Girdwood, we pride ourselves on being locally owned and operated. It's a business that would diversify and strengthen the Girdwood economy by attracting visitors who support other local establishments. So all in all, this would be a positive change to the rent land use regulations. Questions? From the assembly members. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Josh Hegna, H-E-G-N-A from Girdwood. Oh, do you have a question for that gentleman? Uh, I, can, I think you have partners here, I believe. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'll wait. Okay. I'll also be one of Girdwood's Brewing Company's owners, um, and it's critical that we have the people of Girdwood support for this project, so I want to take a moment and let you all know about the community outreach we've done. The people of Girdwood definitely want this craft brewery. Since last summer, we've gone above and beyond so that people are aware of our intentions. We presented our concept at four different Girdwood land use committee meetings and four Girdwood board of supervisor meetings. We've went door to door to our nearest neighbors, delivered flyers, answered questions. We've met with local business owners, the neighboring church, and had hundreds of conversations around town. Um, we've also sent letters to the nearest neighbors. We're concurrently working on getting our conditional use permit approved so that we can start construction this summer. At the land use committee meeting on March 7th, last Monday, the community voted 49 in favor of this and zero against. At that same community meeting, the pastor from the church, uh, Pastor Sandy said, Girdwood Brewing Company has done a great job communicating with our church and we support their business. During last night's um, Girdwood Board of Supervisors meeting about our conditional use permit, we received a unanimous vote in their favor as well and they gave us a pat on the back for our perseverance. We have an exceptional business model that will meld well with all the Girdwood community and will eventually provide jobs. Girdwood's my home, it's where I raise my kids, and we want to stay a beautiful mountain town. So if there's any Thank questions. Chris Toneman has a question. Chris Toneman? Uh, uh, I just, uh, are, you, are you guys all um, Girdwood residents as well? Do you live up in the area? We are. Taylor May? Yes, we are. Live and work with you, that's awesome. I, I work down there, yes. Awesome. Uh, and, and how, uh, d d I know this, the way you've got it set up there, uh, and maybe I'm missing something from the state level, is, is it, uh, is there plans to perhaps at some point expand if you get your brewery to a microbrewery to a certain level? Would you be looking at expansion down the road or perhaps looking into a bar or a pub or a tavern? No, I think we, we just want to sell local craft beer. We don't want to have a restaurant. We don't want to have liquor or anything like that. Well, you got some great, great places down there already. Yeah, there are. There's Not enough. Not with anybody. No. They all like it. All, all the other establishments. Are, use your beer. I think everybody wants to have local beer in Girdwood. So. Okay, very good. Thank you. That, those are just curious, some curious questions. All right, thank you. thank you. Other questions from assembly members? Yeah. Don't appear to be other questions, sir, so thank you. Anybody else wish to testify on this item, please come forward. Hi, my name is Allison Gordy, G-O-R-D-Y. Um, I'm a community member in Girdwood. Um, I live and work in Girdwood, and I just wanted to offer my support for this. Um, I think the best thing for our small community that is growing and, and very tourism-based is um, diversification of small business, and by changing the land use regulations, it allows us to um, have a little bit more flexibility of the businesses that can be in Girdwood, including this craft brewing. So, Thank you, ma'am. Questions from assembly members? Don't thank appear to be any. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to testify?
My name is Marco Zaccaro. I live in Girdwood. I own a business in Girdwood as well. I support this text amendment. I think the uh, GC10 location that they're proposing, which is right in the middle of Girdwood on Alyeska Highway, halfway in between the old the New Girdwood town site and the base area, is a perfect place for this. It's at, within easy walking distance of the major tourism oriented uh, businesses in Girdwood. Um, so it'll just add to the tourist um, facilities that people are come down to Girdwood to, to, to uh, take advantage of. Um, the uh, text amendment uh, allows general manufacturing in this district. And I think with the uh, application of the Girdwood design standards as they are, will prevent any of the other uh, parts of the, any of the other activities that may be allowed under general manufacturing from actually happening in GC10. So I feel confident that there are safeguards in place that would make the uh, general manufacturing really only apply to a brewery in this location. Thank you, sir. Question to some members. Don't appear to be any. Thank you, sir. Welcome to the meeting, sir. Uh, Tim Cabana, C-A-B-A-N-A. -A. I uh, am the property owner, and uh, GC10 is my property. It uh, consists of two lots, commercial lots. One is 1.1 acres, which this site is on. The other is 5.3 acres, which I came in front of the assembly years ago and got a conditional use for a hotel, uh, restaurant, uh, mall for that site. So there will be no other, uh, and I, I essentially at some point in, in my life, I'd like to build that hotel, but uh, it's just not in the books right now. Uh, so the only the only concern I, there, there is no there is nobody against this. It's uh, overwhelmingly supported in Girdwood. Uh, we've uh, this is the fifteenth meeting we've had, and we have yet to have anybody against it. Uh, last night's or the uh, GBOS was you know overwhelming support for it. The land use committee was forty nine to nothing. And you figure that uh, we are 0.7% of the population of Anchorage. That'd be like 6,000 people showing up here to support this in Anchorage. So our only issue, and I, I don't know, there's, there's no real answer for this, is we still have not got a permit to build this thing because we can't get our land use permit until after this is approved by planning and zoning on the 6th of June and that is starting to cut into our building envelope for this summer. Uh, I've been talking to Hal Hart, I've been talking to the planning department, Jennifer Johnson, everybody, I, I, I just don't see any way of, of getting it moved up any farther. It seems like right now, everybody's for this. I don't see why the planning and zoning would not vote for this, everybody's been for it. So it's kind of a procedural thing at this time. And I'm sure open to some ideas if anybody has any, has how to, keep us from losing our building, our building window, which is very short in Girdwood. It's just basically June 15th to July 15th, and after that it rains. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Question from assembly members. There don't appear to be any. Thank you, sir. Anybody else wish to testify on this item, please come forward. Anyone at all? Hearing say none. Public testimony is closed. What's the wish of the body? Moved to approve. Second. But moved and seconded. Mr. Flynn. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's not often we get a rezone where I see my property on the map. Uh, so I want to say thanks to the petitioners for dropping a little leaflet on my door um, last summer, I think it was. <laughs> and uh, no, I don't have a conflict. I'm way around the corner. But I can walk to this. It would be kind of nice. Um, and I actually just happened to run into Sam Daniel, who I know um, after I got the flyer. And, He's on the board of supervisors and is actually on the board of the church that would be adjacent to this, and, and they're very comfortable with this project moving forward. So that's as much of an endorsement as I can ask for. Um, I, I wish you good luck and hope we get this done in time for the building season. They've been building the place next to me for three years now. <laughs> Best of luck. Ms. Johnston. Thank you all for coming this evening and drive careful going back. Um, Tim, I'm sorry about how long the procedure is taking. You know, we, we've had the same problems in Girdwood where we have to notice and have the 30 days, and, and I, I feel your pain. I just hope if you get into this situation again that you give some 
some front end time to whoever's sitting in my seat so that they can help you sooner rather than later. Um, and I apologize, sorry. Oh, please vote yes. <laughs> Ms. Dembowski, ma'am. Uh, thank you. I just want to comment the petitioners um, on their public process. We don't often see people that come in that have, can say they've had 15 community meetings. And Mr. Um, Flynn has actually commented previously that he got a leaflet on his door. And um, when we see that level of engagement, it's, it's usually because they're neighbors who want to develop in their own community. And, you know, you want to deal with the problems ahead of time. And Mr. Mr. Honeman, I just have to put a shout out. This is the multiple, we're starting to see multiple microbreweries out here. And I just have to point out, they're mostly Chugiak alum. <laughs> so good to see you, Josh. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Dombowski. Any other comments from assembly members? If not, please vote. Thanks for coming all the way down here to the meeting and be safe on the way home. There you go, one last meeting to do. Next time in front, Chairman, item 14 and Mr. Chairman, before you start the public hearing on this one, I, I, ahead, I, I know Mr. Evans prepared a couple of amendments and, and Ms. Johnston has some ideas of how she wants to handle this matter. Perhaps you give them the leave to explain their intent. I'd be more than happy to. Uh, so that all the folks who are here to testify know what right. to expect. Right. And I apologize to everybody this evening. If you've noticed, I've been walking around talking to folks. Um, Mr. Schutte, who is the uh, Director of Community and Economic Development for the city, was one of the reasons I got involved in this to begin with. He had seen the property and was interested in seeing what we could make work there. Um, he is not here this evening, and he hasn't seen the amendments that Mr. Evans and I are going to be um, bringing forward, and uh, he won't be back to meet with me until Friday. So he's asked if I will postpone this until April, the meeting of April 12th. Um, and this has just happened in the last half hour. I, I, you folks still have the, it's still a public hearing, um, and I don't want you to sit here all night not being able to have your voices here heard, so I would suggest that you come forward if you have anything to say. If this is, if this ordinance has changed um, there's an S version that comes drastically, out. yeah, the S version, then you still will have a second bite at the apple um, if you would like. But um, I do apologize. This is, I, I didn't realize Mr. Schutte wasn't going to be here, and it's, um, you know, it's sometimes these things get messy. Now, before we get into that, Mr. Ev uh, Mr. Uh, Starr, you wanted to reconsider our action on 9B12, sir? Is that a short item or longer? Uh, it's short. It actually follows in the heels here. Probably, you know, the public can wait for a minute if they, I could do that. I'd first have to ask for reconsideration and pass these out. I'll second his reconsideration. Yeah, I'd like to reconsider uh, off the consent agenda 9B12. Second. 9B12. Yeah. Okay. He is a boy. I know some of you cleaned out your packets, so the same copy's coming back down to you. Can we vote on the reconsideration before I talk about the item, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Moved to reconsider. It was moved by Mr. Starr, I think seconded by Ms. Dombowski. So the issue in front of us is shall we reconsider? Mr. Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, Mr. Starr, could you just briefly speak as to why? Yeah, if you have your copy here, if you flip it over to the second page, um, in essence what's happened with this one is it, it's, a, it's a brew pub, a fairly large uh, development plan that came on the heels of 9B11. 9B11 was a restaurant and eating uh, area for, for that. Uh, the pub and the, the brew pub and the restaurant are using the same footprint. And also, if you look at section one, the way it's written right now is, is the 
there won't be a conditional use hearing on it, the way it, it words, and I've chatted with Ms. Tucker on it, the special land use permit language is what we're talking about in there, uh, and it, it gives the authority to the planning division and the municipal clerk, and I'm not comfortable doing that. So, so you're looking basically to amend this to add a public hearing? Okay. And, and a formal application for conditional use. Okay. Thank you. Let's bring this up then. Please vote. The question in front of us, shall we reconsider? It's been reconsidered by the body. And so, Star? and I'm not exactly sure how to do it, but I'm likely to amend, and the clerk needs to be cognizant on, on the communication to the applicant on this one, um, because I'd, I'd like to change the language on page two, um, where the special land use permit required under 2103040, which is a brew pub, um, has been approved by the planning division and confirmed by the assembly. It'd be like I'd, I'd like to do it, but. What I'm after is a conditional use process hearing, both at the planning and zoning level and um, at the assembly level. Madam Clerk. And the nuances are coming into play is that the special land use permit uh, is, is somewhat new language for us. We, we're, we're divesting ourselves from the conditional use language in the next year or so as we embrace it. And so, but I'm not comfortable with the size of this operation potentially, um, and, and it could be a bar. The restaurant eating one, it's gonna get convoluted, especially because the same footprint, when you look at the restaurant and the brew pub, they've turned in the same diagram, and there really is no eating area, and I don't, I don't wanna have a bar approved, uh, quite frankly, without a hearing, much like we just gave Girdwood. That's why I, I was piqued to it, as to Girdwood's manufacturing, of course, but in these cases, they're trying to brew uh, large amounts of beer in a business three district. So, uh, Madam Clerk, through the chair, Mr. Starr, the clerk's office can certainly amend the language to add this to the resolution. Um, I would and notify the applicant. Um, the issues about public notice, I can't answer that for you right here, mm -hmm. but we'll look into it. If there is other issues and we need to bring them back before the body, we'll do that. Well, the public hearing at the Planning and Zoning Commission level with, in conjunction with the conditional use permit application should trigger the public notice. So I'm asking for the, for the normal process to occur on conditional use approvals, and that would be Planning and Zoning, and then they bring a recommendation to us, knowing full well that it, it might slow it down a little bit, but they've got their restaurant and eating permit. I don't plan to protest that, but the brew pub one, I think we need to have a bigger, bigger dialogue. Then your request is quite easy. We'll just amend the document and notify the applicant. And if it was just you and I approving it, it'd be great, but we have to ask the rest of the body too. Okay, that is your amendment, Mr. Starr? Yes, if it'll serve the purpose, and then again, noting, notifying the applicant um, is, is, is important because they may have watched tonight and they may be starting tomorrow. Ms. Tucker is online. Ms. Tucker? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, if, if you look at um, page 137 of the assembly books uh, that is, uh, includes the backup for 9B12, you'll see that the, um, that the license that's being, um, be, the license type is called brew pub. And so um, that's, that's a different license than the single exception to assembly approval, which is for um, uh, beer and wine uh, uh, served on on the premises, and so in it, it, Mr. Starr is correct that in um, the new Title 21 under 2103040, the old conditional use uh, language for alcohol has become the special land use permit language, and um, and all uh, licenses except for that one. Um, exception requires assembly approval and so uh, as uh, the clerk indicated some language changes need to be made uh, perhaps also in the title here um, because it's not a license that can be administratively approved by the planning department only without going uh, to the assembly for approval under the full um, what used to be called conditional use and is now 
site plan approval under new Title 21. I'm just asking Kirk if she has what she needs. Me too, with the amendment, the amended language. So I, I would imagine the formality is we, we vote on the amended language and then the intent of the legislation needs to be clarified. Now, can you give her the, the intended language? I certainly can. It basically just removes the authority uh, confirmed by the municipal clerk and changes it to the word assembly. If you'd give it to her, we'd appreciate it. Got it. Let's vote on that amendment first. Oh, I, Mr. Flynn, sorry. Yeah, I, <laughs> I've done it. My yeoman's best to remain as ignorant about Title 21 as possible, but um, <laughs> just want to make sure. We've replaced the cup with the slop, apparently, um, and that's fine. Uh, so is the error in the way the resolution was drafted and that it did not um, follow the procedure that we would have a public hearing? Or is the error in the way that Title 21 is crafted and that doesn't require a public hearing? It's the, the latter. And I don't know that it's an error necessarily, but it's a, it could be proposed as a very big operation. And in this designation finite with brew pub being the designation, uh, it, it does not require that the site plan or the conditional use be approved at the assembly level. Okay. And I think it should. All right. Thank you. For this particular case in, in particular, and we may want to look at it in the future for all of them. All right. Thanks. Ms. Tucker? Uh, through the chair uh, and uh, respectfully to Mr. Stark, as we didn't have uh, but a minute to talk about this, I disagree. I think that Title 21 is written correctly. Um, uh, it does change the name uh, from conditional use to site plan approval, but it says uh, in current 21 that um, that the uh, that the special land use permit for alcohol for any use that includes the retail sale of alcoholic beverages, with the exception of a restaurant or eating place that sells beer and wine for consumption only on the licensed premises shall be considered by the assembly. And so I think that there is a, a misunderstanding perhaps in the process um, because as Mr. Uh, Flynn pointed out, you had a restaurant designation permit, but that, resi that restaurant designation permit application does not change this license permit from a brew pub license use to a restaurant uh, an eating place license and the restaurant eating place license under the old title 21 conditional use permit uh, was the only exception and under the special permit special land use permit for alcohol which is the way it's called under title 21 new um, it's still the only exception and so there was somehow uh, uh, it looks like that there was a, a misunderstanding here someplace but I don't think it's uh, in code Let's vote on the amendment first. Please vote. I got, I got it. Don't do that. Okay, that amendment is approved. Now we have in front of us item 9B12 was amended. Ready, Barbara? A motion to approve as amended. So Bill. moved. Moved and seconded. Just a second. It's going to take me a second. It takes a second for the computer to catch up. Is this SAP running? the people that are here for 14N. So we now have in front of us AO 2016-28, an ordinance of the Anchorsville School Sunday amending the zoning map and providing for rezoning of approximately 72.66 acres of land from R8 Way for free. residential to R6. Public hearing on this item is now open. Anybody wish to testify, please come forward. Keep in mind, if it comes back 
later and it's a substantial as version, then you can come back and testify again. So we just need your name, spell your last name. Tell us what part of town you live in. Uh, my name is Adam Lees, L-E-E-S. I'm the chair of the Rabbit Creek Community Council, so I'm down there in Rabbit Creek. So you're uh, chairman of it? Yes, sir. Congratulations. I don't know if that's the right word. Well, condolences. <laughs> You've got uh, five minutes to represent the community council. Thank you. Um, I just want to draw attention. We voted on this as a board on August of 2015, and I am personally sorry that you all did not receive it until possibly a week ago. Somehow it got lost in the transfer. But the community council adjoins the neighboring community council, um, East Hillside, which you'll also be discussing later, probably at another session, as the council has been legally inactive for months because it could not reach the quorum to change its membership. So if you haven't heard from their community council, that's why. Um, we have a great deal of interest in this because the request for a rezone would substantially alter the Hillside District Plan, which governs land use and development in the entire Rabbit Creek area. Namely, the designation from R8 to R6, which would allow for a denser development, would completely change the nature and is extraordinarily dangerous for that part. The road deck there is not paved. There's already very great drainage issues. And this sort of impact, setting a precedent to violate the plan, could spread to other areas with even more marginal land. Um, I very do, do much thank uh, Assembly Members Evans and Johnson for discussing this during the break with me. I do appreciate it, and I understand your positions. Um, but coming from the Community Council and our own minutes and board, um, I'm only authorized to speak on their behalf, and we oppose this lock, stock, and barrel. We do not want to see the rezone at all. It's inconsistent with the plan, and in the interest of getting us all home soon, I will yield the rest of my time. Questions from Assembly Members? Uh, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I've been told that um, sometimes in the summertime there's actually uh, raw sewage running along the side of Messina Street. Uh, c can you confirm that to me? I mean, it's kind of hard to believe, but I suppose it could happen. I cannot, and since most of the hillside is on septic system anyway, and the soils, from what I read in the report um, from the assembly, is that that could very well be the case. There are neighbors here. Um, I definitely will yield to them on the question. Um, I've only gone up there to hike. Thank you. Any other questions for some members? Thank you for testifying, sir. Welcome to the meeting, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kyle Amstatter. That's A-M-S-T-A-D-T-E-R. And I live in the Rabbit Creek area, right across the street from Messina. Just moved into the area, so I've heard about the raw sewage as well because the house that I just purchased has a holding tank rather than a septic system. Going out in the back, I found a failed septic system, which kind of attests to the soils in the area. So, you know, something that the developers may say is, well, you know, we can put these homes on holding tanks, no problem. But people are inventive. Having a house on a holding tank is expensive, maybe $3,000 a year if you're pumping it every three weeks is what's average and uh, $155 a pump. So, you know, you can see gray water being rerouted. <clears throat> a lot of clay in the soils that's going to flow along the surface and impact Rabbit Creek. So, you know, regardless of our intentions and saying uh, we can put in engineering controls, people can find ways to subvert that. So that, that's one point I wanted to make. Another point that I haven't seen raised is Upper Dearman is the main east-west, really there's, it's the only road that runs east-west in that area. So there's a ton of people out there walking their dogs. I've never been on the street with so many dog walkers. There's no shoulder and there's no sidewalk. So they're walking in the street. The road's really bumpy. A lot of people are driving fast. I think we already have the potential for car pedestrian accidents. We definitely have the potential. And Increasing the density is going to raise that that uh, risk. Um, in the definition, in the description of R8 on the municipality website, it says, and I'm skipping to a point here where it says, satisfy the needs of lotus density residential development in areas where topographic or other natural conditions are such that higher density development and the provision of public sewers and water would be unfeasible at any time. 
Looking at this area, I think this perfectly meets that definition. That's why it was zoned R8, and I think it should stay R8. So thanks for listening to my testimony. Question from assembly members. Thank you, sir. There are no questions. Welcome to the meeting, sir. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bart Hawkins. I live in South Anchorage, and I also own a property adjacent to the subject property. So his last name is H-A-W-K-I-N-S. Uh, essentially, uh, this ordinance is a replacement for an initial request for rezoning uh, that was uh, reviewed by the Lending and Zoning Commission back in July 2015. Uh, that Planning and Zoning Commission recommended denial of the zoning variance uh, for a number of reasons. This new ordinance tries to address some of those by calling out specific points from the original review and uh, putting some provisions in, in place that they thought would assist in uh, a finding in favor. There were some points, however, from that original zoning review that were never addressed uh, and are not addressed in the new ordinance, including that there were, uh, that the uh, zoning Commission called out that there were elevated nitrates in neighboring wells and a nitrate study should be required prior to development. Uh, that hasn't been addressed. Also that there was already uh, adding more housing up on the hillside will clearly be a risk with respect to the groundwater and to the flows into Rabbit Creek, which is not addressed in the ordinance. And uh, then as it was mentioned earlier by the speaker that uh, Diarman is a substandard road, doesn't have shoulders or sidewalks, um, and the proposed uh, ordinance doesn't do anything about that, uh, but the zoning change will definitely increase the traffic and exacerbate these potential problems. The other thing that's not mentioned in the ordinance or in the original variance is that the rezoning will probably change the character of the properties in that area by making them less rural, which is uh, for a number of people, including myself, the reason for buying the property up there in the first place because it was adjacent to uh, largely undeveloped lands. So uh, I think that uh, proving the ordinance will probably devalue the things that for which many of us bought the properties in that area. So I would recommend that the ordinance not be approved. Thank you. Questions from assembly members? Thank you, sir. There are no questions. Welcome to the meeting, Diane Holmes. How are you? Uh, point of information, Mr. Chairman, some of the public would like to know, did you say that they can vote, uh, I mean, testify today? If there's an S version. If there's an S version, Diane then they can just speak on that next time. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Diane Holmes. Um, planning and zoning did get it right the first time. And the Hillside District Plan states in several places that the current zoning for this area is to be maintained. However, the developer was never offered the 20% higher density if he was to use the Hillside Conservation Subdivision Method which is essentially clustering on the good land. While the conditions for this development method have not been formatted, they could be and should. Beyond what surely would be this cheaper development method, I have some heartburn with the S version, if there is to be one, the one that most of us have not seen, but which Mr. Evans gave me a copy of. I viewed the S version as a way to get the rezone after jumping through some hoops. But one part of it says that it quotes that uh, Title 2120.090, which in effect says it can trump the Hillside District Plan. Uh, this is not correct. Neighborhood and, na and district plans cannot be trumped by Title 21 or else there'd be no point for them. So that part of the S version I think should be looked at. Another part of the S version asks for a traffic study, yet I've never seen a traffic study to deny any development. And while I don't fully understand all of the S version, including this 51% vote, I do urge you to reject the appeal and the S version at this time, but do offer the developer the hillside conservation subdivision method for somewhat increased, develop, increased density. Anything else, Dan? We're trying to get uh, the screen to work correctly because we're on 14N right now, so we're trying to get it there. Questions for Diane Holmes from assembly members? There don't appear to be any questions, Diane. Thank you. Welcome to the meeting. Hi, I'm John Tuckey, T-U-C-K-E-Y. 
and I live up on Spen Love, just about 100 yards from the property that's in question. And I was here, along with a lot of other people, just about a year ago for the Zoning and Planning Commission meeting. And um, 20 people testified. 20 more, at least, did not testify because of the late hour. And they were asked by the chair, if you were going to be redundant, just sit down, please. And we did. And so um, I just wanted to clarify that. And the Zoning and Planning Commission listened to all the testimony about the groundwater and the wells from the neighbors uphill in particular. And, and they came to a reasoned decision unanimously turning this thing down. And so I was quite surprised to see that it's reared its ugly head again. And, and also the staff from the city, the zoning department, the on-site department, they all said, no, deny this. And so, you know, I looked at this thing today, I just saw it today for the first time. I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing anything new in here. All it says is to address the on-site, we'll build to um, Muni standards. To address the wells, we'll build to Muni standards. What's new about that? They do that anyway. And so I just don't, um, you know, oh, and $10,000 bond, I, I, I put in a lot, I'm a builder, I put in a bunch of septic systems. $10,000 is what a standard system costs on good ground. And if they have to put in an advanced system with a lot of fill, it could be 40000 easily. And so I, I just don't, I don't see, and the, the whole thing about 51%, I don't know what section one is, or um, just judging from the neighbors who were in that meeting a year ago, you're not gonna get 51% percent, excuse me, of people signing off on this, saying that they want it in, you know, in this area. Is that all, sir? That's it. Question of assembly members. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome to the meeting, sir. Hi. Thanks. My name is Rob Brown, and uh, my family and I live a quarter mile off of Canyon Road. The road, Bonnie Lane, ends and our property begins. We're about 400 feet below the top of this development uh, where the, the land flattens out and the water spreads out. Uh, let me first say that uh, we were shocked to get a notice in the mail that the assembly is considering enabling this development. The parcel has been rejected for rezone not once, but at least twice in its history, in its recent history, that is. The last time it was a unanimous decision, as the person previous to me said, the well on my property is at 50 feet deep. My neighbors are often 200, 300 foot deep. There are layers of clay throughout the whole area, as has been mentioned, and uh, water sits on top of those layers of clay. Uh, in some places, that clay is at the surface. Sometimes it's six feet down. It undulates with the lay of the land. Um, as you've heard tonight, the neighbors all around don't believe this plan is safe. We're afraid that their wells are dropping even further, possibly going to be contaminated. We're telling you the roads won't support it. We're telling you it's a very wet area. The developers have already conceded that there are bad soils for septic. The property drops almost 400 feet, as I said, from one end to the other, and the density of these houses will create serious runoff and glaciation for all of us living below it and people using the roads. There are already elevated nitrates in some wells surrounding the property. There's been no current watershed mapping survey done by the Muni and the developer is trying to convince you that there are dry drainage ways when in fact their surveys were done after the two warmest seasons and lowest, driest records on year. So one of the platted roads exits on Canyon Road. We in Glen Alps will be paying for the extra street maintenance for this development to do extra trips on that very steep part of Canyon and we wouldn't get any money from this development to do so. By the way, the developers never came to the Glen Alps Community Council and talked to us about it. Uh, an approval of this development by the assembly would be saying that none of these things matter. To say these things are problems for platting or planning to figure out, it means that the municipality is not concerned with listening to the people, listening to the recommendations of professionals in the departments that recommended denial, and does not believe its zoning commission is qualified to properly make decisions in the best interest for Anchorage. So I ask you assembly members tonight, is it your intent to develop all of the rural places in the municipality of Anchorage 
and allow sprawl to the borders of your jurisdiction? Is the assembly interested in subverting the original intent of the Hillside District Plan? An approval of these ordinances would be a yes to both of those questions and would set a dangerous precedent. This is one of the last rural areas the Muni has left. Are we going to trust that advanced septic systems will not fail as they do and will be, may I have a, another minute? I'm also representing the property owner adjacent that owns 80 I'll acres. Let you finish it up. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll skip down. Uh, my neighbor, Elaine Mills, longtime Anchorage Community Knit member, wife of the late Dr. William J. Mills, and owner of the 80 acres directly south of the property in question, could unfortunately not make it tonight, and she has asked me to read a statement on her behalf. I would like to express my strong disapproval of this rezoning. I fear how this large number of homes and additional infrastructure will affect the fragile wetlands that ex extend between the two properties. Rabbit Creek runs through my property and I value the pristine and delicate nature of this particular part of Anchorage. I am also uncomfortable with a large amount of houses being built uphill of my property and also accessing the water table for wells. I would like to remind the assembly of the unfavorable hydrological studies that have been done and the unanimous denial for rezoning by the Zoning Commission. One comment that was made by the Zoning Commission was that this was bad city planning as Anchorage should be focused on more urban density. Again, I strongly disapprove of the zoning expansion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Question for you, how deep is your well? Did you say 50 feet? 50, it's actually less than 50 feet, but it was, uh, it was at 46, but it was drilled in 1965. How deep are your neighbor's septic tanks to your well? Well, my neighbors, uh, two of them don't have running water, and one of them is 160 acres. The other one is a square mile park. Yeah, uh, my concern is we've got a lot of people that are taking wastewater, throwing in the water system, and other people are taking out and using it. Yes, sir. I'm an organic farmer. I, uh, I sell plants at markets, and I test my water uh, with EPA-level studies, uh, uh, tests, $500 tests once every couple of years. Good. So I'm very aware of, of how uh, bad water can affect uh, things. Well, thank you, sir. Anybody else wish to testify, please come forward. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Carol Ashlock, and I'm also speaking for Loki Friedman, F-R-E-E-D-M-A-N, at 13921 Bonnie Lane Road, which is actually uh, directly next to, adjacent to the Mills uh, homesteaded property, and I emphasize homesteaded, that's how long they've been there and why, and below uh, the Browns uh, property. So our well is at 150 feet, actually, just a few feet down, and our septic is above that, uh, over and above that. Uh, I, a lot of points have been made, and there are a couple of things i just like to emphasize. I guess I should first say I appreciate greatly the consideration the Assembly has given, all the work that Assemblywoman uh, uh, Johnson has done, and I know that uh, Assemblyman Bill Evans has spun on it. But there are a couple other points. Uh, one is you talk about glaciation. Okay, last time I was here, I had an area from um, the speaker to, to the, from this po podium. Today, that glaciated area is probably, it's bigger than this, and I, it's bigger than that. And I testified last time that I'm the person that plows that road. I'm the one also, they talk about a bulldozer, I'm a girl with a bulldozer, I got a D3 up there. I understand it. I spent over $40,000 on Bonnie Elaine, yet it's carved up because of the level of water that is on that property partially from Canyon, but it's all the water that drains down and drains off of that, carves through Bonnie Lane, constantly carving it up. We didn't have much snow this winter, although I spent about 10 hours plowing on Sunday, yet it was hard to even get out of that road. Why? Because the water cuts it up, it ices it up, and makes it so difficult to even get out of there, which is our problem, but not one that we certainly want to increase. Um, we talked about that, talked about the um, concerns for the septic, what's gonna happen with that. I greatly appreciate the consideration about thinking about cluster housing. However, you're still talking about 30 units. You're still talking about that many people that need septic system. What's going to happen to our water? What's going to happen to Mrs. Mills and her, her large family's water that have put so much in the community? You know, she'd be here tonight, but she's in her 90s and it was a little difficult for her. She's seen them come and go over this same issue and for the same result, the same problem. The next thing I'd like to ask you is, are we not going to have any more R8? Are we, just gonna, are we just gonna send all the R8 to Platting? Is that gonna be our answer? With all due respect, 
um, and Ms. Johnson, you know, I know that you work on being very fair to people, and that's the one thing that I've said to my neighbors, who are still many up here. Are we not going to have any more rights? Are we just going to send everything to plotting, and then we're going to rework it, and then we're going to come back? If there ever was a case for land that's R8, that property is it. That's why the property was so cheap in the first place because of that 400 foot drop, because of the level of water that has existed on that land, even in these last two dry years, which as you know, this gentleman has to do soil sampling. Okay. The other thing is I just question about our bumping this. So we're looking for Shuddy, who's economic development. I'm sorry, I would just ask you to vote on this tonight. I don't know why we're bumping, why it's just okay to go ahead and bump it and what other information we could have based on that. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate how much you appreciate Questions from assembly members. Don't appear to be any questions, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else wish to testify? Welcome, sir. My name is Ralph Warren, W A R R E N. I live in the general vicinity of this property, and I've worked with the other people up there getting flyers out to people to notify them what's going on with this. I've kept up with it really close, and it would be a travesty for the whole area up there if you change that zoning to smaller zoning and for houses. It, cluster houses, they're going to be, like she said, they got to use the bathroom. And it winds up in Rabbit Creek, and that's wrong. And the, if they do cut roads down in there and, and strip it off, they're going to have to salt the heck out of them. There goes it right into Rabbit Creek, and the sewage will have right along with it. So, you know, they've had a lot of problems with sewer up there on uh, – runoff and they've had to go to sand filters and all stuff, but they still failed. I've got one right close to my house that three years in a row they had to dig that up because it quit working. And it was a mound system. But to go and change that now to R6 whenever it was zoned R8 by the comprehensive plan, it cost us about seven hundred million dollars. We seven hundred no seven hundred thousand. In the seventy six you should see what that area looked like up there with glaciating and no paved roads or anything. And I, I moved up there in 83, and it was still doing that in 83. But to change this over and, and ignore what it's going to do to everything, we should not do it. We'll pay the price in the end when you start to have supply those people living there with water and sewer lines and all that. You know, wrong thing to do. Appreciate your vote against the rezoning. Thank you, sir. Questions from assembly members? There don't appear, appear to be any. Thank you, sir. Thank yes, sir. Welcome to the meeting. My name is Bern Davis, D-A-V-I-S. I live near the affected area. I have personally uh, talked to the vast majority of the people who live in that area Absolutely no one has expressed any interest in any kind of cluster housing, R6, or whatever. The quality of our life will suffer greatly. <clears throat> I believe my well, with that many people, may, uh, uh, it may actually suck my well dry. My well is not that great a well. But the uh, quality of our life is kind of in the balance here. No one that I talk to, and I've probably talked to 70 or 80 people, wants any kind of a development and we, ha we, uh, we actually all have questions as to whether or not even an R8 would work there. This thing is a swamp. It's not the Dismal Swamp. It's not the Okanokee Swamp. But it is a swamp. And, and we would appreciate a no vote on this, and let's put this to bed once and for all. Absolutely no one in the neighborhood expressed any interest in that kind of a heavy development. It's going to bring noise, pollution. It's going to make a mess out of things. Thank you. Questions from assembly members? Don't appear to be any questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome to the meeting, sir. Uh, my name is Bruce Ferguson, B E R G A S O N. I live on Messina Street, and I'm here to defend my street. There's, I've been there for almost 14 years, and I've never uh, know, known of or had any experience with sewer water running down the street. Um, the other part of the the issue that I have is just basically it, is that uh, if the development's done properly um, and it's done in accordance with all the guidance and codes, I think that, uh, that it can be accomplished. 
Um, the density of the housing, obviously, you know, is one of those considerations. But obviously, if a lot cannot be developed because of the water problems or other issues, I assume that there's that it can't be developed. Anyway, I, I, I speak uh, in favor of the rezoning um, because obviously, I think it's a, you know the Anchorage needs to, to continue to develop. Um, as far as the original zoning R8, it was a default zoning that started back in 1974, and uh, I just think it was never addressed or changed. I live on the side of the lot, that, on the side of this Messina Street that the development is going to take place. Um, again, I've been there 14 years. I've never had any problems with well water or uh, my sewer system. But I will say that the sewer system I have is a hybrid system, though. Thank you. Sir, we have a question for you. Mr. Johnston. I just, I, I, I'm sorry, what street do you live on? I couldn't quite get that. Um, Messenia Street. Oh, okay, thank you. Ms. Dombowski has a question for you, sir. Uh, so we've heard a lot about the water in this area and obviously the high content of the water. So what kind of system, do you have a biocycle or what kind of system do you have? No, no, I have just a hybrid sand filter. Okay, okay thank you. We don't appear, appear to be under questions. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Hello, my Welcome. name is Marta Kroninsky, K-R-Y-N-Y-T-Z-K-Y. Thank you. <laughs> um, I am a neighbor um, in this area. I recently moved up to the hillside um, last year, and we bought in this area because it was a rural area of Anchorage. Um, we enjoy the large lot size, we enjoy the wildlife, and I, I do see this plan as completely inconsistent with the hillside development plan. Um, this assembly has rejected this development several times. Um, I believe that should be upheld. I don't know why this keeps coming up. Um, but again, I'd just like to reiterate some points that the soils don't appear to support nitrates or septic systems. Um, we've got an environmental issue with Rabbit Creek in the area. Um, it's concerns of surface water contamination and the amount of water on the land itself. Um, we, from hilltop, you can see you know, the area, and you definitely, in the summertime, you look down there, and it's, it's full of water. It's, it's a marsh. Um, we have office concerns about our well water in the area and adding a bunch of users to that water. Um, and, and the traffic. I think the traffic cannot be understated. There are a lot of people who walk their dogs up and down that road. There's a lot of children walking up and down those roads. There's no, it, it is a major thoroughfare. Um, and adding a lot of traffic to that area um, really um, is a, a danger to the community. Thank you. Question for some members. Ms. Dombowski. Thank you. I, I do have a question. I've been listening to some of the neighbors. And can you give me kind of your perspective? Um, is it that you get the sense, maybe you could just speak for yourself or if you even have a sense of your neighbors, uh, do you have a sense of is it um, your community is against development in general in this area or is it just the high, higher density? I, I think it's the higher density. Um, I, I believe actually reading through the hillside plan that the area that I live in, which is currently R6, um, if it was rezoned today, it would be rezoned as R8, not R6 okay. because of the quality of the land and the soils on those lands. That's helpful, thank you. To no other questions, ma'am. Anybody else wish to testify on this item? Welcome, sir. Good evening, my name is Eric Wasserman, W-A-S-S-E-R-M, uh, M-A-N. Uh, I've lived uh, on Spendlove Drive for 26 years, and um, you know, it's kind of ironic. Uh, I heard the conversation, uh, the statement made earlier that about uh, there's so many people walking on uh, DeArmond Road. I walk that road with my wife uh, every day, uh, trying to say, stay in some semblance of, uh, is that me? No, okay. don't worry about that, it was a computer malfunction. <laughs> some semblance of uh, good health. But, you know, it's also ironic that uh, the only way I learned about the initial proposal to move from R8 to R6 was on a telephone poll, there was uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission said there's going to be a hearing. And I've attended those hearings. Planning and Zoning Commission was uh, pretty definite. Uh, 
they wanted to deny uh, the appeal was also denied uh, it's uh, conflicted with the city planners that want to deny it um, and uh, you know the uh, uh, hillside development uh, uh, plan it's in conflict with um, you know earlier I uh, heard Mr. Evans uh, wax uh, eloquently about respect uh, and solemnity. Uh, Mr. Traney talked about uh, democracy as an experiment. I have to tell you, it's as though I'm watching a zombie movie and we're stabbing this thing over and over again and we're consistently being faced with more and more hearings. I don't quite understand the hubris of, of a democratic society that doesn't trust its own panels, uh, commissions, authorities, professionals. And here we are back at the assembly. Um, you know, it, it just... Uh, it shakes me to my core to, to think that uh, we have to go through this exercise when it's clear the road is subpar, the soils are subpar. Um, you know, I, I understand that Anchorage needs to grow. There needs to be more development of uh, housing, uh, but it's it's unnecessary in uh, in our eight area. That development should happen down in the flatlands, uh, uh, where you know people are working. Uh, the charm of this area for the past 26 years, for me, for my neighbors, um, you know, has been uh, the way the land is now. I understand that everybody has a dream and they would like to see uh, some kind of development, uh, or uh, they could fulfill their dream. But this is clearly a nightmare for everybody else. I heard one person speak in favor of it. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people are opposed to this thing. And I, I would add one more point. You know, uh, I never got a notice uh, from my representative uh, on the assembly um, about this uh, assembly meeting. And I live on Spend Love Drive. Uh, <clears throat> I find that, you know, personally insulting and a failure. So your, uh, your time is up. I'm sorry. Thank you. How many people still wish to testify in this item? Okay. Because we're running into time crunch. To the body, what we've got is we've got nine minutes left. Now, do you want to extend to let the people continue, or we end at 11 o'clock? We pick it up the next meeting. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't, um, just a point of clarification. Um, I, um, item 14P, uh, there was some confusion amongst the attorneys in the planning department and some of us um, for marijuana separation distances and that's really the only item that I was hoping we would get clarified so as applications come in we have a clear delineation it's nothing different it's well, just there's nothing coming through yet from the state to the city okay so when do you th anticipate those are going to come probably uh, Mr. Hall when we're looking at August September time frame from the state Come into the city uh, at this point in time mr. Trini I have no idea how we would establish that time but it's going to take some legislative okay. action oh wait mr. Hall I was just wanting to make sure 14 P could wait till April 12th I don't it think wait. it would be a problem okay <laughs> I was just checking thank you so my question to the body is do you want to extend so that the people that are here testify or we automatically end at 11 how, o'clock how many how many more want to testify um, now we've got about five or Mr. six. Mr. Chairman, it, was it, is it the intent that we're going to postpone this for potential? The intent is we're going to continue this meeting on this item till the next meeting we've got. Remember that was what Jennifer said. So what I'd like to do is just let's extend for a few minutes. Let the people that spent their time here testify, Mr. and then we'll end the meeting. Okay, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we extend until 11.05 to finish up this item. Okay. And if that, if we need to go further than that, I'll make another motion. Is there a second? Second. Keep in mind, it takes eight votes. Second. Okay. Please vote. So we'll extend this to 11.05.
Specifically, Mr. Chair, it was for this item. Yes. When this one's done testifying, the meeting's over with. Okay. What, ma'am? What? I did. I was yes. So we're all right? Okay. Sorry to bother you guys. Right, it's just we have rules. Come on and testify. We need your name. My name is Chris Alexander, A-L-E-X-A-N-D-E-R. I live on Spin Love off of Genie. Um, been there since uh, 91. Um, I'm just going to urge you to vote no on this, and hopefully you can do it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you for your time. My name is John Clark, C-L-A-R-K. And I've only got two items that I would like for you to consider. Uh, one is that when we did the hearing with the planning and zoning, they said that there is a lot of wetlands involved in this plot. And those wetlands should be subtracted from the 72.66 acres for consideration for the housing. Also, in the planning, the density, high density housing, would only add three houses, not 14. So that needs to be considered too because of the, the rate of the 14 is, I think, 20%. Uh, is what they should be to go to high density. So just like you to consider those two items too, please. Mr. Tony, do you have a question for this gentleman? No. Okay, that was from Thank earlier. you, sir. Anybody else wish to test on this item? Welcome, sir. Hi, my name is Brian Ott, and I just recently moved to the area. Um, but for all the reasons that all these other individuals have stated today, um, I'd like to urge you to vote no on this as well. If you can do that today, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anybody else wish to testify on this item? Please come forward. My name is Barbara Armstrong, A-R-M-S-T-R-O-N-G, and I live on Spend Love Drive. And um, I also am concerned about um, the development at this level. Ms. Domboski asked earlier about um, whether people were against development in the area. Most of the neighbors that I have talked with did not have a concern about the R8 um, zoning, so long as the development were kept at a lower level that could possibly deal better with the soil conditions and the traffic and so forth. And I think that's important to note. I think we all realize that things are going to be developed. There's also necessity for um, tax revenue in these difficult times, but we don't see that this is a good way to get more revenue by changing the uh, zoning on this particular piece of property. Thank you. Questions from assembly members? Thank you, ma'am, for your testimony. Anybody else wish to testify? We still got a couple of minutes left. Because 11 o'clock, I will bring the gavel down. We're ended. So please. Good evening. 11 05, sorry. Uh, my name is Scott there. Rally. I live on Upper Diarmon, and uh, I enjoy walking my dogs on that road as well as many others, and so I won't or anybody else with, with that, but I'd just like to say the road is in pretty bad shape. Um, more development up there could be detrimental to the road, to the safety and um, health of others that do live up there, and just in account of the water and then sewage issues that I do believe are uh, pretty apparent up there. I think it's just wise to uh, look into opposing this vote for this ordinance. Thank you. Ms. Johnson has a question for you, sir. I, I sir. guess when we're talking about walking dogs, and I know there are a lot of folks that walk dogs on that road, mm -hmm. I also know there's a lot, a lot of traffic on that road. And I've since I've moved down from Fairbanks since 88 and maybe have spent too much time on the backside of 1, 2, and 3, but I'm driving a Subaru very slowly. Yeah. There's a lot of big pickup trucks that go very fast on that road. And I, I just... I'm. You know, I, I, I'm kind of bamboozled because I think that's much more your problem than any development's going to give. I mean, would you say there's a lot of fast pickup trucks on your own? There's a lot of fast pickup trucks, yes. Thank you. Anybody else wish to testify on this item? Welcome. Hello, my name is Nancy Pease. 
The proposed 115 percent increase in density poses many impacts outside the neighborhood, um, and one of those in particular that I'm concerned about is runoff. The disruption to the natural vegetation and the increase of impervious surface will ex exacerbate the runoff to Rabbit Creek, which is just downslope from this parcel. And this is an especial concern now in our current climate regime, if you can remember these words, winter rain on frozen soil. Um, we have a new normal and that just sluices contaminants and water downstream. Rabbit Creek already has downstream erosion of roads, such as along old Rabbit Creek Road, where there's had to be um, buttressing and riprap type uh, emergency construction. And then down at East 140th in our council area where there's been expensive glaciation thawing numerous times. And then all the way down at Potter Marsh, which is, I would call it a regional, regionally treasured natural resource. That's already um, experiencing a great deal of sedimentation and this would exacerbate uh, that. Um, there's a little line item that's on this application that says, will there be public or private economic effect to the proposed action? And the correct answer to that is actually yes. And the cost will be borne by the downstream property owners and the muni taxpayers for emergency road repairs, ditch thawing, degradation of Potter Marsh, and for the upgrade of roads where there's um, existing traffic. And this type of project can leapfrog um, costs to the taxpayer over other areas of town. There is a solution for creative development provided by the Hillside District Plan, and that's the conservation subdivision. It would allow up to a 5 to 20 percent density bonus, not an over 100 percent density bonus, but it could cut the developer's costs through clustering and possibly through common septic systems. Um, it would also provide compensatory public benefits because it requires, as a trade-off, um, some form of open space and natural vegetation retention. So I'm asking you, uphold the Hillside District's plan's intent for larger lots where there are difficult or marginal site conditions. Uphold the comprehensive plan, 2020 plan's promise of a diversity of residential neighborhoods, including rural neighborhoods, and this is on the edge of town, this is rural. Uphold the protection to private property owners and taxpayers from off-site impacts, such as seeping sewage, water contamination downstream, flooding, road damage, and degradation of Potter Marsh. And if you don't know the site or these land use issues um, or the details of the Hillside District Plan, then I ask you to follow the lead of the Planning and Zoning Commission and the staff and deny this rezone. Thank you. Thank you. A question from Assembly members. Thank you. Anybody else wish to testify? Any bills wish to testify? We still have five minutes left. If you haven't testified, it's your chance. Okay. Well, that, Mr. Chairman. I I move. I'm not adjourn yet. Yeah. Please don't no, adjourn yet. No, no, I'm not. I'm not adjourning. Doing, okay, just checking. I move to continue this to April 14th. A 12th. Well, what are you doing? April Fool's Day. April 12th. Please. Is there a second? The issue in front of us is to continue this item until April 12th. Discussion from assembly members. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I just. Mr. I, I, understand, I understand there were a couple of amendments that were floated here by both Ms. Johnson and Mr. Evans, and there is there some. There, well, to, to be candid with you, I got into this because of Mr. Schutte. Um, he had suggested I look into ways to, to work on this piece of property. And um, he isn't here this evening, and it's not helpful not to have him here. He wants to sit down. He wants to see what we can work out. And um, I'm giving him that courtesy. Um, so will they be a work session or something? He's out of town. Look, this is for an assembly discussion. Right. We've listened to you guys. Please don't. So, Mr. Holman, that's it. And and if if we need to have a work session before the April 12th, I will ask the chair for a work session. Thank you, Mr. Dombowski. 
Um, it's not on this one. Mr. Chair, I was going to ask for a moment of personal privilege to introduce this cleanup AO for the previous. Well, let, me, let me finish this. Okay, up. we have like two minutes, so. Thank you. Okay, the issue in front of us is shall we continue this meeting, continue the hearing till the next meeting on April 12th? Please vote. Vote was seven to four. This item will go forward. It'll be on our next meeting on April 12th. Mr. Chair. Ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'd like to lay on a, ta a table an uh, unnumbered AO, an ordinance of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Code Section 3.30172 to reinstate subsections deleted in error. This was the AO that we talked about re earlier. If I could get a thank you, Mr. Third. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Okay, you've got three. Separate public hearing on what day? The 12th. The 12th? Madam Kirk, is that okay? Kirk agrees, not a problem. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll make the motion to adjourn. Is there a second? We're adjourned.